Hello, thank you for being here. Before we begin, I want to give some backstory on the image on the screen. It is one of my favorite photographs, and it is one of the darkest, most tragic photos I have ever seen. Here's the story behind it. On the evening of July 18, 1853, three drunken sand scow workers set up for a trip on the upper Niagara River in a small boat. They ended up in the American rapids, and the boat was swamped by the intense waters. Two of the men were immediately swept to their deaths over the falls, but the third, a man named Joseph Avery, held on to a nearby log for dear life. He sat clung to this log for 18 hours as numerous people attempted to rescue him, to no avail. After utter and complete exhaustion overtook him, Avery was eventually swept over the falls to his death around 6 p.m. on July 19, 1853. What you are looking at is an actual photograph taken of him, moments before he gave up, let go of the log, and met his demise. Like I said, it's one of my favorite photos, and I thought it would make for an eerie background to this video. Now before the stories begin, I need to let you know that as in all my videos, there are minimal ads. Only three ads after the first three stories. After that, you have hours of scary stories and rain, with no interruptions. I hope you get the rest you need. If this video is helpful to you, please like the video so that it gets recommended to more people. And of course, subscribe to my channel if you think this video is cool. Now, let's begin. So, this story is a bit unsettling and weird. The events of this night I didn't really consider scary until years later when I really reflected on what truly happened. I am 30 years old now, but was only 15 during the events of this story. The evening started fairly normal, a bunch of my friends and I just hanging out, thinking we were cool because we were at the state fair without any adults. It was a group of about 10 of us if I remember correctly. We decided to post up towards the back of the fairgrounds where all the rides were. We were just talking, telling jokes, and trying to impress the girls that would occasionally walk by. During our time hanging out in the back, we were approached by a very strange looking person. He was an average height, a little thick in the belly, bald but was sporting some hair on the sides. He approached us with great confidence and said in a stern voice, You guys waiting for the ship as well? Thinking this was more comical than scary, we kind of just laughed and responded with, Uh, the ship? What are you talking about? The man smiled and flashed his chipped teeth and again, in his confident voice, said, yeah, the ship from space. Are you guys here to board as well? Well, being kids, we just thought this was a joke. We laughed hysterically and just thought this guy had a lot to drink or something along those lines. After we had finished basically laughing in the guy's face, I finally responded to him saying, Where's the ship going? He responded confidently, The Andromeda Galaxy, of course. That was the last straw for us. We were just about hunched over in pain. We were laughing so hard. Well, the man finally realized we were laughing at him and changed his tune real quick. The confident voice suddenly became faint and the man said, Go ahead and laugh at me. When they come, you will see. We responded by basically saying whatever and stepped away from this crazy guy. At this point, he started to follow us, and was now irate, chasing us, and was yelling about the aliens. Finally, after a few minutes of this, and lots of stares from the people at the fair, I turned around and said in my blunt, 15-year-old voice, Dude, leave us alone. We don't want any part of your ship or aliens. Still treating this as a joke, but more annoyed and creeped out than anything else, we just kept walking. The man finally yelled, Stop! We all turned and looked at the creepy UFO man, and he said almost in tears now, 
I've seen you in my dreams. You've been on the ship with me. They chose us. Officially creeped out, I pushed the guy away. He surprisingly went backwards quickly, like he weighed nothing. After that, he just started laughing. With all the commotion, we noticed many fairgoers forming a circle around us to make sure there wasn't an issue escalating. The crazy man started pacing around the circle of people that formed and started to ask everyone in almost a desperate voice now. Are any of you going up? They will be here soon. We need to get ready. This poor guy was met with tons of laughter. I started to feel bad for him. It seemed like this person was really suffering from some sort of crazed delusion. While the man was interrogating the other fairgoers, we used the opportunity to make our way to the main entrance. Honestly, we were just done with the guy and done with the night. It was starting to get concerning, and we really didn't want any trouble or to have something happen that would need our parents to get involved. Once we got to the main entrance, we took a shuttle back to the parking lot where my mom was picking me up along with three of my friends. We got to the lot and she was not there yet. So we just waited by the entrance to the lot until my mom got there. Right on cue, directly across from the lot, which is essentially a heavily wooded area, we saw the same guy just standing there, staring at us. We did not say or do anything to provoke him this time. We just watched and waited anxiously for my mom. As we stood there, we noticed that the man just kept pointing up to the sky. He didn't look like he was saying anything, but we wouldn't have been able to hear him if he was anyway, because he was probably at least 100 yards away. In the distance, we finally saw my mom driving up in our green Windstar van. As we approached the doors of the van, we noticed the man was now somewhat rapidly approaching us. Not running, but walking briskly, I would say. We started to move fast, not really knowing if this guy was dangerous or not. And as I got into the passenger side, the man waved from the side of the road, and I just barely heard him say, I'll see you up there, as he smiled awkwardly at the van. It was not until years later when I was telling this story that I realized just how disturbing it really was. We had no idea if this guy could have caused us harm, if he was insane, or if by some crazy chance there was some truth to his delusion. I often used to wonder what happened to that guy. I never saw him again. I still attend the fair every year, and honestly, I always go back to that spot at the back of the grounds to see if the strange man would ever come back. Either way, it was a very strange and interesting story I really wanted to share. Just makes you wonder what goes on in other people's minds and what their true intentions are. I don't fly anymore. I used to, a lot, actually. It was a big part of my job to fly around the country to pitch investment prospects at meetings held for wealthy hedge fund managers. It was a cushy job. I mean, it paid far, far more than it was worth. But now I work from home and I drive everywhere. I'm talking everywhere. I live in New York City, but my parents lived down in Florida since they retired. And yep, I drive down there to see them, three times a year sometimes. It's pretty bad, but I'd rather drive all that way and get stomach flu from bad roadside tacos than fly. And now I'll tell you why. It was a regular flight from LaGuardia down to Houston, another business trip to finance flirt with oil-rich investors down in Texas. I was sat in a window seat in business class. Takeoff was pretty normal. Everything was peachy, nothing I hadn't done a hundred times before as I thumbed through the in-flight magazine and browsed the drinks menu. I had to get up at like 5.30 in order to make the flight, and I have never been a morning person, so as soon as I was able, I shut the window flap next to me, closed my eyes, and tried to catch a few Z's so I would be as fresh as possible for the afternoon meeting. Then, just as I'm about to drift off, a loud pop noise 
In my weary state, I actually thought it was some champagne bottle being opened by some celebratory suit who was opting for the fizz breakfast. I look around, and no one has a bottle. There is no attendant with an ice bucket. Nothing like that. Then, some horrible idea pops into my head, and in order to belay my seemingly irrational fears, I slide open to check on the plane's left-wing engine. I remember expecting it to be fine. Nothing had ever happened on a flight before, even though I had had those little flashes of fear previously. But it was not fine. The popping sound had been exactly what I had feared. There was smoke billowing from the engine, a thick stream of dark vapor that trailed along as we flew. I grabbed an attendant and silently pointed out the window, not wanting to raise too much of a panic. When she looked, she turned pale, then rushed up the aisle in the direction of the cockpit. Moments later, others were noticing what I had seen, cries of panic sounding from all along the plane as more and more people noticed the danger we were in. People were rushing over to the left side of the plane, looking out the windows and screaming. All while, the air hostesses aboard were trying everything they could to both keep calm, as well as keeping the passengers calm. Right before the terror reached a fever pitch, the pilot comes over the intercom. I think that was the weirdest, most surreal moment of my life. When people were losing their minds, but the captain was calm to the point of seeming bored. I suppose that's just the level of training they receive. The captain tells everyone to keep calm, to go back to their seats, and that the plane will be making an emergency landing at the nearest airport, which by that time was an airport in Virginia. We actually landed just fine, and the only remotely bad thing to really happen that day was that I had to rearrange the investment meeting. But I swear, part of me thought that plane was about to become a fireball as the engine exploded and we plummeted towards the earth at like 500 miles an hour. It was probably the most terrifying experience I have ever endured, and despite me trying to, I was never able to get on a plane ever again. So like I said, I drive everywhere now, and as much as it sucks, it's better than getting the cold sweats and panic attacks from sitting on a runway somewhere, just waiting for the engines to go up in flames. This story takes place two years ago, when I was living in the same house as my two younger sisters and my father. We lived in a neighborhood that wasn't necessarily unsafe, but wasn't the best neighborhood for people to live in. I can recall some neighbors getting arrested for selling drugs when I was maybe five, but this story is not about them. In the summer of 2018, my sisters and I would stay up late into the night, sometimes only going to bed after the sun had risen. I was 17, and my sisters were 15 and 13. My father would go to bed early, as he was a responsible adult. To explain the situation best, I need to describe what my house looked like. It was a one-story home, with four doors on the front of my house, three of which opened to our living room, and one of which opened to my bedroom. Our backyard fence had been knocked down by a storm recently, and we had two doors on the back of the house one that opened to the kitchen, and one that opened to my father's room. One night, around 12.30 a.m., I was doing what I usually did. I was listening to scary stories on my phone, as I made art on my iPad. I didn't use earbuds because I've always been paranoid that something might happen while I'm using them. My sisters, who shared a room down the hall from me, were doing whatever they did at night. It didn't really concern me. My father was fast asleep in his room, now, I don't know about all of you, but I always end up very on edge while I'm listening to scary stories, so I'm hyper aware of what's going on around me. You can imagine how hard I jumped when I heard a sharp pounding on our front door. Four hard thuds could be heard throughout the house, and I could hear the front door shake with the strength of each knock. I held my breath, hoping that I had heard wrong. I really didn't want to think someone was at my front door. At this moment, my middle sister, Jen, came running into my room, 
trying to keep her steps silent. She looked at me, eyes wild. You heard that too, right? She asked, voice trembling. I swallowed and nodded, heart pounding in my chest. We need to go wake Dad up. I responded and started towards my father's bedroom. She followed diligently behind me. On our way to our dad's room, my youngest sister, Ness, peeked her head out from her room. She, too, looked scared. I opened my dad's door and shook him awake, trembling slightly. One of my worst fears is someone breaking into our house. Dad, someone's at the front door. Even as I said this, I felt sick. Ugh, what? My dad said, groggy and not at all happy that we had woken him up. There's someone here, Jen whispered. I heard it. Someone knocked on the door, I said. My dad slowly got out of bed. He knows that my sisters and I always jump to the worst conclusions whenever anything happens, so he assumed we were doing the same here. I watched silently as he went to the front door, my stomach leaping to my throat. There's no one out there, he told my sisters and I absolutely unimpressed as he looked through the blinds. My heart sank a little. I kind of started to doubt myself, but my sisters had heard the knocking too, so I knew I wasn't alone in this. We tried to reason with him before he went back to bed, but he didn't believe us, too tired to really care about what we were saying. Dejected but scared, I ended up taking my mattress off my bed and sleeping in my sister's room for the night taking a baseball bat and laying it next to my mattress. My overactive imagination had me thinking that whoever was at the door was out to hurt us, and I knew I would have to defend my younger sisters against any danger that dared to enter our house. The next day passed just fine. My sisters and I knew that we had heard something, and our dad brushed off our attempts to explain it. He thought we were sleep-deprived, or perhaps that a large bug had hit our door, which was ridiculous. It wasn't until 11 p.m. that night, when my father was lounging on one of the couches in the living room, that we heard the pounding again. Only this time, it was much more aggressive, and directly on the door behind my father. My father let out a loud, What the? and charged towards the front door. I had been standing in the living room when the pounding occurred again and my sisters had rushed to stand next to me after hearing my father shout. We were all shaken. Our father never yelled like that. I started to cry as my father went to rush outside and confront whoever was out there. I begged him not to go outside because I thought he might get hurt. He told my sisters and I to call the cops, and he cursed some more when he realized that whoever had knocked on the door was gone. My sisters called the cops and they arrived fairly quickly, talking with my dad about what was going on, claiming that there had been other complaints about this happening nearby, and explaining that they would try their best to find out who was doing it. The police did a search around our house, but didn't find anyone, even searching the backyard, where I was afraid the perpetrator might be. The police assured us that someone would patrol the neighborhood that night. Once the cops were gone, my dad apologized for not believing us the night before, we said it was okay and left it at that. He locked all the doors and stayed up later than my sisters and I. I couldn't calm down, so I slept in my sister's room that night as well. Eventually, though, I put this situation behind me. A few months had passed, but not without nightmares and sleep paralysis about the whole ordeal. Most nightmares ending with someone breaking in and hurting my sisters. Other nightmares ending in more brutal ways. I had thought nothing more of the whole thing. That is until one day, I came home from school and Ness ran up to me, buzzing with energy. She proceeded to tell me that, apparently, the cops had found out who was knocking on everyone's doors about a month or so ago. It was an older man who lived a few houses down from us. They had gotten him to stop, and I am not sure if he was given a warning or whatever. He was a little unstable mentally, and nobody had opened their doors for him. Ness then told me that the same guy had been arrested earlier this day. I was shocked. He had only been knocking on people's doors at odd hours of the night. I'm happy to say that he is in jail and no longer lives in that neighborhood. 
I haven't done any more looking into his crime other than trying to confirm it for myself the day he was arrested. I'm also happy to say that, after another recent event where someone tried to break into our house, my father installed a ring doorbell, the doorbell with a camera, which gave my sisters and I some comfort. I really hope this man gets what he deserves, or maybe that he gets the help that he needs, if he really is insane. My mother's side of the family is fairly vast. She has three brothers and three sisters, all of whom are married and have several kids of their own. It goes without saying that when summer rolled around and it was time for the annual family vacation, there would be endless hours of fun and entertainment. My grandparents were fairly wealthy individuals, and with a share of their fortune each year, they would rent out a lake house, cabin, or beachside mansion for our family to resort at in its entirety. For the year in question, my grandparents decided to rent out a large four-story lakeside home. It was complete with a dock, game room, movie theater, vast kitchen, and even a tube slide system that went from floor to floor. What was supposed to be a blissful escape would soon become home to one of my worst memories to date. Before we delve any deeper into the story, I would like to do a quick explanation of the layout of the home because it's pertinent to the understanding of the rest of the story. The house was built upon a very steep slope that led down to a lake. The house was literally built horizontally off of the side of the hill. So on the part of the home that wasn't connected to the hill, there were long stilts that connected to the base of the home to the bottom of the hill. For additional support of the home, brick was added in between the stilts, creating a vast canaveral-like room underneath the home, only accessible by a cellar door at the bottom floor of the house. This pit, or room, had no insulation. Dirt floors, which in reality was just the bottom of the hill and filled with spiders and other small rodents and such, it was highly recommended by the homeowners who we were renting the property from that we do not venture down into this area because it would be a 10 or so foot drop to the floor and no ladder for assistance returning to the bottom floor of the home. So anyone that found themselves in this place would practically be imprisoned in a tall, dark cement hole. All right, back to the story. After all the pleasantries with my family and settling in for the first couple nights, all the more mature members of the family, which included me, my brother, and all my aunts, uncles, and their significant others, decided to play a game commonly known as Sardines. The game is basically inverse hide-and-seek, where there is one hider and the rest of the players are seekers. All the lights in the home are turned off, creating an atmosphere of complete darkness. The hider is given a minute to hide, and once they are settled, the seekers begin their hunt. If a seeker happens upon the hider, then they silently slip away and hide in the same place as the hider until all people are hidden and only one seeker remains. Now that you have a quick synopsis of the game, house, and large number of people playing, you can see how this could be the perfect concoction for a fun time. My uncle Mike was the one selected to do the hiding first. We shut out all the lights in the home, and after the given minute of hiding time, the hunt was on. My brother, aunts, uncles, and I searched the first couple floors to no avail. Searching under each table, in each closet, and behind each couch. After about 15 minutes of searching, and nobody seemed to have found him, an idea sprouted in my head. Though I dismissed the thought at first, I couldn't stop thinking about that cellar door and that space that lay beneath the home. Being that I was on the younger end of the family, around 17 years old, I wanted to impress them by being the first one to find him. So I silently crept away from the group and down the last two stories I had to go to get to the bottom floor of the house where the cellar doors were. When I got there, I found my body physically shaking with adrenaline and after opening the door that closed off the little closet-sized room that held the cellar doors, I was trembling with fear. 
They just looked so ominous, and in the dark lighting, I walked up to them and placed a hand on each of the handles. Before I even opened the door, I was able to hear scuffling and maniacal giggling from the room. This assured me even more that I had found him, and my fear turned into excitement when I learned of his presence. I flung the doors open and looked down into the dark abyss of the hole. I quietly whispered down at my uncle, telling him that I had found him and that I was going to drop down and join him. He just kept laughing and laughing, which really unnerved me because it was unlike him to do that sort of thing without at least admitting he had been found or telling me to join him. Really wanting to be the first seeker to find him, I slowly began lowering myself down into the hole, hanging onto the ledge of the cellar door and letting my feet dangle into the hole. I could hear his laughter getting louder and heard his footing shifting as he began to walk closer to me. A horrid stench assaulted me the second that I lowered the rest of my body into the hole. I still clung to the cellar door, not allowing myself to drop the extra five feet or so. Being that I was closer to the ground now, I could start to begin to see his shape, and it looked off. I couldn't make out facial features, but seeing his slouched posture and lanky arms made me hold onto the ledge of the cellar door for a moment longer in hesitation. In that moment, I heard my aunt's voice calling for me, telling me they had all found my uncle and that I was the last to find him. My mind didn't piece the two together instantly, but when it did, saying that I could feel my heart sink to my stomach wouldn't be an exaggeration. The immense, overwhelming fear that I felt in that moment I have yet to feel ever again. Without a moment's hesitation, I pulled myself up out of the hole and instantly ran to my aunt, calling for help, screaming about the man underneath the house. She looked confused at first, but sprung into action when she too heard the laughing from the hole. She called my uncles down while she phoned the police and gave them my quick description of the man. But because we were in the middle of nowhere, it took them about 25 minutes to arrive. When they finally did, it was a flurry of red and blue lights. But what unnerved me the most was that a full SWAT team arrived as well. A dozen men poured into the home, which felt intense for what seemed like a mentally ill home invader. Within moments, they came out carrying a deranged-looking man in handcuffs. It wasn't until later on did I get the full details of the story. The man that they had arrested was indeed a mentally insane person with a warrant out for his arrest for the mutilation of his ex-wife. I also found later that the stench that was coming out of the room was his feces. It appeared he had been trapped down there for several days. He claimed he had gotten himself stuck down there when he had initially broken into the cellar to elude police capture. It has been around three years since this incident, and its memory has become less and less intense with each passing day. However, some nights I lie awake at night, thankful that I did not let go of that cellar's ledge. Just a few days ago, I had the strangest experience I have had in the 10 plus years of driving a cab. I picked up this well-dressed and good-looking middle-aged man. However, when he opened his mouth, he said the strangest things. What started out as an entertaining discussion ended up as an all-consuming fear. I'm going to explain everything. Saturday night, I was working the graveyard shift. Most of my fares come from bars. I had just dropped off a pair of drunk women. It was around 3 a.m. when I noticed a well-dressed, tall man waving me down. The neighborhood combined with his fancy suit spoke possible big tipper to me. Once he got in and closed the door, he removed his hat, a fine-looking straw fedora. His clothing and movie star good looks were out of place. I feared at first that I'd picked up a time traveler I did the usual and asked him where he was headed. I don't know really. I'm in town on business and I was looking for someone to show me around. His answer made me chuckle. It seemed awful late for a sightseeing trip. 
Uh, as long as you're paying, mister, I'll drive you anywhere. And that was how it all started. For the next two hours or so, I showed him around town. The university, the Capitol building, the usual touristy stuff. At some point during our little tour, I remembered why he said he was in town. So what kind of business are you in? His reply made me laugh even more than his first. The guy was a natural comedian. I'm what some people would call a contract killer. We had been having such a good time so far, I decided to go ahead with the ruse. Okay, mister, I'll play along. Tell me how it works. How does one go about hiring a contract killer? Well, a woman contacts me. How they do so, I'll keep to myself. If their references check out, we move on to business. She gives me the names and any other info I ask for. If I decide to take the job, we move on to money. If we agree on a number, then I go to work. With all that anonymity, I asked him how he made sure that he would get paid after he offed someone. It appeared my choice of words made him laugh. It probably wouldn't be wise to tell you that part. We professionals have to keep some secrets to ourselves. Okay, fair enough. Well then, how does a client know you've completed the job? I regretted asking the question even before I finished asking it. Even though it was a stupid question, he still entertained me with an answer. Albeit, with a tinge of sarcasm in his voice. We live in a time with a 24-hour news cycle and multiple social media outlets. Don't you think if your dad died suddenly, that someone's not going to contact your mother first? If you don't discover it on your own, someone is going to tell you. Once I'm paid, my relationship with the customer ends. She's ultimately on her own after that. The last part of his answer brought up another question in my mind. Uh, if something goes wrong, per se, and she gets arrested or implicates herself, what do you do? He thought for a moment before answering. I imagine he was considering how much he should say to a stranger driving his taxi. Some contingencies have been put in place to protect myself. First off, if I have done my job right, the client shouldn't have any information about me to give to the cops. And if, on the off chance, I screw up so badly that she can, I have multiple exit strategies. I certainly won't let the police get their hands on me. None of us get to live forever. There were a few times I had to remind myself that this was a game. He made it fun, nonetheless. His imagination and forethought wowed me. We had been playing this game for hours before I had thought to ask him how he got started in his business. I joined the army fresh out of high school. It seemed my work caught the attention of my superiors. They referred me to a couple of gentlemen in the government and I worked for them for 10 years before I made the decision to go into business for myself. I gotta tell you, mister, you're really good at this stuff. You really should be a storyteller, if that's not what you're really doing for a living. I'm seriously impressed. And I wasn't blowing smoke. This was the most fun I had had driving a cab in my entire life. I was used to dealing with drunks and arrogant businessmen. This was a blast. Thank you, young man. I appreciate everything you have shown me tonight. I could tell by the way he was talking the night was coming to an end. It was just as well. The sun would be up soon, and I was beginning to flag myself. I took the opportunity to ask one more question. One I should have asked far earlier. He had said earlier in the night that he was in town on business. Did that mean he was here to take care of someone? A sly grin grew across his face as he thought on his answer. As a matter of fact, I was. However, I received a message at the last minute to cancel the hit. I get to keep the half she had already given me, so I didn't mind. That's business. It happens on occasion. That's a woman's prerogative after all, isn't it? To change their minds. I hope her and her old man work it out. Anyhow, that's how I ended up with you. Just as the first rays of the sun broke over the horizon, he pointed out a place to let him out. There were a few hotels at the end of the parking lot, and I assumed that was where he was headed. He reached over the seat and handed me ten $100 bills. Before I could argue, 
He told me to keep the change. Keep the change, kid. You earned it. I had a great time tonight. Thank you, mister. I had a great time myself, and thank you most of all for that awesome story. As he stepped from the cab, he said one last thing. Thank you for showing me around tonight, Adam. Take care of Linda, and stay out of trouble. I pulled out of the lot and headed for home. My hope was that Linda would have breakfast going. That was when it hit me, like a hammer. How did that man know my name? Not to mention my wife's. My license was nowhere he could have seen it. I reenacted the night's discussion in my head. There was never a point in which I told him. It would have ruined the game. I didn't ask him his, and there was no reason for me to tell him mine. Certainly not my wife's. How did he know I was married anyway? I hadn't worn a ring in years. I lost it down a drain and never found it. He could have guessed. The problem with that is Linda and I had just gotten back together last week. We had been separated and considering divorce for two years before that. When I pulled into the driveway of my house, a terrible idea came into my mind. Was there a possibility that guy wasn't making up a story? No one would dare tell someone, even a stranger, in such a bold and frank way, that he was a hitman. If he was serious, the fact he knew my name and my wife's could only mean one thing. Even if it was true, I wasn't ready to accept it. While Linda and I sat and ate that morning, I couldn't stop myself from watching her. I was terrified that my wife had wanted me dead. Even if she had changed her mind, there was no way she would admit it. If I did ask, either answer would most likely destroy the fragile peace we have built between us. I need to know, you listening, what do you think? Am I crazy, or is this really happening? Former funeral director here. The cemetery I run is really old, like by a good few hundred years. At least, it must be, since the church next to it was constructed during the 17th century. Considering the fact that it is a pretty rural place as well, most people back in the day were buried with only wooden crosses and such. No stone or marble. So as time goes on, crosses rot and wither away. New people get buried, etc. Nowadays, due to less people living out here in the sticks, the cemetery is really run down and overgrown. So as some of you can imagine, when you keep burying bodies in the same small patch of dirt for that many centuries, eventually the soil has been worked over dozens and dozens of times. So in the end, it consists mainly of bone meal. You can't even rake over the flower beds there without accidentally uncovering some teeth or finger bones or something equally grim. It's nothing but fragmented skeletons all the way down under the thin turf. The soil sort of resembles the kind of dirt you would see near sandy beaches, except on closer examination, all the light-colored parts are just bone fragments rather than crushed seashells. Not really scary or unexpected, just super eerie until you eventually get used to it. You learn to treat anything recognizable as human remains with respect and just tuck it away out of sight under the plant or whatever else you were putting there. Anyway, so someone was taking care of their relative's grave and decided to expand the area around the grave. For some reason, the people around here are not particularly fond of grass, rather preferring a well-leveled ground with zen garden lines made with a rake. The person removed the grass and was sprucing up the place with a rake when they pulled up a bunch of snow-white hair from the dirt. They must have freaked out and ran out of there, leaving the cemetery attendant to stumble across what is essentially hair coming out of the ground. She reported it to the church and supposedly they reburied the remains. Even with all my years as an undertaker, I'm not entirely sure how there could have been a body so close to the surface. 
But there's another incident that sticks with me even more than that one. My business partner and I had just gotten back to the funeral home from a house call for a 27-year-old woman who tragically passed away. As we were moving her body from the cot to the embalming table, we heard an audible click, and the radio across the room turned on full volume of static. It's one of those old radios where you turn the volume dial until it clicks to turn on. We both looked at each other, pale as ghosts. He happened to be an extremely religious man, and this event visibly shook him. He found an excuse to leave early, not long after the incident. I shut the radio off as I typically used my iPhone to listen to music while doing embalming work. When I had finished the procedure and was attempting to move her from the embalming table to a dressing table, I heard that click from that old radio, and it turned on full volume yet again. At that point, I was fairly freaked out and left not long after. My partner and I never spoke of it again, and nothing like that ever occurred to my knowledge before or after. I have heard countless stories about other people's experiences with sleep paralysis, and I thought I would share my scariest ones. A lot of people have heard of the shadow people. I have had an unknown black force pin me down in bed, suffocating me. However, the other two instances I have had are more bizarre, and I still think about them quite often. About four years ago, I was 24. I still lived with my mom since I was in my second year of nursing school, and it was just easier to live at home while going to school. Going to bed one night, all seemed well, until I woke up for no reason. I couldn't move or talk. I heard almost static mumbling sounds on my left. Completely terrified, I listen as I try desperately to move. Slowly this static starts to get clearer, and I hear young voices children's voices. They began chanting, You're going to die. And giggling after each chant. It was like they were singing a nursery rhyme. They chanted the same thing over and over again. My heart was pounding out of my chest. Logically in my head, I was telling myself this wasn't real. For all those that aren't religious, this may not seem like it makes sense, but... I decided to pray in my head to make it stop. It was like I was screaming in my head because I couldn't physically speak. It felt like an eternity before it went away and I was able to move again. I rushed out of my room to my mom and told her everything. I didn't go back into my room that night. She looked at me with disbelief. I don't know if she truly believed me or understand sleep paralysis. Regardless. It's something I will never forget. My second story was around the same year. When sleep paralysis becomes a recurring theme every night, or every other night, I just started to sleep with the lights on. For added comfort, my cats would sleep on my bed and cuddle with me until I fell asleep. For a while, no instances of sleep paralysis occurred, so I just assumed this is what I needed to do each night. Like usual, I went to bed with the lights on, and one of my cats, Salem, curled up in my arm while I slept. I woke up with a feeling of all-too-familiar dread. I couldn't believe what was happening. I felt like I was being watched. To my horror, I can't make this up if I wanted to, disturbingly saw a white figure on the right side of my bed, standing very close to me. My heart felt like it dropped into my stomach. I see piercing, bright blue eyes staring at me. I glanced down at my cat, seemingly unaware of the figure and sleeping soundly. This eased me up a bit. Seeing this made me remind myself that this wasn't real. After a few moments, the figure disappeared. Even with the lights on, I did not feel safe. I don't experience sleep paralysis as much as I used to, thankfully but those are two instances I will never forget. 
And if you suffer from sleep paralysis, you know exactly what I went through and how horrible it truly is. When my mom was 16, a year before she got pregnant with me, she was having the same dream every night for about a year. In this dream, she and a boy around her age would be surrounded by a group of men in a cemetery. My mom had no idea who the boy was, but every night, a man from the group would stand in front of them and ask, Would you die for him? My mom would answer no being that she had no idea who the guy was. The man would ask the boy, Would you die for her? The boy would reply no as well. One night, however, the man asked the boy first, Will you die for her? He said no as usual. The man then turned to my mom and asked her, Will you die for him? She isn't sure why, Maybe out of curiosity of what would happen, or fear of getting hurt. She said yes. The man stared at her. The man then said, Your fate is sealed, and so is his. But this time, he didn't hurt them. She just woke up. My mom was a model, and on this specific day, she had a fashion show that she would be doing in another nearby city. Her aunt had come to drive and accompany her to the show, along with my mom's best friend. Everything was fine that morning. My mom got dressed, her friend came over, her aunt arrived, and they piled into the car, ready for the three to four hour drive. While on the highway, my mom noticed she had forgotten something at home. They were only about ten minutes out at this point, with plenty of time to spare, so they turned around to go grab it. Just as they turned around, listening to music and singing along, my mom's friend asked to turn the music down. Do you hear that? She asked. My mom and her aunt were silent for a moment before hearing a strange scraping sound, like metal on concrete. They looked around for the source of the noise, but saw nothing around them. There were no other cars on the road. When they got back to the house, my mom ran inside as her friend and aunt checked the car to make sure the strange noise wasn't the car. Everything looked fine to them, and my grandfather even checked and gave them the okay. This all took maybe 20 to 30 minutes. With that, they shrugged it off and headed back towards the highway. When they finally got on, the highway was now covered with police cars, blocking off a lane where they could see a horrible accident had taken place. My mom's aunt approached the scene slowly, as a cop waved her down, telling her to stop. Uh, give us a second to clear this lane of debris. What happened? Her aunt asked, clearly shocked at the scene. It was a head-on collision, he replied. When did this happen? We were just here 30 minutes ago. The officer looked shocked. Uh, it happened about 30 minutes ago. You didn't see anything? They explained that they had heard a strange noise that sounded like metal scraping against concrete before exchanging worried looks as her aunt asked, Is everyone okay? No, ma'am. You ladies are lucky. It sounds like if you had been running even three seconds late, that could have been you. With that, the officer waved them through and told them to have a nice day. But as they passed the wreckage, my mom looked out the window to see them removing a body from the car. Her heart sank when she realized it was the boy from her dream. She never had that dream again. This story takes place all the way back when I was still in high school. In order to earn money to fund my video game addiction, I regularly tutored this 11-year-old girl. We actually got along so well that the parents ended up asking me to babysit her and her little brother a couple times. One night in particular, 
The parents were meant to go downtown to watch a baseball game before a few drinks with friends, telling me they would be back earlier than midnight. Basic babysitting job, right? Wrong. Right around 8 o'clock in the evening, it started raining pretty hard. We all lived in a gulf city at the time, and storms can blow in fast before turning into flooding really fast. Once it became horrifyingly clear we were in for one big storm, the parents tried to get home as quickly and safely as possible, but the streets had already started to flood, and apparently they ended up trapped in a parking lot. The irony was lost on me at the time, but not today. The kids' parents called and we agreed I would spend the night in their guest bedroom while they booked themselves into a motel. I had the kids go to bed while I sat up in the kitchen to do homework and watch Netflix. After a little while, I started to notice water seeping in from under the back doors. They had a large house with like three double doors to the back, so it was very large, with lots of square feet. I got every towel in the house and started wiping up the water and using the towels to block the door. After this had mostly been cleaned up, I went back to the kitchen table to watch more Netflix. Not much else I could do, right? But it couldn't have been any more than like 15 minutes later when the power cuts out and all the lights shut off. This freaked me out a bit, but I tried to stay as calm as I could. That's when the burglar alarm went off in the other room. I pretty much crapped my pants. I was in a pitch black house with two young kids surrounded by flooded roads that no one could drive on. After a minute or so of almost blind panic, I realized, to my horror, I was the closest thing in the house to an adult. There was no one looking after me. In fact, I was directly responsible for those kids. So I grabbed the biggest, sharpest kitchen knife I could find, then went to go check all the doors. They were all still closed, and no one was in the house. So I called the parents. It turns out the alarm went off when the power cut out, and I just needed to shut it off with a code upstairs. This happened about three more times over the next few hours. After the power came back on, I thought things had chilled out, but then we got a tornado warning. I went and got the kids from upstairs, and we all hung out in this study for about an hour until the warning passed. At this point, it was 2 a.m., and I passed out in the guest bedroom. The parents woke me up when they got home at around 7 a.m., and I drove home past giant fallen branches and stalled abandoned cars. It was surreal, but thankfully, everyone was safe and well in the end. I don't know what compelled me to finally share this, but I have been thinking about it a lot the past few days. I have a lot of thoughts about this, as it was the first and only time I felt legitimately afraid for my life. When I was about eight years old, my parents were going through a divorce, and me and my older sister used to spend a lot of time at our grandparents' house. It's a long, ranch-style home on a corner in a very nice neighborhood that's a 10-minute walk from a gas station grocery store, and a few fast food restaurants. The streets are long and lined with well-manicured houses, cradled by big, scenic California Valley hills all around. We were never very wealthy, but my grandpa bought it as a fixer-upper many years ago, and the property value has skyrocketed since then. As you can imagine, it's a very safe spot, and although there weren't many other kids in the neighborhood, it wasn't uncommon to see neighbors walking their dogs or pushing a stroller down the sidewalk outside of our house. Although my mom was especially protective all our lives, this particular neighborhood was densely populated and my family knew just about everyone who lived there. She grew up in that neighborhood herself, so she was understandably trusting. She would once in a while let me and my sister walk to the Rotten Robbie gas station on the other end of the block to grab a snack. I would always get a ring pop, and my sister would grab a three musketeers before we made our way back home. My sister was about 11 at the time, and this small amount of freedom was a really big deal to us. 
Nothing compared to walking down that street all by ourselves in the summertime, laughing and joking around, a couple dollar bills in our pockets. I felt like I owned the world. The one oddity I ever noticed around the neighborhood was a small camper that was parked on the side of the road opposite to the gas station, right along the backside of the fence of another house. It sat there in the shade like a permanent fixture, all the windows constantly covered by opaque beige curtains. I can't explain why, but it always gave me this deep sense of foreboding when I would pass it. I was almost positive someone was living inside it because at times I would hear the air conditioning running as it sat stagnant in the same spot. The hairs on my neck would always stand on end as I passed it, particularly as I passed the camper door and I'd always keep an eye on it for the fear that one day it would swing open just as I came to pass by. I think what bothered me the most was a drawing taped to the door from the inside. It was extremely messy, a sketch of odd lines in a brown colored pencil that was frustratingly indiscernible. I could see the outline of something, a vague shape, but could never make out what it was intended to be. I never had the nerves to stop and stare long enough to really investigate, but each time I walked by, I would steal a glance. A year prior to the incident I'm about to describe, I was walking with my mom past the camper in the shade. We had just gone to the park nearby and, unfortunately, had to pass the camper before we could cross the street and continue walking. I didn't want to seem afraid, so I kept on walking right behind her and did not object when she walked past it. This time, I felt a little more brave. I was frustrated not being able to decipher the drawing for so long and, while my mom was feet away, I stopped in front of the camper door and took a moment to really look at the drawing. Upon closer inspection, the paper was filthy. I remember doing a project in elementary school where we soaked printer paper in black coffee to make it look aged, and that's what it reminded me of. My mom walked on without noticing that I had stopped following her, but my eyes stayed fixed on the indistinct mass of dirt-caked scribbles until I could make out what looked to be a tiny, malformed face. My stomach turned. I immediately felt cold and disgusted as my eyes trailed over the rest of the image. I didn't know what kind of creature it was at the time, but now I can look back and say the drawing was a badly deformed fetus inside a mass of large, perfect circles, like those made by a circular ring ruler. Its face was contorted, as if in pain. It was so graphically disturbing and seemed to portray this odd sense of suffering that stuck with me for days. As a child, I didn't know how to process it, and the mental image still makes me sick to think about. I had never seen anything like it before. Adrenaline flooded my body, and my chest hurt with fear but I selfishly thought of my glorious little trips for ring pops and said absolutely nothing as I followed behind my mom. This was, in retrospect, a classically terrible idea. It's one of those things you scream at main characters in movies for. Ever since my ill feelings towards the camper had been elevated by the drawing on the door, I thought about it every time we drove by, and about a month later, my mom once again graced us with several bucks and permission to walk down to Rotten Robbie and grab our respective snacks. I thought about telling my sister about what I had seen on the way there, but she was older and braver, and I was terrified she would make me cross the street with her to check it out. It was a bright sunny day, and I told myself with false certainty that nothing was going to happen. If I didn't acknowledge it, maybe it would go away. We walked past the camper and it was thankfully uneventful. On the walk back, I was feeling more comfortable and was focused on fighting open my candy wrapper until my sister walked alongside me. We passed the camper a second time, but I didn't give it half as much thought as the first time. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I recall being interrupted mid-sentence as my sister softly yet firmly said my name. There was a distinct fear in her voice that immediately set me on edge, like a bucket of ice water. All my senses heightened 
and I became aware of everything, including the sound of haphazard footsteps about ten feet behind us. It was accompanied by a heavy rustling sound, like a heavy backpack, and nervously, I half turned my head to look. A man with a long, unkempt beard and wearing many layers of ragged clothing stood behind us, eyes unmistakably burning into our backs as he walked. His movements weren't normal. It was a drunken shuffle, like each of his feet were unimaginably heavy and needed to be moved one grand effort at a time. His shoulders were skewed, head tilted downward with a strange arc of his neck. I could hear his shoes scraping the gravel with every step, but rather than seeming genuinely intoxicated, it was as if he was intentionally meandering our direction like a zombie, with the direct effort to frighten us. Behind him, I saw that the camper door was wide open for the first time in all the years we had spent living there, and realized this was the man who had been living inside. He's following us. I choked out, my eyes filling with tears. My mind was spinning as I stared straight ahead again, and the wide street and sidewalks abnormally empty all around. My sister grabbed my hand. She squeezed it hard enough to hurt without looking my way, speaking carefully under her breath. On the count of three, we race home, she told me in a very serious tone of voice. I couldn't reply through the growing lump in my throat, but every single cell in my body understood that we had to put some distance between us and this man as quickly as possible. She began to count steadily while we walked faster, and the most terrifying part is that he started running before we even had a chance to. He must have heard her directions to me and tried to get a head start by sprinting our direction before she got to three. But his footsteps were noisy and we bolted like deer the instant we heard him behind us. I'll never forget it. The chase felt exactly like you imagine in your nightmares. The fear your pursuer is inches away from grabbing your arm or a fistful of your hair. I pictured myself being dragged into the van with nobody around to see or hear me. We ran so fast, we didn't even have the breath to scream, and peering back behind me, about ten seconds later, I saw him running in our direction with absolutely none of the impairment he showed with those zombie-like steps moments before. I think back on it now, and he may have been deliberately pretending to be handicapped to lower our guard so we wouldn't start running. The thought is terrifying, but I can't rationalize it any other way. We made it to our grandparents' house and, without looking behind us, yanked open the stubborn old door before slamming it closed and scrambling past their excited dogs to get as deep into the house as possible. I don't even think we locked it, as our main goal was getting within the line of sight of any adults as quickly as possible. My mom was talking to my grandpa at the table and gave us an amused look when we bounded into the living room. Since we were kids, running around wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and she didn't ask what happened as we collapsed on the couch and tried to catch our breath. The inside of the house felt safe and felt in such good spirits that I didn't even want to bring up what just happened, like waking up from a nightmare you don't want to talk about. I was desperate to go back to normalcy. I wanted to forget it entirely, to unwrap my candy and act like everything was completely normal for the sake of my own sanity, and that's exactly what I did. I asked my sister a few years back if she remembered this incident, and her response was strange. She remembered immediately without the need for me to provide details, but she quickly waved it off and insisted he had to have been a bored homeless man looking to spook some kids walking home with no real intent to harm anyone. I don't know. I'd like to believe it's some innocent misunderstanding, but like they always say about gut feelings, they are rarely wrong. I feel in my soul that he wanted to hurt me and my sister that day. I never told her or anyone else about the strange drawing on the door, and I'm not sure if my sister saw the open door and connected him to the camper or not. It's one of my biggest regrets, as I would hate for any other children to have been less fortunate after innocently walking past the camper in the shade. 
I believe he may have chosen the spot between the park and gas station deliberately due to the number of children walking around the area. I never saw the camper again a day or so after this. I am not proud of how I handled this and would encourage anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation to contact authorities immediately for the safety of others around. I don't know if maybe this whole story comes off as melodramatic, but it was very real and very frightening in a way that I cannot forget. This story is 100% real. Here is a little bit about me. I live with my mom, dad, younger brother, and our dog in a very rural area in Germany. When this happened, I was about 13 years old. We don't have any close neighbors. It was a very cold Saturday in December. I remember the day because my mother only worked on Saturdays. My brother, father, and I spent our afternoon watching movies. It was close to 5 p.m. at the point this happened. Since it was winter, it was nearly dark outside. The room was lit by the TV and our fireplace. At one point, my brother looked outside the window because it started to snow heavily. We all looked outside the window when all of a sudden, my dog began to growl. He ran up and down the room, very alert. This was very unusual for him to do. My dad stood up and looked around, but he didn't see anything. After a few minutes, he began to calm down again. We returned to our movie, and everything was fine for a few minutes. Then, he started doing it again. I noticed my brother was staring out the window next to our back door. I asked him what he saw, and he shook his head. Then, all of a sudden, we saw an elderly lady approaching our back door. We were baffled because hardly anyone comes out here, especially not an older lady like this. She looked to be around 80 or 90, wearing one of those typical grandma aprons and a headscarf. Mind you, it was below zero outside. She tapped on the back door glass and started to smile really weird. Meanwhile, my dog hid under the table whimpering and growling. My brother came close to me and my dad walked to the back door and opened it a bit. In a confused tone, he asked what she was doing in our backyard. She smiled and looked directly past him, at us. She never even looked at my dad. She took a step forward to the door, shoving her foot inside. My dad immediately pushed her foot back and shut the door on her. She glared at him, and then at us, before she started to laugh maniacally. Then, she just calmly walked away, like nothing had happened. We looked at each other in confusion, not knowing what to say. My brother and I looked outside the window behind us. We couldn't see her. The only way in and out of our backyard was the small path next to the house. From the window behind us, we would have seen her leaving but she never passed by the window. My dad stepped outside and couldn't see her anywhere. Neither could he see any footprints in the snow. There was absolutely no way the tracks would have been covered by snow already since only a couple of minutes had passed between her leaving and my dad going outside. To this day, we don't know what happened that day. I don't know if this was something paranormal or not. It may not seem so creepy to you, but to us as kids, this was the most terrifying thing we have ever witnessed. This happened in college, maybe seven years ago. At the time, I was living with one of my best friends and we were very into the bar scene and partying and such. We lived in a city that was very much inundated with college kids, so it was never hard to find a party. And I am ashamed to admit it, but probably every other night, I was out partying. So this story starts on a night very much like every other. She and I got all dressed up and went on a bar crawl. We ended up at this club, 
It was one of the more popular ones in the area, and we meet up with my ex-roommate. The three of us are having a great night, but periodically, we were all interacting with this one guy. None of us remember his name, but he seemed normal enough. He sat next to us on the smoking porch and bummed a cig from me. He bought my friend a drink, and he was dancing next to us. We even all had a little conversation together, although I can't for the life of me remember what it was about. But he was there, in the periphery, all night. Around 1am, the three of us decided that we were drunk enough and done dancing, and my ex-roommate invites me and the bestie to her place to smoke. None of us have cars at this point, but it's a nice night, and she only lives a couple of miles away, so we start walking. The downtown streets quickly turn into a semi-residential, semi-warehouse district area. Not the best part of town, or the most populated, but not a bad area by any means, and usually the streets are fully empty. We are maybe halfway to the house when we notice there's someone behind us trailing along and getting closer. We really don't think anything of it until we pause to light up some cigarettes and he catches up and we realize it's the guy who had been hanging around us at the bar. He's kind of stumbly, clearly drunk, and he greets us like old friends. We don't want to be rude, but it strikes all of us as kind of weird that he's there to begin with, but we shrug it off because he's drunk and seemingly harmless. I should say right now, he's a real scrawny guy, on the taller side, but thin, very thin, with a baby face and very big eyes. He just looks generally harmless and drunk. He asks if he can bum a smoke and walk with us until he gets where he's going, which isn't far, and he's clearly very unsteady on his feet. So we say, sure, why not? So we're walking and chatting, and we're getting closer to our destination, but he doesn't make any indication of where he's going. So finally, I ask him, where do you live anyway? And he gives me this funny look, like I had asked something really stupid, and says, oh, I don't live anywhere near here. This kind of creeps us all out, and we sort of stop where we are, and I say, okay, well then where are you going? And he replies, Oh, I'm following you. At this point, I think that maybe there's been like a misunderstanding in his mind. So I respond with something along the lines of, Okay, well no offense, but we don't even know your name. So you're not coming with us. And he gets this look, like hurt, but also angry, and a little manic. And he gets kind of loud and says, But I told you all my name. I told each of you my name. How do none of you remember my name? At this point, my ex-roommate steps in and says, Look, man, I know you're drunk, but you really need to calm down. And the guy stops and gets real calm, real fast. And he gets this really serious look and says, No, I'm not drunk. I'm fine. I just knew you'd trust me more if you thought I was drunk. At that point, I'm like, Uh, no, I'm out. But my roommate doesn't believe him and says something like, You've been stumbling this whole time, of course you're drunk. And he shakes his head and in a completely calm tone, with no slurring whatsoever, he goes, No, I'm sober. I just wanted to see if you'd let me in your house. And my friend responds, Why? And the guy gets this huge smile and his big eyes get even wider and he says, I just wanted to see how close I could get to killing you. At that point I had had enough, and I put on my authority voice, and I told him that that is enough and that we are leaving, and he needs to go the other direction now before I call the cops. He just shrugs and says, Fine. And we scurry away and leave him leaning up against a stop sign, just smoking a cig and watching us go. As soon as we are around the corner, we all break into a dead sprint and run for a few blocks, and then stop and freak out. We are in the middle of a panic whisper huddle, when my friend looks over my shoulder and lets out this little scream. We turn around, and there he is. It's dark so we can't really see his face, just his silhouette against the street lamps, but it was enough to know it was definitely him. He is striding down the road a few blocks down hands in his pockets, not a trace of a stumble. 
and he's not exactly running, but he's walking at this real brisk pace, and he had been on us in less than a minute. Luckily, we're only about a block away from my friend's place, so we start booking it there. We're almost at the front door when I realize, oh crap, we don't want him to know where we're going. Not the three of us alone. That seems dangerous. Fortune shines on us, as up the block, I can see the telltale signs of a garage party, and we book it over there instead. We come up to the lawn, and there's a bunch of guys out front, and we are breathlessly trying to explain ourselves, but when we turn around to point out the guy, he's gone. The partiers sympathize and let us hang out for a few hours, and a few of them even walked us back to the house. Thankfully, we never saw the guy again, and needless to say, my friends and I lost our taste for partying for quite a while after that. I'm an EMT, have been for almost three years now. I live and work in Southern California, and this particular transport happened when I was a brand new EMS worker at four months at a private ambulance company. This company was a private BLS, or basic life support company primarily, meaning we typically transported patients whose care provider had a contract with us. However, Sometimes we would run 911 calls out of prisons. This is where my story begins. It was late into the night at our station when I heard the tone from my radio. Unit 221 priority response to state prison for an unknown medical. Copy, wheels up in two, I replied. I walked over to my partner who was sleeping on our rec area couch. Rise, a life needs saving. I sarcastically exclaimed. We hopped into the rig, the engine roared to life, and we set off, lights blazing, sirens wailing. As we approached the prison, we killed the lights and sirens and proceeded with a routine security check. Once the guards were satisfied with the search, we were given access and led through the gates and parked outside the medical bay. Gurney and medical equipment in tow, we entered the prison hospital. Now, because my partner was the patient person for the last call, I was going to be primary care provider for this patient. Though I had been a pretty new EMT, I had done a lot of prison transports in a small period of time. I have had inmates scream at me, try to bribe me, and yes, even try to hurt me. So as you can imagine, I really wasn't looking for fight night on Unit 221 at 4 in the morning. Regardless, I always prepared for the worst. We were escorted in by guards as usual and led into the main area of the hospital's rooms, which were still fitted as cells. I was approached by a nurse who gave me a sheet of paper with his information and most recent vitals. I began to ask for the turnover report and why this patient required transport and where we were transporting to. The nurse stared blankly for a moment before he said, you're going to Scripps Mercy Shores Hospital, room 329. He's going because he doesn't feel well, and he needs some tests done. He shouldn't be a problem for you. Already a few silent alarms were going off in my head. Scripps Mercy Shores is a rich people hospital. I have never heard of anyone other than someone wealthy going there, let alone a prisoner. Second, not feeling well and needs tests don't really paint me a great picture for why he needs to go, and what I'll be dealing with. And finally, what does, he shouldn't be a problem for you, mean? If he's a violent inmate, or even an at-risk patient, they would normally just say so. Getting an actual report on this patient's health and medical condition was like getting blood from a stone. I decided to just relent and go ahead with the transport. The prison guards brought the shackled patient out to us. Another oddity. Every other time I would go in and talk with them before getting them onto the gurney. Standing before me was a tall, rather frail looking man with dark complexion. His eyes were red and sunken. His overall demeanor was a fearful one. He was constantly shivering. 
He looked horrible. I introduced myself and began my whole checklist of things to ask and address. We'll call him David. He answered all my questions with a small and quivering voice. When I asked what the problem was tonight, he gave a quick and frightened glance towards the guards and the nurse. I don't feel well. His reply sounded forced and rehearsed. Abuse from the staff came to mind first, but I would address that later. I decided to just go ahead and get this guy going, and I would wrap everything up in the ambulance. Before loading him in, I asked him the same question I asked all inmate patients. Be straight with me and I'll be straight with you. Are you going to cause problems once we get going? He quickly shook his head no, and we were off. When transporting prisoners, one guard accompanies in the ambulance, and another follows in what's called a tail car. This is for everyone's safety, and ensuring that if the patient tries anything, an official guard is there to address it. I was busy writing up my report when I realized that between the confusion of the call and the late hour, I had forgotten to get my own set of vitals. A rookie mistake. We were about halfway to our destination, and the patient had remained silent this whole time. I told him I was going to take his vitals and instructed him to give me his arm so I could begin. He did so immediately, like he was trained to obey anything demanded of him, and did so with that haunting look of fear. I wrapped my blood pressure cuff around his arm, and that's when I felt him for the first time. His skin was ice cold. There wasn't even a slight warmth to his skin. I asked him if he would like a blanket, but he declined. I continued with my evaluation. I inflated the cuff, pressed my stethoscope to his brachial artery, and listened for the pulse to come back to show me his blood pressure. It did not come back. At first I thought my stethoscope was broken, so I grabbed a spare one. Same result. No pulse. I removed all my equipment and felt for his pulse myself. Nothing. I looked at him and asked if he felt alright. He replied with a simple, quiet, I'm okay. Thank you. Caught off guard, I grabbed my pulse oximetry, which is used to find a heart rate and blood oxygen level, and put it on his finger. After a moment of the machine reading, the heart rate came back at zero and the blood oxygen level came back at zero. My heart dropped. I took another set of vitals to see if I misread anything, but they all came back the same. Heart rate, zero. Blood pressure, zero. Blood oxygen level, zero. The only thing consistent was his respiratory rate, which was 24 breaths a minute. A bit higher than resting rate, but not alarming in itself. I looked back again and asked him once more if he's okay. He looked me in the eyes and nodded his head. Yes, as tears welled up in his eyes. Then he looked away. He was completely alert. He responded perfectly to all my questions. His eyes were equal and reactive. All signs of good brain function, but no signs of a pulse or any vascular activity. At this point, I don't know what to think. Scientifically, there is no reason this guy should be alive. Even if he had an artificial heart, he would be showing vital signs and have a battery pack with a filter kit. But he is right in front of me, alert, breathing, talking when addressed. It makes absolutely no sense. I decided to continue investigating. I listened to his heart with my stethoscope. There was no beating, no thumping, just the muffled sounds of his breathing. While I was there, I listened to his lungs, all clear, all normal. I had just finished listening to his chest when we pulled into our destination. We offloaded him from the ambulance, took him to the room we were instructed to, then he hopped off the gurney and was escorted to the hospital bed by the guards. I began giving my almost unbelievable turnover report to the nurse, who surprisingly did not seem alarmed by any of it. I wrapped up my turnover and then sat down in a nearby chair to finish up my report. As I sat, 
Typing away at my computer, I am interrupted by the sound of a hospital gurney rolling down the hallway. It was accompanied by four people in surgical gowns who entered the inmate's room with said gurney. After a few minutes, the team in surgical attire emerges from the room, inmate strapped down to the gurney with restraints. He is audibly crying, and they wheel him down the hall and around the corner. That was the last I saw of him. I told my partner once we were back in the ambulance. He didn't believe me at first, which I can understand. I joke around a lot, but with the look I gave him, he knew I wasn't kidding. This story may not have been what you were expecting. It's not violent or particularly frightening, but this was hands down the most disturbing call I have ever had. I don't know what I saw. I don't know what I transported. I have my theories, such as experimental treatments being carried out on inmates, but with skin like ice, hardly any vital signs, and such a fearful demeanor, I can only wonder what kind of experiments and what kind of horrors this man had faced. After my freshman year of high school, I moved states. With my parents being split up, I moved with my mom, so once a month I would fly down to where I used to live and visit my dad. I would fly alone, seeing as I am 16. When I got to the airport, I went to my terminal, waiting to get onto my flight. I looked up from where I was sitting to see a man staring at me. He wasn't shaggy or rough looking. He looked like a middle class older man. The man looked to be in his mid-forties. I didn't really think anything of it, because usually I space out the airport. When they called my number to board the plane, I looked back to see the man staring at me again, and this time, he grinned at me. I was very uncomfortable at this point, but since there was free seating on this airline, I figured I would just sit in the very back, hoping he wouldn't follow me. When I got to my seat, I looked out for the man, hoping he would take one of the front seats, because they were all open. Instead, I see him make his way to the back, and he sits right next to me. I was near the window, and the middle and aisle seat were both open. And you guessed it, he sat in the middle seat. At this point, I was really freaking out, because I did not get good vibes off this guy at all. He smiled at me, and I gave him a weak smile, and turned my head to the window, hoping he would not talk. Hey. My name is Jack. What's yours? I looked at him and panicked. Riley? I said. I gave him my real name. As it left my lips, it ventured into his. Riley. What a beautiful name. I just said thanks and continued to look out the window. What school do you go to, Riley? The way that he said my name made me scream on the inside. I wanted him far away from me. I said back, I don't see how that's important. He looked at me and put his hands up and apologized, chuckling. He then started talking to me about his job. He was a college football ref and asked me if I was a cheerleader, which I was wearing my cheerleading jacket, so I assumed he already knew. I just nodded, not wanting to engage in conversation anymore. Thankfully, this man came and sat in the aisle seat, and Jack stopped talking to me, however, constantly staring at me. I faced my head opposite to his and put my head down, pretending to be asleep. I did eventually fall asleep, and I was awakened to the plane landing. Relief spread throughout my entire body. You're such a cute sleeper. I wish you would have never woken up he says with the most sinister grin. My eyes widened and my blood ran cold. I didn't say anything and just unbuckled my seat, giving him the impression I was trying to get off. When the aisle started to disperse out of the plane, he walked off and paused, looking back at me. I let four people pass me before stepping onto the aisle and I saw rage in his eyes. He continued walking down the aisle with his head down, when I got to the front of the plane, I went to say thank you to the flight attendants and pilot like I always do. 
However, the flight attendant pulled me aside. She said, Hey, do you know that man that was sitting next to you? I shook my head, no. Her face went white. When you fell asleep, he was taking pictures of you and telling us how cute his daughter was when she was sleeping. I was very puzzled because your body language was off. I asked her to walk me down to baggage claim, and she agreed, since she had time to kill. When we walked out of the plane and into the airport, Jack was standing there, waiting for me. She told me to keep walking, and I did. I ran into my dad's arms when I finally saw him. The man saw this and went the opposite direction. I don't know what his intentions were, but I am glad I never found out. I also realized that my school's initials were on my jacket, which makes me very nervous. This happened a long time ago when I was about four or five years old, and I'm 15 now. Looking back at the situation, I really think I should have seen the red flags about this guy, but since I was really young and stupid, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I thought he was just a nice guy. The whole thing happened in a mall, in plain sight, in front of hundreds of people. I had gone with my mother shopping, a girl's day out kind of thing. At some point, I got lost. Typical, everyone has a story like that, right? So far, no red flags at all. I remember seeing a guy with a very southeastern accent. He was dressed like a junkie, but in my five-year-old mind, I thought he looked fine. So, since I was a lost five-year-old girl who didn't know any better, I walked up to him and asked him for directions, and if he had seen my mommy, etc., he ignored my questions and when he saw me, his eyes lit up. He immediately started showering me with compliments, some of them inappropriate to say to a five-year-old kid. He gave me a pink and black bracelet and told me how well it looked on me. Of course, I was oblivious to the situation and ignoring all the red flags. So, at some point, he offers to take me to his private jet and fly me to Jamaica to relax and play with the dolphins basically made it sound like a child's paradise. All I had to do was get in his car. Of course, since it sounded like a dream come true, I trusted him. I kid you not, at the exact moment I was about to leave the mall, some guy wearing a suit and tie stopped us dead in our tracks and asked him where he was going with a five-year-old girl. You could easily tell that we weren't related. The guy responded with his raspy southeastern accent and said that I was his daughter's kid and he was taking me home. We were clearly not related, and so the guy in the suit asked me where my mom was. I told him she was still in the mall, and from that point on, there was some arguing between the two men. I didn't get the most of it, but I ended up going with the man in the suit, and the junkie cursed him out. We went to the lobby of the mall and found my mom there telling the worker behind the desk my description. She had clearly picked up by this point that I was gone. It turned out that the guy in the suit was a security guard at the mall and had picked up on how wrong the situation was. When my mom saw me with this guy, she picked me up and hugged me. This story is in fact very old, but I recently was reminded of it because a couple of my friends told me they were planning on going to Jamaica for vacation and the memories just came flooding back. So, security guard, who noticed how wrong the situation was, thank you. Thank you so much. I work at a non-profit home that works with people experiencing mental health or substance use barriers. We have an in-home location for services and also offer a warm line for individuals to call. In my line of work, you experience beautiful life-changing moments, heart-wrenching traumas, overdoses, recovery stories, and everything in between. Needless to say, myself and many others in my field can attest that very little tends to surprise you. However, this story was one of those that completely took me off guard. 
A few years back, we had a gentleman with a very unique voice that would call almost every day with a private number. The subject matter of his calls seemed harmless at first, but slowly seemed to escalate. He started by talking about worries that he had at home, but as his call frequency increased, so did his tendency to overshare. He began telling our female team members completely inappropriate things. He eventually told us that he enjoyed super gluing women to chairs to watch them struggle to get out of this seat. The first time I heard this, my face became simultaneously cold and hot. I could not believe what I had heard. I was in an angry state of shock and said that I had to end the call due to the apparent lack of words that had stricken me. Weeks went on and we had heard very little from our secretive super glue aficionado until it was a quiet day at the office and our mid-shift person had called in. Usually, we would try to find someone to replace this shift, but since we had no guests currently, we decided it best that I just hold the fort down on my own. I would soon find out what a mistake that was. I tried to keep myself busy, and while I was doing some paperwork and cleaning around the office space, I heard a knock at the front door. At this point, I was not expecting anyone, and potential guests are expected to call before coming to stay or to see the location as to best protect everyone's safety and confidentiality. I approached the frosted glass pane in the center of the door and saw a large shape of a man eclipsing our equally large doorway. I cracked the door open and sternly greeted the man and asked, what can I do for you? He stared at me in a way that wasn't completely predatory but also did not feel safe. He remained silent for a few seconds before a very eerily familiar voice said, I need to talk. He pushed the door fully open and let himself in as I stared in a state of disbelief. He continued on from his earlier statement and chuckled out. So let's talk. As calmly as I could, I offered him a seat at the table in the dining room area and sat across from him. His eyes stayed locked on mine, and if I was not almost completely positive that this was our mystery caller, what he said next fully confirmed it. While remaining his cold eye contact, he said in a seemingly amused way, I have this problem. I don't know if it's a problem really, but I can't stop doing it and I don't really know what to do. You see, I like to glue women to chairs. I like knowing that I'm causing them discomfort and that they are stuck because of me. I like watching them struggle and it makes me feel better than anything else I've ever done. The feeling is completely euphoric. It was taking everything in me to not cry on the spot. This was causing every alarm signal in my body to scream at me to get out or get harmed. I slowly slid my hand towards the work phone while looking at every possible exit and finding a flaw in every potential escape route and hoping that he would not notice. As my pinky edged the case of the phone, I saw his dark eyes flick over to where my hand was. Am I making you uncomfortable? I assure you I'm not going to harm you. I just want to talk. Just talk. He teasingly said as I stammered out a falsely confident, I'm not uncomfortable. My boss will be here soon, so I was just trying to see if she had messaged the work phone. He continued staring ice-cold daggers into my eyes that caused me to sit up straighter in an attempt to mask the involuntary shiver that had taken over my body. Is that so? Well, I wouldn't want to keep you occupied any longer. As he stood up, my heart began to pound impossibly more. I had no idea if he was going to harm me, leave or both. He began walking towards me, and as he towered over me, my heart was practically fully in my throat. At that point, he extended a hand out and said, Thanks for the chat. I quietly grabbed the tips of his fingers and choked out a, You're welcome. He smirked at me as he began walking to the door. As soon as he shut the door behind him, I locked the deadbolt and called my director. After the incident, I installed a panic button app on the phone and put chain locks on each entrance to allow us to open the door when needing, but to hopefully help us avoid people pushing the door fully open. 
and finding ourselves uncomfortable and in potentially dangerous situations in the future. A week went by, and I was at the office with a fairly new mid-shift team member, and she received a call from a private number. I watched as her face dropped after answering the call. I took the phone from her and introduced myself. I heard that same, nauseatingly familiar voice say, Hello, I just want to talk. I can't stop asking women their bra sizes in public. I was done. I barked out. Sir, this is not that kind of warm line. The Addict Anonymous meetings are every Thursday, and I can give you their number. But the reason that we are here is because we have our own lived experience and traumas that do not need to be reactivated. Thank you for calling and have a good day. Months went by without seeing or hearing that voice until I was waiting for some takeout in the waiting area of a restaurant and once again heard that spine-chilling voice enter my ears. I looked up and met those same dark eyes that caused me and my team so much panic and distress just months prior. They were there in front of me yet again. He looked panicked and taken by surprise in contrast to his amused and cocky persona that he portrayed before. He swept up the food in a hurried rush and found his way to his vehicle and tried to speed off, but not before I managed to photograph his vehicle make and model. So if he ever decided to make an impromptu visit again or drive by, we would have the information. I love my job, and I cannot stress enough that the taboo around mental health needs to be lessened. It's very unfortunate that someone was not even properly utilizing our services and they had made such a lasting impression of myself and my other team members. I still become incredibly anxious every time I hear the doorbell ring or a knock at the door when I am alone at work. Be kind to those that are unwell and need compassion, but always be mindful of your own well-being and listen to your gut feelings because some people with or without diagnosis or labels can be dangerous. Be safe out there. One time, my two friends and I were chilling in my living room. My two friends were both sitting on my chair about six to seven feet away from me, and I was reclining back in my lazy boy. I was getting drowsy and thought that I might take a little nap, and I started getting a little cold. I need to mention that I had been unconsciously holding onto a cigarette lighter in one hand that had a metal lighter case on it. Since I was beginning to get a little chilly, I crossed my arms in order to warm up. The second that I did, I started being electrocuted, and I don't mean shocked, like some static electricity or something. I mean my entire body started convulsing uncontrollably. I remember in that instant putting every ounce of my focus and energy into attempting to stand up, and after a few short seconds, I was able to. The moment I was able to, the electricity stopped shocking me, and I stood there flabbergasted, not sure what just happened. And that's what's even weirder, is that neither of my friends even noticed what had just happened. When I told them, they didn't believe me, and it didn't make sense, since I hadn't been touching or even near touching anything electrical, or that could conduct electricity. My one friend turned the chair I had been sitting in over, and helped me look everywhere around me for some kind of explanation as to how it might have happened. We never found anything, but a few minutes later as I sat trying to convince them both that it really happened, I opened my hand and set the lighter down, and on my hand sat a little square burn, the same shape as the metal lighter that I had been holding. Suffice it to say, that was the craziest thing that's ever happened to me. The burn was proof that it really happened, and I still have no clue how I was able to get my body to stand up, or how I knew that's what would make it stop. But it did. I still have no idea how it happened, how I got shocked so dramatically from sitting in a cushioned chair, but it happened. I was living in Tbilisi a few years ago, 
the capital of the Republic of Georgia, running a kind of legally ambiguous consumer credit operation. When I figured, it was time I took a much needed weekend getaway in a nearby small town. The town I settled on is an extremely popular tourist location. Given its beautiful location, along a river nestled in a deep valley and rife with ancient churches, with many options for potential guest houses, hotels and rentals, I decided to not book in advance and to just traipse around until I found something appropriate. I found a very adequate guest house, perched on a hill with about a one acre plot. Upon entering the guest house, I was greeted in typical Georgian fashion by an incredibly hospitable elderly woman and her son, who seemed to be in his early 30s, who resumed his yard work of filling a large hole that he said was a septic tank with a foul lingering smell after a brief introduction. Again in typical Georgian fashion, the hostess offered me tea, homemade wine, bread and cheese, all of which were much needed and fantastic. I am an American, but my family came from Eastern Europe, so I speak Russian, as most Georgians do, so we were able to chat a lot. Our conversation progressed from basic get-to-know-you bits to more personal information, like whether I am seeing anyone or who I am dating, which does come up in surprising frequency when you meet sweet grandmothers who want you to meet their granddaughters. At the time, I was dating a fellow expat from a Western European country. When I told the hostess that I was seeing someone, she seemed thrilled and asked me to show her a photo. She reacted with an ah and nodded in approval, commenting on her physique in a way that would probably be inappropriate if it wasn't a cute old grandma. I was then pressed by the hostess as to why I didn't invite her and how that isn't what a good boyfriend would do. Put on the spot like this, I lied and said she was very busy with a work project which she wasn't, but would be arriving later in the evening. The hostess was elated by this news and called over her son and asked me to show the photo of the girl I was seeing. Early in our conversation, it was established that I do not speak in Georgian. The son saw the photo and affirmatively nodded and spoke in Georgian to the hostess briefly and then turned to me with a beaming smile and a thumbs up and said in English, Very pretty, you lucky brother. He then in Russian asked if I texted her to invite her. I lied and said that I did text her, and reiterated that she was arriving in a few hours. It was around 4 p.m. at the time, in a beautiful golden hour glow that lit up the surrounding mountains and valley. The son said that he would join us, and asked if I liked cha-cha. Cha-cha is the very strong national liquor of Georgia, ranging from 30 to 75% alcohol content and made from distilled grapes. I had become quite the savant of cha-cha, and despite some strange feelings about their fixation on the female visitor, I obliged. Cha-cha is not for the weak-hearted, but I was very used to consuming it at the time. I should have paid more notice to the very intentional placement of the shots that he filled for us, but I pushed those misgivings aside and had the shot after a very traditional toast. Around 20 minutes later, I felt exhausted and ill and excused myself to my room, saying that I needed a quick nap. Walking to my room, I knew something was amiss. As mentioned in the beginning, I was fronting a questionable business and I did have a weapon in my bag and made a mental note to take it and put it under my pillow. But as one can imagine, it isn't easy to remember things even on short term when you're apparently drugged. Despite failing to collect my weapon, as the afternoon sun was blaring into the room, and I wanted darkness. Passing out at around 4.30pm, I awoke to darkness at 4.45am, with a raging headache. My window shades were partially opened, despite me closing them before passing out. They were opened with about two feet of space visible to the outside. My bags were not in the position I left them, and the television was on and on high volume, despite me never using it, and the door was only partially closed. I peered out the window and didn't see anything, so I quickly went to my bag, retrieved my weapon, and went to the bathroom with the intention of calling my coworkers or a driver to pick me up. I had no cell service and no Wi-Fi, despite having perfectly fine reception the day prior. 
I went back to the bed with the weapon under my pillow, with zero desire or inclination to fall back asleep. After an hour or so of pretending to be asleep, I saw the sun peer through the window to get a look inside. At this point I was certain it was not my imagination playing tricks on me, and that I was in trouble. I came out around sunrise to find both the hostess and her son sipping tea on the deck, and I told the hostess that my girlfriend was arriving soon on a bus and that I would bring her when it arrived. I grabbed my backpack and left my other bag to give the impression I wasn't fleeing, got service immediately after leaving the property, and called a partner to pick me up. Old school businessman who was floating the money that I had run the lending operation with. I told him the story, and he said he would handle it. And he did handle it. I still think about the foul-smelling hole the sun was digging. Maybe the last guest? Weeks later, I decided that wasn't the place or business for me, and applied to law school on the other side of the world. It was the summer right after I graduated from high school. A good friend and I decided to try our hand at camping. We grew up in the greater Los Angeles area, so our knowledge of the great outdoors was nothing beyond the couple of years that we had in Cub Scouts of America when we were in elementary school. In other words, we had almost no idea what we were doing. We packed a tent, a couple sleeping bags, supplies, etc., and headed off in his car. We grew up in the 80s, so this is a time before the wide prevalence of cell phones and the existence of other portable digital devices. We drove north on the 395 for about six hours and then headed westward into the mountains in the area of Inyo Canyon. First mistake, we did not plan on which place to camp. We played it by ear, like fools. Second mistake, we left in mid-afternoon so it was pitch black darkness when we arrived in the general area. We had driven off the main road and onto a dirt road in order to find a spot to camp. The dust from driving on the dirt road overwhelmed the headlight high beams when we finally decided to pull over and set up camp. It was around 11.30 at this time and we were exhausted and famished. Any place was a good spot to camp for us given our only reason to do so at that point was our hunger and exhaustion. Third mistake, we did not bring flashlights. We only had Bic lighters for our cigarettes. We tried to set up the tent using our lighters and the headlights of the car, which was parked about 10 to 15 feet away. The wind was blowing, so the lighter constantly went out after a few seconds, either directly because of the wind or indirectly because the wind would push the flame into our thumb. Clearly, we were being complete idiots. We finished setting up the tent, but at that point, I was too tired to eat. My friend managed to make some instant ramen. We smoked a cigarette in the car, then crashed out in the tent. We awoke to a very cold morning. It must have been around 5.30. Immediately upon exiting the tent, we realized that we were camped at the entrance of a hiking trail. There were at least two no-camping signs in visible distance from us. We dismantled the tent, cleaned up, and cleared out. That morning, we ended up buying some cheap flashlights and a nice hot meal in a very small town. It wasn't really a town, but more like a few storefronts with shops on a main road, about the length of an average city block. We went into some office, though I don't recall exactly what it was. It might have been a park ranger station or the office headquarters for a campground. In any case, we found and reserved a site for the night. The campground was basically like a large circle with campsites along its outer circumference, with each campsite being about 50 yards from its neighbor. In the middle of the circle was a common bathroom and shower. We circled around it once, and I think we saw one family that was all set up with a tent and camper. We found our spot and set up camp, which was quite far from them. That night, is when we had the creepy encounter. My friend and I were laying in the tent, shining our flashlights upwards and chatting. Our new flashlights eventually gave out. Yes, 
broke. Our fire pit was about six feet from the opening of our tent, and it was just a glowing ember. We probably should have completely put it out, and we probably shouldn't have had the tent so close. In any case, there we were, chatting away and having a good time. My friend began to be distracted with his foot. After the third or fourth time, he got up to check his foot. I asked him what was wrong. He told me that something was tapping his foot from the outside of the tent. His foot was against the side of the tent, so from the outside, you would have been able to see a bulge in the tent's side where his foot was. It was as if pebbles were being thrown at his foot through the tent. There it is again! What the heck? Each time it happened, there was a sound, like pebbles or a light tap. We sort of laughed it off, assuming that it was a twig or grass moving in the wind, or perhaps a loose strap on the outside of the tent. I don't recall exactly how it happened at first, but I do remember we suddenly became silent at the same time. A sound came to be audible to both of us. Footsteps slowly moving towards our tent. We wondered if it was a bear or other non-human animal, but it seemed distinctly bipedal. They were very slow and measured, like a step every two seconds. I finally said in a whisper, Someone's out there. My friend didn't move. His face had an expression of fear. At some point, my friend bolted up and said, F this. He grabbed his pipe, stuffed it full, and took the biggest, deepest drag I've ever seen a person take. About one or two minutes later, he was out. Smoking is not my thing, so I was alone in the tent, as far as conscious bodies are concerned. I was sitting up at this point, and I had taken out the only weapon I had, a Swiss Army pocket knife. I took out the big and small blades, as well as the ice pick in the middle, and held it like some ridiculous melee weapon. I could see the glowing embers of the fire pit through the sheer nylon material of our tent, and I was able to roughly, but barely, discern some of the rocks around it. I watched and listened intently. The footsteps came closer, and at the same slow pace. With each step, I could hear the dirt and rocks underfoot crunching and grinding. At some point, it was clear to me that whoever it was was standing between the tent and the fire pit, for my fuzzy line of sight to the burning embers through the nylon tent became obscured by something outside of the tent. The footsteps stopped right at the front of our tent, about six to eight inches from the entrance to the tent. It was silent for about one minute, and then I heard a click. At exactly the same time, I clearly saw through the nylon tent wall a flashlight turn on. I was able to see not just the flashlight, but the outline of the hand holding it. The flashlight was shining on the zipper entrance into the tent, just inches from the zipper. Blood drained out of my head, and my palms instantly became dripping in sweat. I yelled, Who's there? There was some fear in my voice, but it was mostly aggressive in tone. Whoever it was, the person immediately turned off their flashlight. I didn't move, but neither did they. The person just stood there, inches from the tent's only entrance. My friend is out, totally unaware of what's going on. Nevertheless, I pretended that he was still awake and whispered just loud enough to be audible to our visitor. Yeah, loaded. There's one in the chamber. As if my friend was awake and asked me about a weapon. Fourth mistake, we did not have any real weapon for self-defense. It felt like an eternity, but after sitting still for at least ten minutes, I heard feet slowly turning in the dirt, then slowly walking away from the tent. I stayed up the whole night, and it wasn't until the light of dawn came through the tent that I crashed out. The heat inside the tent woke us up, and it was near noon by this point. We went outside to inspect the site, but found nothing missing. However, we did find boot prints all over our campsite and leading away from the campsite and outside the campground. That was the last time I camped in a tent.
So let me preface this story by explaining that I live in a regional town of Australia. There is no trafficking problem here. It just doesn't exist. There's no gang activity, no unsolved murders, and no missing people or unsolved crimes. Just to give you the lowdown of the sort of area that I live, this happened today, and I'm still unsure whether I should do anything about it or if the police would even bother. I flip furniture as a hobby. I like to pick up free or cheap worn out furniture, repair it, repaint it, and then resell it. It keeps my mind occupied. Facebook Marketplace is usually my go-to to find stuff. So this morning I found a post for a free table. I messaged the person, asking if I can pick it up today. As I am messaging them, their Facebook profile picture disappeared. I thought that was weird, but maybe they had just changed it. They agreed to a time and gave me the address. No worries, it's on the edge of town. They send me a random, obscure message asking if I'm coming alone or if I'll have somebody with me. I'm not married or anything, and this is slapping me in the face with red flags, but I think maybe the table is heavy and they just think that I might need some help to carry it. I respond with, no, it's all good, I'll be fine. No response back. I have this uneasy feeling that something isn't right with this. I've never felt this way before, and I don't know why I do now. But I figure it's the middle of the day, I've got my phone, and I'm driving, and this is a safe town. Maybe I'm just overthinking the whole thing. So I hop in my car and head to the agreed place. I couldn't find the exact address on my GPS, which I thought was odd. But nevertheless, I find the street. There's nothing there. And by that I mean, there is a creek that runs by the side of it. Empty lots with bushland and tall overgrown grass a disused, isolated somewhat motel, and three warehouses. By this stage, I am feeling really off. Everything inside me is saying there is definitely something wrong with this situation. I'm paying a little more attention to that feeling, but keep going. Two of the warehouses have no signage, but there's a couple of cars out front, and I can tell that they're used as businesses of some sort. Their address isn't the one I was given though. Even though the motel looked like it hadn't been used in years, I see a man sitting on the step of one of the units, smoking. I think to myself, that's a bit creepy, but maybe he owns the place and is doing some work there, and is just taking a break, or maybe he's a squatter. So I drive down the street a little further and find the last warehouse. The address is where pickup is meant to be, so this must be it. I start thinking maybe they got the number wrong, I mean, this place has tall weeds surrounding it, garbage in the front, and surely hasn't been used since it was built. I might like free furniture, but I'm not an idiot. I decide I don't want it anymore, and message the guy that I was sorry, but I couldn't find the place. I get a message back asking if I'm the one in the truck, and telling me that they saw me drive down the road, and they ask again if I'm alone. There's no cars or any sign of life at this warehouse. And by now, my intuition is screaming at me to get out of there. Yes, I'm in a truck, but I don't see anyone. I message a reply and say yes. Sorry, I couldn't find the place. I'm leaving. I get no response for about an hour. No sorry, nothing. A little bit later, the only response I got was, It's the old motel. You have to get out of your car and walk to the back of it to get reception. That same worn down isolated motel with overgrown weeds that hasn't been used for years. The same one with the weird guy sitting on the step. I assumed that guy was the person messaging me. I message back and say, it looked like that motel hadn't been used in years. I get no response, nothing. So I head home and sit down for a drink and to Google this place again. I have forgotten the exact address he gave so I go back to Messenger to find it, except it's gone. So I go back to Facebook Marketplace, and the whole ad is gone. It disappeared as if it never existed. What do you think? Am I overthinking this? Or did I just avoid something sinister?
As a female who's been on the game for 15 years now, I have met a load of creeps, but only a few have made me feel unsafe. To start off, I've always had a laptop since I was in high school. A luxury back then, I worked hard to earn enough to buy one. My mom always took my money that I earned for things less than respectable, but luckily, money I made in tips were in cash, so it was easier to hide it from her. At first, my mom was mad that I bought myself a laptop, but she soon forgot, like everything else. My dad could care less, and my older brother already had his own, so I started playing World of Warcraft with him at 14, and back then, girls playing were unheard of. So I got the usual creeps who usually backed off after hearing my age, but not this one guy. This guy loved that I was underage. I was about 16 and used to creepy guys at this point, no longer a noob at the game or fending off the creeps. It was no surprise that a guy in my guild started hitting on me. Now I was 16, stupid, but I knew I wasn't going to find love on World of Warcraft where you know no one in real life. Plus, I had this ultimate crush on a guy that I couldn't have because he was my brother's best friend. So it was easy to turn guys down despite being desperate for one. But that all changed after my brother's friend went off to college. I had a part-time job with my brother's friend, but girls at work surrounded him, and I became demoralized that I would never find love. Cue the 19-year-old guy on World of Warcraft who made me feel wanted. I had a camera phone, so I could send and post pictures at that age, and back then, I mostly used Facebook, MySpace, and PhotoBucket. I lost a lot of weight my sophomore year, so I posted confidently bikini pictures and sexy pictures thinking that I would lure the attention of my brother's friend, whom was 19. So when this guy who was also 19 liked me, it didn't faze me. He looked the part in his photos, and his younger brother was my age, so I thought he was extremely attractive in his photos and even proved it was him in his pictures by holding items I asked for. He started paying my World of Warcraft subscription, which in the long run, I realized was to get my home address and my real name. I was so stupid and heartbroken over my brother's friend, years of teaching myself online safety and the ability to be strong against flirts was all but lost in the fog. We would talk for hours on Ventrio and he would make me feel pretty. I was completely blinded by this point. He sent me gifts and I didn't even question how he had my address. Then he offered to drive and pick me up as only then did I suddenly get cold feet. I had a good friend on World of Warcraft, someone my brother met on PAX and joined the guild and is still one of my best friends to this day. He's six years older than me, but never creeped on me, was more like the protective brother that I lacked. He caught on to it through conversation and was my words of wisdom in a time that I was lacking any of my own. He saw something was fishy when I couldn't, I told my friend I was scared to meet him because, dumb teenager logic, I thought he would not like me. My friend chimed in that I shouldn't meet anyone off the internet at my age. I told him about the gifts and I swear I have never been scolded like that before in my life, not even by my own parents, but he always cared like that. He wondered why I would give my address to someone I never met and the expensive gifts that I received were not something the average 19-year-old could afford. None of this ever clicked for me, of course, because I was lonely and trying to prove something to myself, that I could get a boyfriend. So just like that, I told the guy it wasn't wise to meet in person, and my parents said I wasn't allowed to. That's when he went dark. At first it was pestering over and over, guilting me over the gifts he gave me and encouraging me to defy my parents. While he kept bothering me, it never once occurred to me that he would lose his cool. While my friend was worried about the guy having my address, going as far to drive the 11 hours to my house and explain the situation to my dad, as I refused to tell him out of fear of getting in trouble at the time, all while taking his spring break in my state instead of his own with his friends. There's a reason he's still one of my best friends. He has a little sister of his own as well, and she's my age so his protective nature is natural. Eventually he made me block the guy, and that was that. 
This guy was so angry. He would go on different accounts to accuse me of gold digging and using him. Luckily my friend was smart enough and had the foresight to change my World of Warcraft password and even paid for my account for me, taking this guy off of it entirely, as one of this guy's threats was to delete my account. But it did not end there. It got worse as he would consistently find ways to message me and tell me how horrible I was. Till about a month had passed, I was walking home from school, about a two mile walk in the wealthy suburbs of New England, which I had done for years. Many kids did it as it was a very safe town with no crime. Without a second thought, I took off with my 100 pound backpack, put my headphones in and started my 20 minute walk home. It was cold, so I had earmuffs over my headphones, only drowning out the sound more. I swear if I could talk to myself as a kid, I probably would just slap myself for being so stupid. Because the World of Warcraft guy knew that I walked home every day, as I had talked about it before. He knew my address, and I never thought twice. I was on the back roads walking home, and honestly easy to map from my school to home, as it was pretty straightforward with only one turn. At halfway home, in between songs I heard a vague crunching sound of tires rolling over gravel on the road slowly. I turned around to see a tinted black car and you couldn't see much of the person driving. I jogged out of the driveway that I was standing in front of, assuming it was waiting to turn in. But it didn't turn in. The roads were dead and it did not make sense for him to not go around. I swear. The saying that you go cold when you're terrified is absolutely true. It could have been a summer's day at 95 degrees and my bones would have been cold. My heart just sank and my breathing was uncontrollable. I felt like I had no control over my body as I realized this guy was following me. My blood ran cold and my hands shook as tears formed and my skin felt tight. My body felt like it wasn't ready to fight or flight, but simply freeze there and die. It only got worse, as the second time I turned my head to see the car stop, I stopped. My world stopped. I couldn't stop staring, just froze, and breathing like all my school books were on my chest. Crying silently, my eyes hurt, with no tears or sound as I just stood there. The door opened after what felt like hours, but only seconds, maybe a minute. And it was in fact him. It was the attractive guy from the photos. Not a catfish, but something seemed different. At first I thought it was his angry expression, but soon realized he was definitely not 19. More like in his 30s. I could barely think over the loud sound of my heart racing as it froze me in place. I thought I was about to throw up as he spoke to me, told me to get in the car or he would light my house on fire. I honestly just couldn't move, couldn't reach for my phone as his words turned me to stone. And somehow we both failed to notice the little old lady on her porch watching this play out. Suddenly I hear her yell, get away from that girl right now before I burn you alive. We both turned to meet her eyes a completely serious, angry, small lady, about 60 or 70, with white hair. I think she noticed my frozen and fear state as she told me to get over to her quickly. Like that, I ran over to her, tossing off my heavy brick of a backpack. It was obvious he was unsure what to do next as he stood there and watched me run to her. Must have been a sight, this tiny, thin old lady standing in front of a teenage girl yelling at this man to go away. Just like that, Savior Number 2 joined the battle as her husband stepped out, a man that looked like he had been through a war or two, with a booming voice. I've killed men for less reason. You better leave right now. He got into his car and drove off as I simply collapsed. All that fear just came out as I cried harder and harder, as my brain sifted through the past few months of mistakes. After calming me down enough to speak in non-hyperventilating words, she asked me if I knew him. I told her kind of, but only online from a video game, not real life. Of course explaining it wasn't easy, 
She got on the phone with the school counselor. Her daughter apparently told her my name. I was well known to her daughter, ironically, but it was only 250 or less kids in the school, and the town itself was small. Many staff at our school had family in town. Kids at school they were related to, either by their own children or their siblings' children. It was the kind of town, if you didn't leave by a certain age, you were stuck there. So honestly, it seems ironic, but not entirely a huge surprise. The counselor was well aware of my family and my mom's addiction, as child services had been involved a few times. She came by in about 10 minutes to pick me up and asked me a ton of questions, of course, knowing I didn't want to involve the police as I was scared of being taken away from my parents again. We weren't rich, but we were more well off than many. Though my mom worked, my dad kept my mom in a tight budget to keep her from buying prescriptions from Canada she wasn't prescribed. She knew all of this, and knew though it would be rough, I was better off than foster care, which was a gamble with losing odds at best. Plus, two more years and I would be off to college anyway, so we didn't involve the cops, but she made me promise to take the bus every day and to inform my dad of the situation. She also called my dad at work to inform him and had a teacher make sure I got on the bus every day until I graduated. It really sucked, but I understood. If it ended there, it would be nice, but there's still more to the story. Two days after this, my dad had to fly out for business. My brother was off at college, so it left me and my mom, who promised my dad she would stay sober while he was gone, but I was used to helping her while she was intoxicated. It was like taking care of a child, but I was on edge as every creak in that big house from the 60s the cat stirring at night, the dog barking outside set me on edge, and I barely slept. My friend from World of Warcraft called every night, making sure I was okay for the past month. I lived in the middle of the woods, next to a huge river in my backyard, so there was still a lot of wildlife outside in the dead silence of cold months. Running water is an important source of water when the lakes freeze. I had been used to all the bumps in the night, cats coming and going and dogs barking at every animal in the yard. But it all seemed new to me as I laid in bed trying to drown out my fears. The house I grew up in was a six bedroom house. I had a little sister too, but she stayed with my grandma in another state per court order while I was allowed to choose due to her only being nine and me 16. The other rooms were used as a game room, an office for my dad, and a guest room, mostly for when my sister visited my grandma, so she had a room to stay in. So in a large house like that in the middle of the woods, it was scary to virtually be alone because my mom was defenseless. I was letting my last cat inside for the night, and I noticed, at the end of the long driveway between my neighbor's house and our house, was a parked black car. I quickly shut the door and locked it after my cat got inside. I made sure all five doors were locked and even put cardboard on the glass doors to the pool, hoping that if someone broke them, it would delay him if he was in fact in that car. I went and turned off all the lights and got all my cats into one room so I knew they were safe. Here's the thing about my dog. He's untrained for the most part, but was basically a giant puppy in his mind. He growled at strangers, not barked like at animals. We had to keep him outside if we had guests, but he never bit anyone, and if you spent enough time around him, he would eventually accept you. He didn't growl at all strangers either, so he wasn't the most reliable guard dog. But he was big, and he had a deep bark. I mulled over what to do as I sat there in the dark with my dog, waiting for a shadow to pass by the window. I eventually went upstairs to my mom's room and woke her up from her sleeping pill slumber. Groggy and still kind of intoxicated, she did not quite grasp what I was telling her until I started crying. She kind of sobered up and asked me to get her some coffee, and I did, all while I'm watching my dog's every move, because I knew that he would be able to sense something before I did. As my mom sobered, the fear in her eyes grew. Eventually she got the idea to call my neighbors and ask them if they knew the car. After they all said no, Two of the men left their house to go check the car. 
the car was empty. At closer inspection, they noticed it was a newer car, a Lexus, and in the passenger seat was a laptop. The car was locked, but with a flashlight, you could see somewhat into the tinted windows. They never told us why, but something they saw in the car prompted them to call the local sheriff. There was only one, and he lived in town. He drove over about 15 minutes later, ran the plates, and asked all the neighbors about it. Apparently, it was a rental car from Ohio, and he was calling to see who it was rented to, but the offices were closed. He stuck around in his car for about an hour, until someone came out of the woods and ran back in as the cop shined his spotlight on him. I couldn't see what he was pointing at with his light, as it was on the side of my house and I was looking out the front. I guess he called for backup, as three other cop cars showed up in five minutes from the neighboring town, at which time a lady cop got out of her car and I asked to speak with her and for her to call my counselor at school to explain who that might be. I was pretty shy back then, but something about a female cop made me feel more comfortable to open up to. I told her the gist of the story, and then she called my counselor who backed up my story, but also was explaining why I was scared of cops because of my history with foster care and not wanting to go back. At which time, a mostly sober mom joined me, hugging me, doing her typical apologetic routine, but also offering much needed comfort as she called my dad too. Eventually, the lady cop asked if she could take a look around the house to see if things were secure and get any information from my laptop about him. In her search, she found something I didn't think about checking. The basement door was not just unlocked, but open. It's never unlocked, so I did not even think to check it as our backyard floods in the spring due to beaver dams and it's got extra seals and stuff to prevent the basement from flooding again but the stuff that was sealing it, which was mostly sandbags and stuff, were set aside. But the door at the bottom of the stairs was locked, even though it did have some damage, like someone tried to pick it. But he did have access to half the basement that was storage, and the other half used to be used for my brother's parties. The door between the sections was like a front door, not an indoor door. As in the summer, my dad left the hatch open to dry out the basement and adjust pool settings, as it was basically the pool house, and the cats loved it, so it also had a few cat beds. The section that led upstairs was locked from the inside, and the wall and door were not drywall and were made of cheap material, but the lock and key heavy door was brick. Upon noticing this, my dad confirmed that he had not left it open. My suspicions that black car was his was pretty much confirmed. As we walked through the house to make sure everything was still safe, she got on my laptop as they searched the woods. I gave her everything I had, his photos, username, and she even checked to see if his credit card was still on my account, but it wasn't. But the last few digits were. She then asked to take my laptop for a few days as she thought she could get some good evidence from it. I asked her to please not damage it and return it as soon as possible because I used it a lot. This was before smartphones, so it was all that I had. After a few hours and the onlooking neighbors had gone to bed, the cops came back empty-handed, but left one cop outside of our house and they towed the guy's car. From what the lady cop told me, what permitted such fear in the car was multiple weapons, some sort of rope, and handcuffs and the guy that ran back into the dense woods was wearing a mask. So eventually I try and lay down to go to sleep, but pretty sure I was going to call out sick tomorrow and kept all my cats inside for the day. I was too restless to sleep. Every sound scared me. My mom slept with the dog in her room, and my cats slept in my room most nights by choice, as my room was usually the warmest. At 3.30 a.m., I heard a knock at the back door, and I heard a man say that he was an undercover police officer and to open the door. I was still awake as I walked downstairs to make out a guy standing in the dark. He had a weapon. As he saw me, he demanded that I let him in, now, as he needed to speak with me. Something felt off. My gut knew it before I did, that this guy's voice seemed forced. 
like someone purposely making their voice deeper. And why was he at the back door? So I turned on a light outside and sure enough, it was him. I just screamed and as quickly as I did, he started pounding on the door hard. It wasn't a loud horror movie scream, but more like a gasp. I don't think the fear in my body had a loud scream to let out, but the banging was pretty loud as I ran to the front to see the officer was still outside. He was, but he wasn't getting out of his car. I didn't want to run outside, as I am not the fastest runner, so I turned the porch lights on and off a couple times, but still, nothing. After a minute, my dog came bolting down to the door, barking and growling, nearly foaming at the mouth, soon followed by my mom, who was angry and was threatening the man. Somehow during all this, the cop outside had snuck around back and had his weapon pointed at him, yelling at him to put his down. I hid as the rest went down, but he was arrested. No trial needed me to attend, and my statement was enough. Come to find out, he wasn't even American. The car was rented under his friend's name, and after all that was done, he was deported back to Canada. I assume something with his passport would prevent him from coming back to the USA, as the cop reassured me that he couldn't come back to the USA now. I don't know what exactly he was charged with, but I think my dad said activated assault with a deadly weapon, attempted kidnapping, and something else and it also turned out that he was 32 years old, not 19. So I assume me being a minor carried another charge. And life moved on from there. I had plenty of creeps before and after, but he was by far the worst from World of Warcraft. I experienced a couple more creeps from streaming, but I'm an adult now and much better at staying safe online. In 2017, my husband was away frequently for weeks at a time, working in another city. At this time, we lived in an apartment complex in a large city in a one-bedroom unit on the first floor. I have always been pretty independent and was used to him being away, but for some reason, in the weeks leading up to this event, I had become increasingly paranoid, or so I thought at the time. In retrospect, I think my intuition was trying to warn me that something wasn't right. This all happened a few weeks before Christmas, and despite the holiday cheer all around, I had a sense of dread or melancholy almost everywhere I went. I began to have strange occurrences, which I tried to find explanations for. First were the nightmares. I am no stranger to sleep paralysis which has plagued me off and on since I was a teenager. During one of these episodes, my body numb and trying desperately to wake myself, I saw the typical threatening figure in my room at the foot of my bed. A young girl, maybe 10 years old, in a white nightgown, just staring at me with hollow black eyes. Her arms were down by her side, but in her right hand, she held a small teddy bear. She didn't speak or hug the bear. She just held him there, dangling. I managed to wake myself, and although the image was terrifying, I calmed myself and dismissed it as another awful sleep paralysis episode. I managed to go back to sleep with the light on. I have had a few episodes which stuck with me, and that one definitely did. The image of that girl and her teddy bear haunted me for days. Around the same time, I started to see a black cat stalking me while I walked my dog. I don't mind cats and I don't think black cats are particularly bad or anything, but for some odd reason, this cat scared me. It seemed like a normal cat, but different in a way I cannot put my finger on. It was too interested in me. Oddly, I never saw it in the daytime. My dog was old and I would have to take him out frequently in the middle of the night. It never failed that during our nighttime walks, this cat would show up and follow us at a distance in the shadows. I love animals, and this next part will sound crazy, 
but something about this cat made me think. It was a personification of death. I had the thought that if it caught up to us, it would take my dog's life. An odd thought, which I tried to put out of my mind. I told myself I was being ridiculous, and this was just a cat. I saw it almost every night leading up to the major event. One evening, a few weeks after this sleep paralysis incident, I awoke to what I thought was my doorbell ringing in the middle of the night. I wasn't even sure whether I had actually heard it or dreamed it. It was about 2.45 a.m. This made my heart pound and the fear set in. I am a very private person and did not know any of my neighbors well enough that they would likely ring my doorbell for any reason at all, much less at almost 3 o'clock in the morning. I am very introverted and not the type to have guests, so most of my friends and acquaintances didn't even know where my apartment was, much less would arrive unannounced in the middle of the night. I got up tentatively, trying to be as quiet as possible and peeked out of the peephole in my front door. I saw nothing. Then, I checked through the front window. Again, nothing. I was creeped out, but everything appeared normal. I decided that I had either dreamt the whole thing, or the doorbell wiring malfunctioned. Even though I was still on edge, I calmed myself and tried to sleep. Meanwhile, teddy bears, oddly, seemed to be popping up everywhere. My toddler niece told me she wanted a teddy bear for Christmas. She normally liked dolls or plastic animals like dinosaurs or snakes, but she just kept saying she wanted a teddy bear. Odd, because she already has several of them. Then, one morning, driving down the freeway on my way to work, I passed a pile of clothing that had been somehow lost on the road scattered all across the lanes by passing cars. As I slowed down and weaved around it, I saw one of the items was actually a teddy bear, dirty and mangled from being run over countless times, hair matted with grit and mud, one eye missing. Once, I went to use the bathroom at a gas station, and someone had put a teddy bear sticker on the bathroom mirror over the sink. I think it was a Grateful Dead sticker, but still, teddy bears. I just started noticing them everywhere I went, but I attributed this to the frequency bias phenomenon. Until one Wednesday night, again, I was awakened by the sound of my doorbell ringing shortly after 3 a.m. I wasn't sure if I had dreamed it or not, but I woke with my heart pounding. I sat up and listened for a few minutes for something, anything, but I heard nothing. After a while I got up out of bed and checked outside my bedroom window. Nothing. I went to the front door peephole and nothing. I don't know what made me do it, tiredness or curiosity, I don't know, but I opened the front door to peek onto my front porch. My front gate was shut securely. I looked down at the ground next to the front door, and what I saw made me feel like all the breath was sucked out of me. A giant, tan-colored teddy bear sat up against the wall right next to my front door, staring straight ahead. I could see that it was not a new bear, but it looked old and worn. A red bow was tied around its neck. This thing probably came up to my waist. It was so big. I never knew a stuffed animal could look so... sinister. I quickly snapped out of it and scanned the rest of the porch and sidewalk beyond. I saw nothing and no one. I slammed the door and locked it, trying to figure out what to do next. Call the police? And say what? There's a teddy bear threatening me? It would sound ridiculous. I quickly tried to think of who would possibly leave this on my doorstep. I came up empty. My husband was 200 miles away. I called him hysterical, and he confirmed that he had nothing to do with it. No one I knew would do this. I did not know what to do, so I decided to just wait it out until morning. 
Of course, I did not sleep the rest of that night. In the morning, I had to use my front door to leave for work. I dreaded opening it and seeing that thing sitting there with its beady eyes. In the light, I could see that it was definitely not some gift someone left for me. There was no card or note, no indication of why it was left. It was tattered with dirt and dried grass in the fur and some kind of red stains here and there. Stuffing spilled from the seams and places. I didn't want to leave it there, but I definitely didn't want to touch it either. I decided just to go to work and deal with it later. My co-workers convinced me it was most likely a random prank by neighborhood kids. By the time I got home, the sun was shining brightly and I had built up the nerve to get rid of it. I put on some rubber gloves and took it to the dumpster, never to be seen again. Fast forward to December 23rd. After work, I stopped by the grocery store to pick up a few last minute items we need for our Christmas celebrations before I leave town. In typical fashion, I decide that I don't need a cart to carry my stuff to the car, despite having a few larger items like packs of paper towels. Upon getting to my car and clicking the remote door locks, I realized I could not open the hatchback door with my hands full. A man who was walking nearby saw me struggling. He offered to help, but I declined, because I'm super independent, and that's what I do. He insisted, and as he walked over to me, I noticed that he looked a little rough around the edges. Dirty work clothes, messy hair, flannel overshirt, work-type boots. I recall him having very clear blue eyes that looked a little too deep into my soul. I wasn't comfortable accepting his help, but before I knew it, he was reaching for my back door handle and pulling it open. The parking lot wasn't exactly empty, so even though I was uncomfortable, I didn't feel like I was in immediate danger. I thanked him and tossed my stuff in the hatchback and slammed it shut. He still stood there, so I said Merry Christmas, have a good night, and started to step to the driver's side door. He smiled at me and said, Merry Christmas to you too, and held his hand out to me. I did not want to shake his hand, but not wanting to be rude, I looked down at it. He was giving me a tiny Christmas teddy bear with a Santa hat. I was dumbfounded. I did not want to take it, did not know him, and did not know what to say. So many thoughts went through my mind at that moment. Was he responsible for the bear on my porch? Was he following me? Was I just being crazy? He was just smiling at me, like he knew. Again, not wanting to be rude, but thoroughly freaked out, I searched for the right response. Oh, no thanks, was all I said. I don't have any kids. I turned and got in my car and pulled out, watching him in my rear view, just watching me drive away with an angry look on his face. Thankfully, I wasn't far from home, and I got there in record time. My paranoia was at an all-time high for the next few weeks, but I didn't see any more teddy bears for a while, and eventually, I stopped obsessing about it. However, I still get creeped out when I do come across one from time to time. I will never see them as harmless children's toys again. This happened when I was nine or so. Who can remember exact years? It wasn't the first or last time I've seen weird stuff, but now, the scene that I remember perfectly. It was early in the morning, maybe late spring or early summer. Sunlight filled the room from my bedside window, but it still had the grayish, almost misty quality to it. I had just woken up, maybe a bit earlier than normal, but it wasn't like I was jolted awake by the sound of an axe murderer or anything. No. At first there was really nothing to see. The room was basically empty. My bed beside the window facing the open door, revealing the hallway and my parents' room on the other side. 
Not much more to see there. Everyone was already out of the house. I was just lying there, wondering if I should get up or try to get back to sleep, when something lurched into the doorframe. Darker than the shadowed hall, it was about five feet tall and seemed to writhe like a bundle of stubby tendrils, each trying to fly off in different directions. Confusion was followed a split second later by icy dread as the thing gave another lurch. It was not floating, but walking. A person's head, to be clearer. A really happy person, by the looks of it, but not like any I'd ever seen. In fact, everything about it contradicted. Its general shape resembled a man with an old-style, wide-brimmed hat, but its outline was jagged like a poorly cut-out paper doll. The random edges sprouting from it were the tendrils I had been seeing, but they seemed razor-sharp to my eyes. Were those fingers or claws? Was it solid or mist? Was it even there? I quickly realized, dark and unsubstantial as it was, it had to be a shadow. The comfort of this thought was dashed instantly when I realized that something must be casting the shadow, and then again when it finally lurched in front of my parents' room. Because you see, it did not fall from the wall to lie on the floor, and what passed for its feet were clearly visible. It was not some intruder's shadow, small blessing though that was. Whatever this thing was, it was walking upright inside the hallway pressure built in my skull as I tried to comprehend what I was seeing. It wasn't just its dark color or the vaguely translucent quality it had that led me to think it was a shadow. This thing was unmistakably flat, yet there it was, skulking around in all three dimensions in complete defiance of logical possibility. There was also the fact that, while it seemed to be grinning, it had no mouth or eyes merely holes imitating those features. I guessed it would continue to the end of the hall, near my older sister's room, but then it did the single worst thing it had done to that point. It turned. Slowly, with the same lurching quality, its head and neck began to swivel. I might have expected to hear stiff cracking noises if it were making any sound at all. In fact, everything seemed strangely muffled ever since it showed up. Gradually at first, then all of a sudden, it was glaring right at me. Its head flickered in and out, apparently depending on the exact angle I viewed it from. I was not exaggerating when I said it was flat. I was also not hopeful enough to believe it couldn't see me. I wanted to hide, or maybe stand and try running past when it came inside, but I literally could not move. It wasn't that I was indecisive, I was willing myself forward, but the thoughts just never seemed to reach my limbs. It took a step forward. The spell was broken, and by this point, I was so desperate I threw the covers over my head. Maybe that's the childlike logic of, the blanket will protect me from the monsters, but I honestly don't know that I expected it to do anything other than shield me from the sight of the impending end. It's really surreal to be that age and think that you're probably about to die violently. I imagined it reaching me any second and wondered what it would be like. A cold, tearing stab, like being impaled by a knife, or maybe my flesh would sear away at its smoky touch. But nothing happened. For who knows how long I shivered in my makeshift fort wondering if it was really gone or just standing there waiting for me to look, perhaps with its horrible excuse for a face, hovering an inch from mine. Maybe I wouldn't even know at first, until it shifted position, materializing from nowhere. Either way, this clearly wasn't going to end until I did something, so I slowly lowered the blankets to look out at an ordinary room. The dread was lessened, the chirping birds returning to their normal volume. I climbed out of bed, fidgeting this way and that, constantly looking over my shoulder to make sure it wasn't hiding somewhere with its unnatural lack of depth. Creeping to the door, I took a deep breath and stuck my head out, 
looking to my sister's room, the main house, and back as quickly as I could. Nothing. Her door was shut, but I wasn't sure that would stop whatever this was. I also slightly preferred running headlong into it than it getting the drop on me again. So I peeked inside. Still nothing. What followed was more of the same. I would look all over the house and the outside yard, expecting it around every corner, under every piece of furniture, or maybe to just burst from beneath my feet. But it never came. I suppose I could have searched the forest, but I couldn't decide whether that was paranoia or tempting fate at that point. Years passed, and I still did not encounter it, though I no longer felt comfortable being in my room with the door open. I'm sure you have a lot of lingering questions. So did I, but they were never answered. It's not like I could call the thing back, or would, even if I could. You may also have suggestions. Maybe it was a ghost, or a demon from another dimension. Maybe sleep paralysis. You may feel free to offer your suggestions, but no offense. I hope I never find out. This story is a compilation of certain events that happened in a house that I lived in for 10 years, along with my younger brother, my mother, and father. My brother and I were born seven years apart from each other, me being the oldest. For the purpose of this story, I will call him G. When I was nine and G was two, my dad had traveled to another country for work where he would stay for a year. So at home, it was just me, G, and mom. We would often sleep in my mom's room with her, as she never liked sleeping alone, being the scaredy cat that she is. Plus, I would get to watch a lot of TV, since it was always on. Mom thought the light was comforting, opposed to the dark room, where she would always get too creeped out to be able to fall asleep. In a time when Netflix was not a thing, and even internet was barely a thing, we would have to plan watching movies on the time that aired on TV, so this particular night, around 9 p.m., we gathered in my mom's room to watch a movie. Now keep in mind that my brother is two, and at this point, he is still getting the hang of crawling. The bed is made, and we're about to get under the covers when my mom and I noticed something missing. Potato chips and Doritos. How can you have a movie night without those? So we decided to sprint to the kitchen. Now... For a little context, it might be relevant to describe a little of the layout of the house, which by any means was a big one. The house had about 30 feet in width and almost 200 feet in length, so it was a fairly narrow but long house. The house itself was surrounded by walls, and even though it was about 10 feet above the street level, the houses surrounding it were even taller. Once you went up the stairs and opened the front door, you would arrive in the living room, which was also the dining room, facing a wall with two doors, one in the far right corner and one in the far left corner. The one on the right was the outside corridor, which led you past all the room's windows. Two windows on the corridor, and to get to the third window, you had to go all the way to the end and turn left, and that was my parents' room window. The door to the left was the inside corridor. Once inside it, there were three doors on the right, my room, my brother's room, and the bathroom. And the fourth door was at the end of the corridor, and facing the corridor itself, my mom's room. The inside corridor directly faced the kitchen's entrance. It was a straight line from my mom's room to the kitchen. Back to the story. Craving the snacks, my mom and I ran to the kitchen leaving my brother laying in the middle of the bed. Knowing exactly where the snacks were, and in a full-out sprint, we accomplished this mission in 30 seconds max. But when we got back to the room, confusion quickly struck us hard. My brother was still where we left him, not having moved an inch, but he is now laughing for no apparent reason. And it would have been cute if not for the bed covers now that not only had been undone, but they were also folded at the foot of the bed. Confused, Mom and I looked at each other and decided that the best option was to believe that it was already like that, 
and we just didn't notice. After checking under the bed and inside the closet, just for good measure, we locked the door, enjoyed a good movie, and went to sleep with the TV on. Nothing else happened that night. Fast forward four years. I am now 13. Dad's back home, and we are all gathered in my parents' room, just waiting on my mom to put on her earrings as we are about to leave for an amusement park. But when suddenly, we are startled by this loud banging and an awful screeching sound coming from just outside the kitchen in a little area that is considered external but still inside the house. We all go to investigate as it's around 9 a.m. Blazing hot sun and it just didn't feel ominous and also dad was home so there was a great sense of safety. Once we opened the kitchen door that led to the outside area, we were met by an out of control washing machine. The banging that we heard was the washing machine working and the screeching was it dragging itself across the floor as it was violently shaking. It just wasn't working as it usually did, obviously. My dad chuckled and asked my mom if she forgot that she programmed it. Mom looked kind of spooked and said that she didn't. My dad was skeptical and went to shut it off. Believing it was the timer, he turned the button as to click it in place. And what do you know? It worked. It all came to a stop. Everyone laughed for being so jumpy and quick to jump to supernatural conclusions. And my dad with that I'm the man look on his face now. Well, that lasted about 10 seconds. As we were about to go back in the house, the machine starts again. But this time, it's shaking and banging so hard that it's literally jumping around. My dad immediately went for the timer button again, but nothing happened. He went for the off button. Nothing. He opened the lid, as it usually stops spinning once it's opened. No luck. It only came to a stop once my mom unplugged it, with me and my dad trying to hold it in place. Not only did we not laugh this time, but we stood there actually waiting for it to turn back on, even though it had no power source. After about a minute or so of silence and lots of staring towards the machine, we came out of what felt like a trance and went on our trip. Three more years go by, and I am now 16. G is 9. It's probably around 11 a.m. when my mom asks us if we want to go to the supermarket with her. G says he's good and I make his answer my own, as I am more interested in the computer in front of me. The supermarket is about eight houses down the block, so if my mom needed help bringing the groceries back, she only needed to call me and I would sprint there to help, as it usually was. Mom would say she was just going to grab some bread and she would end up buying enough stuff for 10 families. So I'm browsing the internet listening to my brother playing his PS2 in his room and getting angry as he is clearly having a hard time with whatever level he's on. All the doors are opened, so every sound is pretty clear. And there it was. Someone's at the gate. Since you can hear someone messing with the padlock, I presumed it was my mom back from the supermarket. And my brother must have heard her too, because he paused his game and I saw him sprint past my door. A little annoyed, I knew that I had to go help with whatever groceries mom was bringing in. So I get up and make my way to the front door. When I opened it, my brother had already beaten me to it. But something was off. And that's when this dreadful feeling hit me. A chill rising through my spine. My mom was still trying to unlock the padlock. But my brother, he was on the other side of the gate with my mother, locked outside. Had he went out to meet her and locked the gate behind him? I thought. So I asked. When did G leave the house? And the answer I got made my head spin. My mom said that he changed his mind the last second as she was leaving, and he had been with her this whole time. I lived in that house for 10 years, and throughout that time, it was normal to hear my name being called. The sensation of not being alone in the room, and that hallway once the light was turned off. You could not see the light getting dimmer towards the room at the end but the darkness coming out of that room and engulfing the light. And it always, always felt like there was someone staring back at you. 
I don't know why, but even after I saw what seemed like a kid running in that house, the image that was built in my head of whatever presence was there was that of a woman with long black hair, dressed in white. I really don't know why. Maybe I associated it with some movie I saw, some story I heard. But every time I looked down that hall, I always pictured that it was a woman staring back at me. This brings me to my last event. I am now 26, living in another country. After a normal day, I'm ready to go to bed, put on some cooking show on the TV, set the sleep timer, and drift off. When I awake, I have this pit in my stomach, that eerie feeling that something is just not right. The only light in the room is coming from the TV. I feel so drowsy, and I can't seem to move at all. So I scan the room with my eyes, just to find my parents sleeping on a bed next to me. Wait, this isn't my room. I'm back in that room, back in the house we left years ago. And as I asked myself why, that's when I noticed the woman standing by the door. She had black hair covering most of her face. She was wearing what seemed to be a white nightgown. Even though I could barely see her eyes, I knew she was staring at me. Unable to move and feeling like I had been drugged, my eyes turned to my parents still asleep, and I noticed that the woman's attention also turned towards them. But now, I could feel anger coming from her towards them. In that moment, I thought I would cry. I would tremble. I would lose my voice. That thought was quickly extinguished as pure, thick rage started pouring out of me. The woman seemed surprised that I started cursing at her as I was unable to talk a second ago. Even more, when I started to lift myself up on two feet. As I charged her, still groggy, I remember thinking to myself in a rageful manner, Sleep paralysis. Right. I am the only one allowed in my head. She blocks the door, which is opened, with her body, and I push her to the side. As soon as we come in contact with each other, for a second, the rage instantly disappears. Every other feeling disappears except for one, an endless dark ocean of loneliness. The woman hits the wall, and I run towards the end of the corridor. When I open the door, I wake up in my room. The TV is off, daylight pouring in the room through the thin curtains. I am not one to have such vivid dreams. So this one got me thinking and reflecting for weeks now. This happened when I was 14 and my friend David was 15. We had sleepovers all the time and tonight was no different. His parents weren't home so we were being as loud as we wanted in the den, playing video games and having music playing loudly while eating an unhealthy amount of junk food. I'll skip most of the details in order to keep this story on the shorter side. The music and video games continued until around 4 in the morning. That's when we began to settle down. David had the idea of taking a walk around the neighborhood to help calm us down, and I agreed. We returned about 10 minutes later, David's basement is kind of weird. I'll try to explain it here. His house has a bit of a hill in his front yard, so half the basement was above ground, which was where the den we hung out in was, and the other half was a room with a TV and couches, which is where we were going to sleep. David turned on a movie and threw me in a blanket. I got comfortable on the couch closest to the basement staircase, and he slept on the couch furthest from them across from me. I didn't watch the movie for long before falling asleep. I woke up with a jolt. David was crouched next to me, shaking my shoulder. He told me to be quiet and listen upstairs. It couldn't have been more than an hour after we fell asleep, since it was still completely dark outside and the movie was still playing, although muted now. I was still in that half-asleep state, so I had to strain my hearing to notice what he was talking about. It sounded like someone was rummaging through a drawer, 
following by two cracks of pressure on the upstairs floorboards. I think someone is up there, David whispered. I was now fully awake, and I sat up. I thought it could have been his cats running around upstairs, and that he was overreacting. The next thing that happened is hands down the most terrifying thing that I have ever witnessed. Two coughs from upstairs triggered a fight or flight response in both of us. Footsteps began to approach the basement staircase. David looked absolutely petrified. I scrambled off the couch, frantically searching for my phone on the floor. David rushed over to the TV to turn it off, and we very quietly made a break for the den door across the basement. We passed the basement staircase, but I didn't even look to see if anyone was there. David swung the old door open, and we sprinted across the street to hide in the neighbor's bushes. David called the police while I watched the windows in the front of his house. Despite the darkness, the scant moonlight provided just enough for me to notice a tall silhouette moving in the huge living room window. David told this to the dispatcher, and they said police were en route. It felt like we were waiting for hours before the sound of police sirens wailing pierced the night. A pair of squad cars barreled down the cul-de-sac and pulled up in front of David's house. We ran over to the officers and told them everything. Two officers went inside to search the house. The third officer searched the yard and surrounding areas, while the fourth officer stayed with us. He asked us questions you would expect, like did we see the person? How did we know that someone was inside? Did we know if anything was taken? Stuff like that. We knew very little, just that someone was inside the house. After about five minutes, I could hear an officer shout, followed by footsteps running into the woods behind David's backyard. The officer talking to us rushed over to his open backyard gate. The man who broke in was trying to escape into the woods, but was caught when the officer in the back shined his light through there. He was cuffed and arrested. When the man was being walked back to the squad car, we noticed how massive he was, like 6, 7, and 300 pounds. The officers inside searched every nook and cranny of the house and confirmed nobody else was inside. The man didn't steal anything either, and that still makes me wonder what his motives were. Needless to say, we didn't get any sleep for the rest of the night. We were just too scared, jumping at every noise and patrolling the house to make sure nobody else broke in. That is the story of when someone broke into my friend David's house early in the morning while I was sleeping over. It is the most terrifying thing I have ever gone through. On one night, I decided to go for a walk. It was around 9 p.m., and it was a nice night. Mind you, that I was just an 18-year-old female on the petite side, but my town was quite safe and small. My mistake. As I was walking and listening to music, I realized that I was thirsty and a little store was just around the block. I quickly made my way to the store, but it was closed, and unfortunately, there were no other stores closer but I tried my luck and called out to the owner. Usually the store would close around midnight, and I found it very strange for it to be closed at this time. After calling out a few more times, I decided to just turn around and walk back home, seeing that no one answered, and all the lights were off outside. Just as I turned around to walk away, I heard a door open behind me, and I turned around with the hopes to be able to buy some water. The porch light had been turned on at the store, and I could make out a figure by the now half-opened door. At first I was happy and rushed to the store, but my happiness soon turned to a fearful butterfly in my stomach as I saw the man looking back at me through the door with a wild look in his eyes and a shiny knife in his hand. I slowly backed away with my eyes fixated on the knife. He cleared his throat and said something along the lines of, Sorry. I was busy in the kitchen. As soon as he spoke, I calmed down and thought it was okay, and so I gave him money for the water. He took a minute before reappearing with my water, 
still clutching the knife in his hand and the wild look in his eyes. I brushed it off again and walked back home. I turned my music louder to stop thinking about the weird encounter. A couple of minutes into walking, I could feel someone watching me from the back, and so I turned around. No one. I started to jog so that I could reach my house faster. I stopped as I was tired and caught my breath. As I opened my water bottle, I tugged on my earphones, and just as they fell to the ground, I heard running behind me, and just as I turned to look, about ten feet from me I could make out the shiny knife and the man from the store. As tired as I was, I ran. I ran as fast as I could. I could feel him closing on me, but he must have tripped because I heard a loud crash on the ground right behind me. I made it home safely, and my parents called the police. A few days later, the police informed my parents that the store owner was arrested. He was involved with murdering and the selling of human organs and human trafficking. They found freezers packed with human organs that he had harvested from his previous victims. A few years ago, I was a young single mom living with my toddler son in an apartment complex at the edge of town. I was working a crappy full-time office job to pay the bills and get us back on our feet after divorcing my son's father. This is a small northeastern town where little to nothing ever happens, but when something does, it is big news. That is why everyone was buzzing when I walked into work one day and I asked what was going on. My co-workers informed me that someone had managed to escape from the psych ward at our local hospital and the authorities could not find him. I would have just shrugged this off, considering that does not really happen outside of a horror movie, but my co-worker showed me a news article with a photo of someone that looked very familiar. I recognized the guy that had escaped, as he and I had gone to high school together several years prior. We were not friends, not even acquaintances really, but I remembered him as being an athletic, popular guy from a wealthy family with lots of friends. I skimmed through the article that explained that he had been involuntarily committed and had somehow managed to leave the hospital. He had been gone for a few hours before someone raised the alarm and the authorities were asking the public to keep an eye out, but be careful, as they did not know of his mental state. I shared with my coworkers that I knew the guy, told them I remembered him as being a normal, happy kid, but of course, things can change over the years. One of my coworkers piped up and said, Hey, they think he was spotted heading towards Creek Road. Isn't that by your house? This gave me a pause. That was by my house, but honestly, did not really bother me much. Surely, he would have kept going to avoid detection, as I lived less than a mile from the hospital. I shrugged it off, went to work, and forgot about it for the next few days. I went into work and heard my coworkers discussing the escaped patient again. They caught me up on the story, letting me know evidence was found that he had broken into the house of someone he vaguely knew, slept in their attic for a day or two, and then left. He was spotted leaving the property, but was long gone by the time the police arrived. I went to my desk and googled his name, immediately pulling up several news articles. What really caught my attention was not that my coworkers had told the truth, which they had, but that the house he broke into was right next to mine, two streets away from my apartment complex. I mentioned this quietly to my coworkers, one of which replied, Whoa, wouldn't it be weird if he broke into your apartment to hide? He laughed and went back to work. I laughed too, because that was absurd. He certainly would not remember me, and would not know where I lived, but the thought did spook me just a little bit. Anything was possible, right? That night I returned home with my son. We had dinner, I gave him a bath, and put him to bed, as was our regular routine. I was sitting on the couch in the living room watching television. 
when I heard a thump. I assumed it was one of my neighbors shutting a door or something, so I ignored it and went back to my show. A few minutes later, I heard another thump. Now the noise caught my attention. Being a paranoid young mom, I went immediately upstairs to check on my son. As I climbed the stairs to our second floor, my coworker's comment popped into my head. Could someone be in my apartment? No. That is insane. I shook off the idea and went into my son's room to see him sleeping soundly in his crib. Seeing he was safe, I adjusted his blankets and headed back down to the couch. I was just being jumpy for no reason. I needed to stop watching so many scary movies. I sat back on the couch, turned my show back on, and tried to relax. It was then that I saw a shadow pass over the living room. Our apartment was two floors, more like a townhouse I suppose, with a kitchen, dining room, and living room on the bottom floor, with two bedrooms and a bathroom on the second floor. The living room was at the back of the apartment and had a set of glass doors leading out to a large grassy area that spanned the length of the complex and was sandwiched between the back of our building and the back of the building across from us. It served as a backyard to all the residents. Anyway, I had some long sheer white curtains covering the glass because it freaked me out at night to have them uncovered. I turned my head and once again saw a dark shadow glide across the window, visible through the sheer curtains. The logical part of my brain said that it was just someone walking their dog back there, but then remembered the entire complex had a no pets policy. This, coupled with the realization that I had literally never seen anyone walking out there in the year that I had lived there, made my heartbeat pick up a bit. I had my coworkers comment in the back of my head, as I watched the shadow pass by the doors again, slowly, as if it were pacing. I was frozen in place, completely unprepared for this event, and thinking that if a deranged guy was able to escape a secure hospital unit, certainly it was possible for him to randomly choose to break into my apartment out of the 20 that were available in the complex. The shadow passed once again, then came to a stop outside the door. I stopped breathing, gripping the blanket on my lap with white knuckles. Just as I was thinking I had officially lost it and had to be hallucinating this event, the door handle rattled. At that moment, my son began to cry upstairs. The rattling immediately stopped and the shadow disappeared. I walked over and pulled the curtains apart, looking from side to side across the expanse of dark grass. Nothing. I let out a breath I did not know I was holding, pulled the curtains shut, and hurried up the stairs to attend to my son. I have no idea who was outside my apartment that night. I do not know if it was the guy who had escaped the hospital, or some other run-of-the-mill psycho, but I could not get my coworker's comment out of my head. I put an extra lock on the glass doors, got opaque curtains, and after a while, I was comfortable sitting in my living room at night again. I no longer live in that apartment, or even that town. Nor do I have that office job anymore. But as for the guy who managed to sneak out of the hospital, he was eventually apprehended in a town two hours from here, and was readmitted to the hospital under 24-7 supervision. I have no idea where he is now. For a little context, I'm a guy, and I live in a small town in Nevada. Now this town can get a little boring sometimes, especially if you're not into the whole gambling nightlife thing. However, there are a couple of things I enjoy doing, like off-roading in my ATV, or going for long hikes with my dog's buddy and Snoopy. Now right behind my house is a desert that stretches out for miles and miles, which makes it super convenient for me to walk my dogs because I don't have to worry about traffic or other civilians. I can just let them run loose and enjoy the open space. Now there is also two large mountains a couple of miles from my house that I like to hike up. These mountains are only separated by less than half a mile. 
Now during the winter, these mountains can be pretty rough. I labeled these mountains A and B. Mountain A was easier to hike because of the clear trail leading up to it, and Mountain B is more rocky and steep. Now the day before I went for this particular hike, the weather was horrendous. Almost everything was snowed in, and the wind was powerful enough to knock a semi-truck over. But by the morning, a lot of it had cleared, and the wind had settled down. Not the perfect weather, but I still decided to go for my hike. My dad didn't think it was a good idea to go alone, so he and my aunt had joined in. Instead of taking my usual route to Mountain A, my aunt wanted to hike up Mountain B because the sun was hitting that side. I was hesitant at first because of the steepness of the mountain, but finally agreed and we were on our way. The desert ground was pretty muddy and the bushes were covered in snow. Light snowflakes were hitting our face and the sky was finally starting to clear up. As we approached Mountain B, we noticed tire tracks on the snowy trail that looked like they had been there for more than a day. We thought it was pretty strange because who would be out here driving in this weather? But we brushed it off. Now one thing that intimidated me about this mountain were the sharp rocks on the trail that we had to cross. These rocks look even more intimidating, covered in ice and snow. Luckily, we carefully crossed these rocks and made it to the top of the mountain. Exhausted, but we were just happy we achieved our goal. The top of the mountain did not look as how I'd expected it would look. There were food wrappers, beer bottles, and dead bushes everywhere. I still enjoyed the view, and I started snapping pics of the dogs and the scenery with the town in the background. However, I noticed both of my dogs examining and sniffing around a dead bush. I called them over, but they wouldn't listen. So I went to grab them, and that's when I noticed of what looked like burnt pieces of cardboard scattered around the dirt and some on the bush. I thought it was trash at first. When I picked up and examined one of the burnt pieces, I noticed it was only a piece of what looked like to be a photograph, like one of those really old face portraits with no color. I could make out an eye in the piece I picked up. Now what was really strange was that this eye looked familiar, like I swear I had seen it before. It sort of creeped me out. My dad and my aunt thought it was a little weird, but did not think much of it, and they were ready to head back home. We got about three minutes down the mountain, but something made me want to go back and examine the pieces again. My dad and aunt agreed. We all grabbed the pieces and struggled to match them together because of how burnt and damaged they were. It was sort of like solving a puzzle. Now, with all the pieces assembled together, this made out about an 18 by 20 photograph, so this was a pretty big photograph. I matched the last two pieces of the portrait and stepped back to examine the photo. When I did, I was horrified. It was a photo of my deceased grandfather. I was speechless. I mean, who would do something like this? It was like living out that scene in a horror movie where all the viewers yell to run. I did not know what to think. Then my mind started racing. We had this exact photo in our house, and I thought it was the only one that existed. So seeing this photograph here, I thought someone had broken into our house and stole the picture and was trying to send us a message. I thought my family back home were in danger, or someone was trying to play a sick joke on us. We picked up all the pieces and got out of there. I tried to call my mom as we scurried down the mountain, but my phone had no signal. My dad and aunt weren't as freaked out as me, but were still pretty spooked. We had no energy to run, so we jogged back home as the wind was starting to pick up again, and the sun was slowly fading away. The only thing on my mind was making sure my family was okay. I kept looking behind me just because I was so freaked out at the situation. Thankfully, nothing happened to us, and we made it home, and I saw my mom in the kitchen and my brother playing video games. I was relieved and gave my mom a big hug. She was confused as to why I was hugging her. That's when I finally explained the situation. I assembled all the pieces of the photograph for her, and she was terrified. I mean, this was her father. She was as freaked out as me. I went to her room because I knew that's where she kept the photograph of my grandpa. 
and it was still hanging on the walls, undamaged. So this puzzled me and my mom even more, because she thought there was only one of these photographs in existence, too. My grandpa had lived all his life in California, and was tragically killed in front of his home by gang members. My mom was really small when he was killed. The guys who did it were after my mom's older brothers also, so my family left town and settled here in Nevada. So the only explanation that we had was that these guys had found out where we lived and were trying to send us a message with the destroyed photograph of my grandpa. That whole month we slept with one eye open and were very cautious of the things we did throughout the day. I no longer hiked up those mountains. We would rarely come outside. I just wanted an answer as to who did this and what their intentions were. My mom had wanted to tell my grandma about the situation, but did not want to scare her. But eventually, she explained everything to her, and found out that my grandma had owned a copy of that same photograph too. But what my grandma told my mom about the photo shocked her. My grandma said that she was responsible for the photo being out there. She said that on the night before we took that walk, she told one of my uncles to take the photo and destroy it because she felt a strange presence with the photo being in the house. She said anytime she would look at the photo, she would catch the eyes staring back at her, no matter where in the room she was. That's why when I saw that eye from the picture out in the desert, it creeped me out because I knew I had seen those eyes before. One thing I still sort of question is how my uncle drove all the way up that mountain in that weather in the pitch black. We told him the story and he verified it. He claimed that he and his brother went out drinking and drove all the way up the mountain in the dark and there they tried to get rid of the photo. He said he tried burning it but the wind was really strong so he resorted to just tearing it apart with his hands. He said it was really tough getting up the mountain but had wanted to get the photograph as far away from my grandma as he could. One thing that's still strange to me is how we ended up finding the pieces of the photo, like it was fate. I mean, I never would have climbed this mountain if it wasn't for my aunt. It's almost like the photo had wanted to remain in the family. Like I said, the wind was really strong the night before, and it snowed a lot, yet the pieces didn't fly away they weren't covered in snow. They were just laying there, all close to each other. It's weird. It's like the photo had wanted to remain together in one piece. On this particular occurrence, I was home by myself in high school or late junior high and I was in the living room at around 6 p.m. I have ADD, so I was reading and had the TV on and had both of our dogs in the living room with me. I made a habit of using all these different stimuli and shutting all the doors inside the house when I'm home alone because it eases my anxiety. The kitchen in my house is behind the living room and when you're sitting on the couch facing our TV, you have to turn all the way around to see only the entrance to the kitchen as well as the back door. You can't see inside of the kitchen from the living room hardly at all. So I was sitting and reading, and all of a sudden, I heard creaking from the floorboards in our kitchen, which always happens when someone is walking or moving around in the kitchen. I couldn't hear any footfalls, but it unmistakably was the sound of someone walking on the creaky, water-warped wood floors. Then, a cabinet door slammed. My dad always slams cabinet doors, so I thought maybe he had come home from work early, and I just didn't know. So without looking up from my book, I called out. Dad, when did you get home? No one answered. A few seconds later, a couple more cabinet doors slammed, so I turned around on the couch to see the entrance to the kitchen and called out for my dad, again. No answer. Then, I hear repeated slamming of the cabinet doors over and over, extremely loud. They start to slam faster and faster, louder and louder. My pulse picked up, and I could feel my heart beating in my ears. Suddenly the dogs stand up in the living room and face the kitchen, 
and start barking. I can see the hair along their spines raise up, and despite the menacing nature of their growls, they looked scared. I started to panic, and I quickly moved to the carpet to sit behind them in the living room, hoping they would protect me, I guess. I was facing the kitchen, my arms wrapped around both of my dog's growling bodies. I was incredibly scared, and my heart was beating out of my chest. All of a sudden, the insanely loud slamming stops. For a while, all I can hear is the blood rushing in my ears and my own breathing. Then, I hear that same familiar creaking coming from the kitchen. The sound of something shifting its weight or walking in the kitchen. I was paralyzed with fear, unblinkingly staring as the source of the sound came closer and closer to exiting the kitchen and entering my view. As the situation became quieter and more tense, the dogs suddenly stopped growling and started whimpering. They were shaking violently and their hair was raised all over. At this point, I'm essentially having a heart attack and preparing myself for the absolute worst. Then, suddenly, my mom walks into the house through the door closest to the kitchen, arriving home from the grocery store. Everything stops. The creaking, the dogs, everything. My dogs started wagging their tails and went to greet my mom. I stayed sitting on the carpet in the living room, bewildered and adrenaline still coursing through my veins. Just to explain the situation and demonstrate that I am not making something out of nothing, it could not have been sounds my mom made from coming into the house. The sounds were nothing like the dull, rapid thumps that came from a person walking along our back porch to enter the house. These sounds could only have come from the kitchen, specifically the floors and the cabinets. I knew these sounds well as I grew up in this house. I tried to tell my mom what happened right before she got home, but she didn't really believe me. I haven't told many people. No one has ever really believed this story. However, I can promise you that I know the house I grew up in very well. I can also promise that the fear and panic that not only myself but my dogs felt were very, very real. This occurred when my roommates and I were working on our bachelor's degree in a prominent university in West Bengal, India. We would live in the university boarding houses for students, or hostels as we call them here. The hostel buildings were divided into boys and girls blocks, and we lived in the girls block. After our semester final exams ended in December 2016, before we left for our homes for the holidays, we decided to stay back for the huge fair that would take place in the town near our university. This fair would attract people from all over the country and abroad, with shops full of traditional arts and crafts and massive thrift stores. This fair would go on for six to eight days at a stretch, starting from the 22nd of December every year. So the tiny college town we lived in would be full of all kinds of people. Our university would take extra precautions against strange people entering the university campus. We would have extra barricades around the girls' hostels, and so on. But people would always roam around the campus, enjoying its beauty, despite the rules. So my roommate stayed back for two days before she left for home and enjoyed the fair with me. We did a lot of shopping for ourselves and our families, and two days later, she left. I, on the other hand, did not leave, as the holidays were only for ten days, and I instead wanted to stay back and study in the university library with not as many students around. One day, on my way back from the library at around 7 p.m., I noticed that many tourists were roaming around the campus even after it got dark. But I was aware of the tourist situation at the time, so I didn't really care. Now, the hostel block had a big gate with four three-story buildings situated inside it in a square format, and there was only one way in and out, and female guards would always be standing near the gate as there were tight rules for intruders especially men. Our rooms were situated the farthest from the entrance. We stayed on the first floor and had windows facing outward onto a back street inside the campus with lots of trees everywhere. 
So I went to my room, got cleaned up, and started cooking dinner. While doing so, I started hearing some rustling sound from the window. I thought perhaps it was the sound of birds in the trees. It was already dark out at that time of winter, and I couldn't make out anything outside. Soon, I started hearing the noise more and more. Still, I assumed it was the sound of people walking the road behind our room, as there were more visitors at that time. As my food was cooking, I sat on my bed and started reading a book. The bed was right beside a window. Suddenly, I hear a low thud near me next to the window. I look up, and there's a man standing right outside the window, staring in at me. Stunned with fear, I could not even shout. I sat there motionless, trying to understand if the man was even real. Just then, this intruder, who seemed to be in his early thirties, spoke in a slurring voice. Don't scream or I will be in trouble. I just want some water. Can you give me some water? I'm so thirsty. I managed to stand up and as I was on my way to dart out of the room, this man started speaking again, but a bit loud, trying to pronounce his words properly. Just some water. I am your guest. Please give me some water. I could smell a distinct, bad, alcohol stink coming from him and he looked horrible, somehow managing to keep his eyes open. By this time, the man was basically just hanging by the window panes, and thankfully, couldn't get in due to the iron barriers. He started sticking his hand in, trying to grab at anything on the bed. I had had enough, and started screaming right then and there. There weren't many people staying back in the hostel during those days, so no one came to help. I ran downstairs and ran up to the guards who were about 50 meters from our building. They frantically ran back with me to my room, and by the time we reached it, the man was nowhere to be seen. So the guards called the university security team, and they started checking the hostel perimeter, and they found the man lying flat on his back on the grass below the window he climbed. I did not leave the room to see any of it, as I was still pretty shaken up, but I was told that the man was drunk and unconscious from falling that high up, and the guards had to pick him up and take him away to the hospital. I don't know what happened to that man, if he was charged, or what, but by the next day, two male guards started walking up and down that back road behind our room. I told this story to my roommate once she got back after the holidays, and she was pretty worried that I was all alone when I went through this scary experience. She and I then decided to change our rooms, as I still had flashbacks of a hand creeping in through the window. It also made me realize how we are never really safe, despite how secure we feel in our surroundings. So this happened about 10 years ago in Manitou Springs, Colorado. I was living in a friend's trailer on her couch, and there was very limited space, and I was looking for a place of my own. I ran into this guy that lived a few trailers down from her, and he was telling me that he was looking to rent out part of his trailer. So I went over to take a look. This guy seemed really off, in a creepy sort of way, but at the time, I was really desperate to get my friend her living room couch back and get out of there, so I was willing to go pretty much anywhere. When I went over there, he told me he would rent out a small space inside of this ridiculously small trailer, or he was also willing to rent out a small cubby that he had underneath his trailer that he also showed to me. It looked like about a 10 by 10 crawl space under his trailer. That alone should have been the red flag that made me turn him down flat. But like I said, I was desperate, and that red flag was one of many to come. So I hesitantly and very reluctantly agreed to rent the small space inside and moved my stuff over that night. Almost immediately, he started going on about a curfew that I would have to abide by if I was to live there, and a bunch of other nonsense that I wasn't about to sit and listen to. So I left. When I came back, I found him sprawled out on his front porch mumbling about how he had just taken a bunch of pills and he was holding onto a half-empty bottle of booze. 
I had to step over him to get in the door as he began screaming about how I hadn't minded his warning about my new curfew. At this point, I flat out told him that if I was going to be paying him money to stay there, I would be coming and going as I pleased since I was an adult, not a child, and certainly not his child. To this, he reacted by having quite the outburst of rage, at which point I was sure that this was not going to work. He then gets up and starts flinging my stuff out onto the street, and this is all happening at like 2 a.m. So I gather what belongings are still left in his house and take them outside with me while I continue to gather what he had already thrown out and go begging my friend to let me come back into her trailer. And she let me. But that is not where this bizarre story ends. A few days later after this happened, I see a young girl at his house, and they are both getting drunk, and I didn't think much of it. But about a week after that, once I had found another place to stay, my friend that lived in that trailer park called me panicking, asking if I was okay. After I got her to calm down some and assured her that I was fine, I asked what made her even ask to begin with. She tells me that they had just pulled a human body from the little cubby under that guy's trailer that had been there for several days. She told me that the guy that lived there had been arrested for trying to rob a convenience store with a machete, and the girl's body he had stashed under his trailer had begun to smell, so the landlord called the police. The young girl that I had seen him drinking with just a few days before, her hand was found wrapped in a quilt under his trailer. All that was running through my mind as she was telling me all of this was that that would have been me had I not left when I did. I did not step foot in that trailer park again. Even going anywhere near it gave me the creeps so bad. And as badly as I felt for that young girl, I was still very thankful that I walked away from there with my life. This happened when I was 13. I lived in a duplex with my dad and brother. It was a two bedroom and I shared a room with my dad while my older brother had his own room. It was not uncommon for both of them to have plans at night while I stayed home to play video games alone. This night was no different. My dad was probably at some bar and my brother, who knows where he was. I was playing the original Resident Evil on PlayStation and at around midnight, my eyelids were getting too heavy, and I decided to go to bed. I slept with my bedroom door wide open. Now, not one time in the years that we lived in this place did my dad or brother come home by entering through the back sliding glass door. A couple times my brother didn't have his key for one reason or another, and he would knock on my bedroom window and ask me to let him in. My dad always had his key, and would always come home through the front door. On this night, I heard the back door slide open. It was an old door, and sliding it open wasn't easy. It was also very loud, so I heard it crystal clearly. I lay in bed wide-eyed, my imagination going crazy. I heard whoever it was walk through the dining room, through the kitchen, and then into the living room. They made no attempt to be quiet. After a brief silent pause, I saw someone walk by my bedroom doorway. This scared me so much as you can imagine, and my heart throbbed. Whoever was in my house walked into the bathroom right next to my bedroom and flipped the light on. The light poured into my bedroom and I was laying there, terrified, completely exposed by the light from the bathroom. Why didn't I shout out for my brother or my dad? Because like I mentioned, I knew it wasn't them and there was no one else that it could have been that would have made sense. Not a family member, not a friend. I knew it was someone that did not belong. The person then walked out of the bathroom, left the light on, and went into my brother's room and started making a ton of noise. It sounded like they were searching for something. All I did was lay there, shivering. After a few more minutes, the person walked by my bedroom again, I expected at any moment a stranger would walk into my room, but they didn't. 
I heard them making noise in the living room, walking around, huffing and puffing. Then they started walking back and forth by my bedroom repeatedly, into the bathroom and back out, over and over. At the time, I was 100% sure they were messing with me for some reason. They knew I was there, whoever they were. I heard the person making noises. By this, and by the huge figure that I saw walking back and forth, I knew that it was a man. They continued walking around each room except the one that I was in. And then suddenly, I heard them walk back through the house to the back sliding door, open it, and then leave. I lay there in bed, terrified, wondering what just happened. After a while, out of sheer exhaustion, I fell asleep. In the morning, I found that my dad and brother were both home. I have asked both of them dozens of times, and they both promise it was not them. Plus, again, why would they go through the back door and then leave again through the back door? This was 21 years ago, and I will never know who it was or why they were there. Nothing was missing either. What really makes me wonder to this day why did they never come into my bedroom? The door was wide open, and they walked by it at least 20 times. So this happened to me on Thursday, April 25th, and I still can't shake off how terrifying and strange it was. So I was home alone, getting ready for my 12 o'clock college class that morning, and I opened my blinds to let some natural light in. I glanced out my window to see a man in his mid-30s wearing a baseball cap, roaming around my property with his hands on his hips, walking with a lot of weird confidence. Our yard is kind of like a cliff, and it looks over onto our five acres of property down below. I live in the PNW, so it's a pretty scenic view. I was really confused and thought maybe it was a worker that my mom had hired for our renovations on the house, admiring the view. I'm a little bit uncomfortable at this point because the dude walks to the side of my house, out of sight. I head upstairs to see him now roaming around my front yard and my driveway, looking at things, checking out my house, etc. He still hasn't seen me at this point. I call my dad and ask him if we had hired anyone to come by the house and he says not that he knows of, and tells me that he's going to call my mom and ask her, and then call me back. I'm waiting for the cop when I notice this strange dude's car. It's a white Honda with no license plates, just parked parallel to my front door. The dude still hasn't seen me, and he's still wandering around, so I take this as an opportunity to remember that we have a security system, and I armed it, so that if he did try to break in, it would immediately alert the police. If this was some sort of professional or worker, he would have rang my doorbell or knocked at least once. He did neither. Just then, I get a call back from my dad, saying neither him or my mom hired anyone to come by today and that I need to call our local police station immediately. I went back downstairs after making sure to lock every door and window upstairs and called my city's police station. I explain to a woman on the other end what is happening, and she decides that she's not going to send an officer out, and instead gives me a number to call their emergency dispatch line and told me to talk to them. I call the number she gave me, and immediately I get an automated message saying, Thank you for calling the non-emergency hotline. Nobody is available to take your call right now. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. At this point, I'm really irritated, because 15 minutes has passed, and this weird dude is still lurking around my house while I'm home alone, and apparently, that wasn't enough to warrant an emergency to the lady I called at my local police department. I hung up and decided to call 911. After getting in touch with the 911 operator, I was asked a series of questions about his appearance before they would even alert officers near me to start heading towards my house. The whole thing seemed really weird. Nobody was in a hurry to have officers come up to my place when I was a younger girl home alone with a strange dude. I asked the officer if I could stay on the line with her 
when she finally, after what seemed like forever, alerted police to come to where I was. She agreed, and I went back upstairs to check on the weird guy, and he is now sitting in his unplated Honda, either listening to a radio show extremely loud, or on a phone call with someone through his car. It was a very prominent, loud, male voice coming from his car. Then, all of a sudden, I hear the tone you hear when someone hangs up on you, and the operator was no longer on the line. I was really confused when my thoughts were interrupted by an unrecognized phone number calling me. I assumed it was the operator calling me back, so I picked it up. Instead, I was greeted by really creepy, heavy breathing. I am not sure who it was, but it really freaked me out. I hung up immediately and dialed back 911. I had been pretty calm up to this point, but that phone call put me in panic mode. I got on the phone with another operator who already knew my situation and address before I could even explain it to her. She said the cops were on their way. 20 minutes had passed at this point. The dude is still here, in his car, and the cops aren't. Keep in mind I live in a smaller town, so there is no reason why it took the cops as long as it did to come down. Finally, this dude is leaving my driveway right as the cops pull in, and they stop him and ask him a few questions. A cop then comes to my door and hands me a sketchy looking flyer saying, It was just a landscaper. He said he had an appointment. I was really relieved and irritated that it was just a dude my mom had hired, until I realized it wasn't. I called my mom back and said, the cop said that it was just a landscaper that you hired and that he had an appointment. My mom replies with, I can assure you we never hired a landscaper. We don't even need one. In October of 2019, I went to a Halloween costume ball hosted at our local art gallery, which was organized by a Unitarian Universalist spiritual center. It was a typical party, but had a few ceremonial attributes to celebrate Samhain. I dressed up as the Red Death from the Phantom of the Opera and basically went alone, thus waiting for a friend who did eventually come to meet up with me later in the night. Before that, I have had the most bizarre experience. Bizarre, as in I was unable to imagine a clear explanation behind this certain circumstance. I still can't think of one to this day. So, after dancing to the music and sipping a couple of drinks, I was interested enough to purchase a photographic aura reading from this lady at a little booth. I sat down and she instructed me to take off my skull mask and firmly lie my palms on a flat silver machine linked to her laptop. I was then instructed to look into the camera, and after a few minutes, my image appeared on the screen with a mix of transparent colors along with various measuring charts. I was further intrigued and listened to the lady's explanations concerning chakras and the like. As I was trying to pay attention to her, something in my peripheral vision distracted me a bit I decided to look directly ahead, and to my surprise, a group of four sitting at a table were staring and smiling at me. Three men and a woman. If their expressions weren't friendly, they were incredibly creepy. They never even blinked. I was a bit weirded out, especially since I was wearing my skull mask. I didn't even think to wave back a hello, so I just ignored them and listened further to the lady's interesting lecture, helping me examine my aura. At the same time, I couldn't help but feel being stared down from the distance. I looked ahead again, and it was the same group, staring at me, smiling. They kept their gaze without signaling me to walk over, or anything. I knew I wasn't hallucinating because I blinked and the group was still there, not making a single move. To be honest, I swear, I have never met this group before. I had no idea who any of them were, so I really have no idea why they would be staring at me like they were. While not making a big deal, the lady finished up what she wanted to teach me. I paid her and just got up to go to the restroom. 
I did my best to brush off that strange experience as nothing. Afterward, my friend found me and we just chatted until he had to leave for his mother's birthday outing. Interestingly enough, I then realized that the group never approached me after my aura session. I will always wonder what that was all about. Out of stubborn curiosity, I searched through the entire venue and did not find any of them. At 19, I moved out for the first time with an old friend, Nathan. We rented a two-bedroom basement-level apartment for a year together, and at first, things were great. It was like having a long-term sleepover with your best friend, and we were able to have our own alone time in the apartment because we worked opposite schedules. I worked a retail job during the day, and Nathan worked overnights. For a month or two, we had a good thing going. He would work, and I would be home, and vice versa. We would stay up late playing video games when our schedules aligned. The first thing that I noticed that was odd was the closet in my bedroom. In the master bedroom, there was a small walk-in closet, and I noticed the carpet in the corners looked as if it had been dug out by an animal. There were also several gaps in the walls along the edges of the carpet. At first, this seemed no different, really from the general cheap apartment disarray and maintenance issues. This didn't scare me at first. I figured someone had an overexcited pup and I left it alone. It started off with little things at first. I would think that I would hear Nathan calling my name and I would respond only to realize that he had been at work for hours. Leading to our bedrooms was a long hallway that seemed to make us both uncomfortable. The hallway light would be left on as often as possible, and we would laugh it off as a childhood fear of the dark. I think we were both too skeptical to talk about how we would occasionally think that we had seen the other walk out of the hallway, only to realize we were alone. On more than one occasion, I would have a friend sleep over who would complain they were kept awake at night by the constant flickering of the hallway light. My roommates and I tried our best to be respectful of each other's schedules. If I knew he had just come home in the morning and was sleeping, I would try my best to stay quiet when heading to work. One morning, Nathan told me that while he'd been relaxing in his room after work, getting ready to sleep, he had heard footsteps in the hallway and the door to my room being shaken. At first, he thought it was just me rushing around getting ready for work, but he was concerned because I was being much louder than normal. He looked over at his alarm clock and realized that I should have been at work by this time and says he decided to check on me. He opened his door and looked down the hall towards my room. He says that he froze when he saw a dark figure standing outside my door. In that moment, he said that he rationalized it by saying he thought I was just running late for work and had gotten embarrassed at being caught and ducked into my room. He retreated back to his room and said that he hadn't heard anything else for the rest of the day. He had never heard me say anything or leave, and opted to forget about it, even when I came home later and confirmed that I had not been late that morning. As time progressed in that apartment, we were both constantly irritable and tired. It felt impossible to rest in that apartment, especially when I was alone. Nathan would sometimes chalk this up to me being nervous as a woman alone in an apartment at night. I would spend my nights huddled on the end of the couch furthest from the hallway, tucked in a blanket under the lamp. On more than one occasion, this is where I slept, as it felt more secure than walking down that hallway to my room. I am awoken one morning in my bed by the sound of someone trying to beat down my bedroom door, and ice settles in my veins. The banging on the door sounds desperate, and I can see the door shaking under the weight of the hit. Immediately I'm concerned that our apartment flooded, we have been robbed, or something has happened to Nathan. I bolt out of bed and rip open my door, and once again, I am met with sudden silence in an empty hallway. Fearful that I have misheard where the knocks were, I go down the hall to the main door and check outside, and there's no one, yet again. I sit down on the couch in the living room, 
unable to go back to sleep, even if I wanted to. When I realized Nathan had been home, I chalked it up as him sleepwalking, and he confesses later that he had had repetitive nightmares that morning, but doesn't believe that he was walking in his sleep. His room was small, and he had taken up most of the main space with a weight set that he would have to crawl over to enter and leave. I later had to reason as well that in the time it had taken me to open the door, he would have had to sprint back to his room and slam the door shut to avoid me seeing or hearing it. As weird as this was, the worst was yet to come. We had had a disagreement before Nathan went to work, and I had been laying in my bed, still a little angry, and watching videos on my phone until I could doze off. When he worked overnights, his job was close enough to our apartment that he would come home for lunch, or what they called lunch, almost every night. So when I heard the door creak open at 3 a.m., I wasn't uneasy at first. I hear the various sounds of him in the apartment, opening cabinets, and walking around. I roll over, upset, because he's being much louder than normal, and immediately I feel my heart drop into my stomach. Nathan would always turn the lights on when he came home. It was reassuring on the nights I was in my room to see the hallway lights seep through the doorframe to let me know I wasn't alone in the apartment anymore. But this night, when I rolled over, there was no reassuring light coming from underneath the closed door. It was pitch black. My heartbeat quickened immediately, and I messaged Nathan to ask if he had come home but I got no response. I strained my ears to listen, and what I hear sounds nothing like normal. There's footsteps running around the apartment and coming down the hall to my door, then running away. Doors opening and closing, and cabinets creaking. In that moment, I was so absolutely sure that we were being robbed, I began to shake. I didn't know how to deal with this, and what I had heard sounded so angry and chaotic outside my door. Tearfully, I grabbed a knife that I kept under my pillow. Because the apartment walls and door were so thin, I couldn't have called 911 quietly enough to save myself. My instinct in that moment was to fight and deal with the consequences later. I stood just behind the door, listened to the footsteps run towards me, braced myself, and when I heard them start to fade down the hall, I ripped open the door to surprise my attacker. I am met with absolutely nothing but silence and darkness. I stare down the black, empty hallway, adamant that they're hiding from me. I am frozen in place, staring down the hall, waiting to hear anything. The front door is in clear view from my position, and it's still closed. Whoever it was has to still be here. I scan the room at the end of the hall. I feel a lump in my throat as I lock my eyes on a large, dark figure peering around the corner at the end of the hall. I take off down the hall and whip around the corner, ready again to fight. But there's no one in my apartment. When I turned on all the lights, I checked. The door was shut and locked. All the windows are locked. Nathan's room is empty and there's nothing out of place. All the cabinets and drawers I'd heard being ripped open are closed. All the tables still upright. My body in this moment reacts in a way I wouldn't expect. I go from overwhelming fear to complete calm. I shove what has happened to the back of my mind, walk in my room, lock the door and go to bed, dead asleep within seconds. To cope, my brain shoved this memory to the depths, and it only resurfaced months later after I had moved out, when Nathan and I finally divulged all our experiences together. For the remainder of my time in the apartment, the tiredness and irritability continues. Even my sanctuary of the living room is compromised, as I would awake many times in the middle of the night to see a dark figure walking out of the hallway towards the couch disappearing when I would turn my head to look. Things would fall over. I would hear knocks on my bedroom door. And more and more, I was questioning my own sanity. Eventually, when I couldn't take it anymore, and things financially weren't well with the apartment, I decided to move back home. Within a month, 
I was back to feeling like myself again. We are still not entirely sure what was in that apartment, but we have some theories. I feel it important to preface our theory with this. Not too long after moving into this apartment, I had taken to practicing Wicca. I don't say this to add horror, but rather to explain what we believe happened. In my early practicing, I would fill my room with cleansing materials like quartz stones and sage to cleanse before spells and maintain an energy in my room. We suspected whatever was in our apartment had originated in my closet and that whoever was in my room before had done something sinister in there. The rips in the carpet and the gaps in the wall with small objects just out of view. We were too scared of fines we could get for destroying the closet to lift up the carpet and check what may have been underneath. It's been theorized that I had unknowingly driven whatever darkness lived in that closet out and it spent the rest of the time I lived there desperate to come back in. The longer it was kept out, the angrier it got and the more that we took it out on each other. Later when I moved out, things continued to worsen for my roommate who remained. He was constantly tired and angry and fell into a dark headspace. The spirit we think was in there was able to go back into my room when I left, and the girl who lived in my room after me said she was plagued with nightmares and had been locked out of the room on many occasions, even though the door locked from inside. She would try it, and the door would be locked. Then later she would try it again, and the door would somehow open. Nathan would send me videos of doors opening in the apartment on their own, and the TV suddenly showing black and white cable static in the middle of DVDs and YouTube videos. My roommate was able to move out of the apartment a while ago, and we have both been doing better. Slowly as time went on, we have shared a lot of our experiences that we had in that apartment with each other, and we are both glad that we came out of it okay. It made quite the believer out of my roommate as well, who remained reluctant to acknowledge it until his final few months there. Apartments are funny places. You never really know how many people have lived their lives in that exact same space. What they may have left behind or done in the room where you lay your head at night. Maybe there was something in that apartment. Something left over from whoever came before. Or maybe it can all be chopped up to late nights, bad dreams, and miscommunication. In the end, what you choose to believe is up to you. I had blocked this story from my memory until my girlfriend reminded me of it a couple days ago. I started dating my girlfriend at the end of my senior year and before we started dating I used multiple dating apps. In many of my dating app profiles, I had my Snapchat listed so that people could add me. Nothing led to anything with the dating apps. I would talk to people for a bit, and eventually the conversation would die out. When I began dating my girlfriend, I had deleted the apps but never deleted my account, meaning people would still see my profile and my Snapchat in it. I realized this after a few people would add me, but it didn't go anywhere because I would tell them I had a girlfriend. As you would imagine, the conversation would end there. But there was this one guy that added me. Let's call him Adam. And he asked me if I was available. Being straight, I was used to guys adding me. So I gave him the usual response. Sorry, I'm straight and I have a girlfriend. I expected him to leave me alone, but he didn't. At first, the messages were normal. How was your day? What did you do today? Simple stuff like that. Being the nice guy I am, I responded because I thought this guy just wanted to be friends. Then, the message progressively got more creepy. He started asking questions about my girlfriend, and not the basic questions. Questions like, is she good in bed? I simply responded with, those are personal questions and I don't feel comfortable answering them. Adam would always apologize and not talk to me for a few days. Then he would hit me back up again and continue with creepy questions. I eventually told my girlfriend about the situation, and my girlfriend is super sweet, but she is also very aggressively protective over me, 
So she adds this guy and basically tells him that he needs to leave me alone. Unfortunately, this enraged Adam, who responded by saying that I needed to get rid of my girlfriend. Naturally, I defended my girlfriend and blocked Adam. Everything was cool for a week or so after, until another account added me. The guy's name was Tyler, and he seemed cool. He was nice to me and respected my relationship with my girlfriend. As the days go by, I started to notice that Tyler's vocabulary was very similar to Adam's. I wasn't sure, so I didn't make any assumptions that it was him. So I gave Tyler's snap to my girlfriend, who adds him to investigate. As soon as she adds Tyler's snap, Tyler flips out on her, which confirmed that it was Adam. As soon as this realization is made, I block him again. From here, everything goes quiet from Adam for about a month. So I live in the suburbs of Chicago, and both my girlfriend and I live down the street from each other. So naturally, we do see each other a lot, and both our families are really good friends. On top of that, our families would also house sit or pet sit for each other. Anyway, a month goes by until I get a letter with no address or name on it. Just my name on the front. I open it, and to my shock and horror, it is basically a love letter from Adam. The premise of the letter was basically him saying that he loves me and he wants me to run off with him. The letter also takes a very inappropriate turn halfway through, with him describing what he wants me to do to him, and what he wants to do to me. At this moment, two horrifying realizations hit me. One is that he knows my address, and two, he dropped that letter off himself, meaning that he is in my town. I immediately call my girlfriend, who is equally as shocked as I am, and after consulting with my parents, we call the cops. Unfortunately, since I had blocked as well as removed Adam's social media information, and the letter had no return address, there was nothing we could do about it. Day after day, letters would keep appearing in my mailbox, until they started appearing in my girlfriend's mailbox as well. Her letters were far worse than mine. Adam wrote how much he hated her, and how much he wanted to hurt her. He also stated many times of the ways he would inflict pain onto her until she broke up with me. Like me, she took this to the cops, and again, they could do nothing about it. My girlfriend's family had plans to go to Hawaii for vacation, and I was to house sit for them. The first couple days went fine, until around one of the last nights I was there. As per usual, I was over at their house watching TV on the couch, when the power went out. Mind you, it was around 1 a.m., and it was pitch black when the lights went out. The next few seconds were silent, when I heard a window smash from the office. To understand this more, let me give you the layout of the house. When you entered the front door, to your left was the living room, straight ahead was both the kitchen and stairs, and to the right was the office and dining room. On the upstairs level, as soon as you reached the top of the stairs, a bathroom was straight ahead, and my girlfriend's room was on the right, and the other bedrooms on the left. Immediately I got up, grabbed a kitchen knife, and ran upstairs to hide while I called the cops. I quickly got into my girlfriend's room and slipped into her closet. As soon as I was able to contact the operator, I heard the pounding of the intruder running up the steps. Thankfully, I had relayed all the information to the operator in time, who then stayed on the phone as we both remained quiet. The intruder took a left when he reached the top of the stairs, which gave more time for the cops to arrive and for me to get ready, just in case I needed to defend myself. A few minutes go by, until I heard the intruder start walking towards my girlfriend's room. In the few precious seconds I had, I slipped out of the closet and positioned myself next to the door. As soon as he opened the door and started to enter the room, I took the kitchen knife and drove it into his shoulder. A young man screamed in pain, as I heard a heavy metallic object make a large thud as it hit the ground. From there, I bolted out of the house, where I was met by four squad cars outside. I threw my hands in the air, shouting that he was upstairs. A few minutes go by, and the intruder was dragged out, still screaming in pain. With the siren lights flooding the street, I got a glimpse of his face. It was Adam. 
Adam was from Texas and had traveled all the way up to my state to be with me. He had rented a room at a local motel and would put letters in both my girlfriend's and my mailbox, daily. He would do this in the early hours of the morning, which was confirmed by the security footage of the motel he was staying at. That night, Adam had plans to hurt my girlfriend, or worse, and her family. He managed to pry open the power box and switch off the power to her house along with neighboring houses. He broke in with the intent of my girlfriend being there. Unfortunately for him, she was enjoying a tropical vacation. To be honest, I have no idea how this would have ended if I wasn't there that night. And I am grateful that my girlfriend and her family are okay. And I am grateful every day that I was at that house instead of my girlfriend that night. This story is true, and it happened to me on April 27, in Caracas. My then-girlfriend, now wife, and I had been staying at my mother-in-law's apartment for a few weeks, because my mother's apartment, where we lived, was being remodeled at the time. For some context, the apartment where we were staying is located on the fourth floor of a relatively small 10-floor building, which was positioned right in front of the city's main highway. I say small because there are very tall buildings in my city, which were as tall as 40 or 50 floors, and the people that lived in these buildings suffered greatly when the elevators did not work. Imagine going up and down the stairs for 50 or 60 floors. That's a lot of exercise for one day. So, there were a lot of things that I had to get used to in that place. Chief among them was hearing the sounds of cars, trucks, bikes, flat tires, damaged exhaust pipes, and occasional gunshots that came from the poor neighborhoods that were close to my girlfriend's home, which could be heard during the day and the night. In contrast, my mother's neighborhood was usually very quiet, especially at night, so I had to change my sleeping habits a little bit, so I usually went to bed quite late at night, usually at midnight or 1 a.m. This apartment was smaller than my apartment, and it was located on a different side of the city, but I did not care about those things as long as I could get a good night's sleep next to my wife, since I sometimes suffered from insomnia. The first time I came to my wife's apartment, I noticed there was a small hill with a huge tree, some medium small-sized plants, bushes and patches of grass, which were right next to the highway, and this seemed a little creepy to me at night. On that hill, I noticed there was a small makeshift aluminum shack. I thought that was a little funny, and I thought to myself, well that's weird, maybe there's a homeless person living there. If he does, he must be crazy about living there. On the first two nights I stayed there, even though I could hear the loud sounds of the highway, it took me a while to fall asleep. But fortunately, everything was okay, and I was able to get a good night's sleep on those two days. But the third night, as much as I wanted it to be exactly the same, it was quite different than the first. I remember it was late at night, I think it was midnight or even later, and I was almost sound asleep. I was listening to some scary stories on my cell phone to fall asleep to, just like I always did, however crazy that sounds. Suddenly, I was startled by the ear-piercing screams of some man or woman hurling a long string of F-bombs and other curses at somebody, or at something. This woke me up right away and scared the heck out of me at the same time. I thought to myself, who or what was that? I shook my wife's shoulder and told her, Honey, did you hear that? And she was still almost completely asleep, but responded, Hear what? It was nothing. Go back to bed, honey. However, I heard the curses again, so I decided to investigate what was going on. I got up from bed, rubbed my eyes, put on my slippers, and walked slowly and quietly out of our bedroom towards the balcony, where I could clearly see the highway and the small hill next to it. Now I could hear the curses more clearly, and it sounded like the voice of a deranged man, and I thought to myself, maybe I was right. Maybe there's a homeless person living in that metal hut. I was now standing shirtless, in my boxers and slippers on the dark balcony, looking over to that hill, 
where I saw that metal hut on the first day I slept in my wife's apartment. Weirdly enough, I was able to see a small campfire and a barefoot man coming out of the shack who had long, disheveled hair and a long, bushy beard. He was shirtless and wearing torn pants that were almost destroyed. He came out of the small shack. He was smoking something, and he was standing in that hill in the dark, screaming his lungs out and cursing a lot for some reason while he was looking towards the highway. I thought that this man must be crazy, getting drunk enough to be yelling at passing cars or the people or dogs that were all the way on the other side of the highway. This made me feel terrified, and I asked myself, what is that guy saying? And isn't he cold? Because of this racket, there were some neighborhood dogs barking in this man's direction. I thought it was really strange for someone to scream so much, especially this late at night. Unfortunately for me, my mother-in-law was a night owl like me and usually slept in the living room, so she turned on the kitchen light out of the blue to get some water and went back to sleep, which reflected a little bit towards the balcony. I turned my head around and was a little blinded by the glare of the light, but at the same time I was scared that this man would see me staring at him. In that moment, I crouched down so the man could not see me, but I was horrified when I saw this man walk to the fire and angrily put it out with his bare feet. He turned his head around from the highway to look at the outer wall of the building, and all the while was still cursing out loud. I thought to myself, maybe he's having a bad trip or something. Suddenly, this crazy guy looked up at the building wall. He walked until he was right in front of it and yelled, I can't take it anymore, and the voices are driving me crazy, and started to repeatedly bash his head into the wall until his head was bleeding while he yelled, Get out of my head! The sound it made was terrifying. When he was done, he touched his head with his right hand and wiped the blood off. Now he looked crazier than ever. Out of the blue, the guy looked up and noticed that I was staring at him, so he yelled, What are you looking at? So, I was scared to death at this point. I threw myself to the balcony ceramic floor, again. I winced at how cold it was and hid there for a while. I thought to myself, Out of sight, out of mind, right? The crazy guy kept screaming his curses at me. I decided that was enough for me and quietly made my way back to the bed. I felt horrified about what I saw and I could barely sleep that night since all I could hear was my mother-in-law's snores and this guy's screams late into the night. The next day I felt extremely tired because I was not able to rest the night before. I told my wife about what happened and she told me, yeah, at some point you get used to that crazy guy and his screams but I don't think she believed me when I told her that I saw him bash his brains into the wall and almost kill himself. So it dawned on me. What if I hear this guy screams tonight again? Should I call the authorities? But I decided not to do it, because my country's police are basically useless. So I still don't know what to do about this crazy screaming man, but I know I will never look off of that balcony window at night. Again. I was a nurse for seven years, and my entire career, I worked at a single facility. The facility had many renovations done during the years since it opened in 1960. By 2011, when I started there, only half the facility was the original building, and the rest had all been added on over the years. I worked nights, mostly because I'm a night owl and found it easier than mornings. I had a number of odd experiences but I'll share the main ones that stick with me. Firstly, I have had experiences with the supernatural since the age of three, so I believe in the supernatural, but wasn't obsessed, more aware of it, if that makes sense. There was one wing in particular that was part of the original building, which had a small sitting room with a television for residents to enjoy during the day. During my night shifts, this one area gave me such a feeling of dread and fear that I would only be near it for as long as I absolutely had to. I would go out of my way to take the long way back to the nurse's station just to avoid being near it. Nothing I know of happened there, but my gut feeling was screaming at me. 
that there was something there, and it was not happy. This feeling eased during the daylight, but once it was night, the feeling was there. It felt as if someone was watching me, and they did not like the fact that I was there. I spoke to a few other nurses about this, and they all claimed they experienced the same feelings. One other incident sticks with me. A 90-year-old woman, let's call her Jane, went to breakfast and then asked to be taken back to her room for a sleep. She was a very healthy woman, but she said she wasn't feeling well. When the nurse did her next round 20 minutes later, she found that the resident had passed away in her sleep. I found out that it was an aortic aneurysm, so she didn't suffer. Unfortunately, death is rarely quick in aged care. It's usually a slow process of days or weeks. Jane was a very sweet Polish lady. She had outlived her children, and her husband had passed away many years before, so she never had visitors. I would check on her and bring her tea at exactly 9.30 p.m. and say goodnight every night. As you could probably guess, not everything goes to schedule in healthcare, and it's not always possible to stick to a strict routine. But if it got to 9.35, she would ring her call bell asking for her tea, and then apologize profusely for ringing her bell. And every time I answered with, Whenever you need help, press the button. You're not in trouble. I love to help. She would then always say her usual, Good night, sweet girl and I would leave and get on with my shift. The funeral home was late to pick her up. I helped the undertaker in the afternoon when I started my shift. All the rooms had a call bell next to the toilet, one next to the bed, and the residents wore a necklace or bracelet with a call bell attached to that as well. When a resident passes, their room's call bells are disconnected the same day, and the personal bell is put on the nurse's station ready for the next person to move in. At 9.36, the call bell to her room started ringing. This was not possible, obviously. Her room had been disconnected, and her personal bell was sitting in a drawer next to me. Slightly freaked out, I went down to her room and checked to make sure that there wasn't a dementia patient who had wandered in there. Maybe maintenance hadn't turned the bell off yet, even though I personally spoke to them after they did so. I was just trying to rationalize it, I guess. I went into the room, and it was pitch black. No one was inside, and the bells had definitely been turned off, as I was unable to turn it off from inside the room, and I had to cancel it from the main desk. I instantly had a feeling of peace. Weird, because in every other situation, I would have been a mess. I think she was just trying to say goodbye. As I was closing the door to her room, I heard a shriek and my best friend came running down the corridor crying in a state. Once I got her to calm down, she said, I was in X-Wing charting and Jane walked past me in her nightie. Then she turned to the corner to the front wing, but when I looked around the corner, she wasn't there. She's dead, right? She died. What did I just see? This happened around 2006. I was 12 years old at the time. At the time, my grandparents used to live in a small house beside a big lake called Lagoa do Imaru in the countryside of Santa Carina, Brazil. My cousins and I used to spend days, sometimes weeks, in their house, especially during our school vacations. It was a really cool place to stay, and the house had an enormous plot of land where we used to play soccer and do kid stuff and a private pier at the end of it, from where we would jump into the lake during the hot Brazilian summer days. One of the lands near my grandfather's land was occupied by my grandma's sister's house, and the other side was unoccupied, just woods, with a public pier, probably double the size of my grandpa's private pier. The public pier was wider, probably around 1 to 5 meters, and was about 50 meters long from end to end. It was perfect for us kids to run together and jump into the lake, and we felt that we had plenty of privacy there, far away from our grandparents' view. One night, around midnight, 
Myself and three cousins decided to go to the end of the public pier to relax a little and just mess around. So we silently left my grandpa's house, jumped the fence to the next land plot, and went straight to the end of the public pier. We stood there for about 35 minutes messing around and talking to each other. And that's when my cousin first saw him. A man with a yellow dirty raincoat that was almost brown at the beginning of the pier. We just stood there silently staring at him and at each other. That's when he started slowly walking towards the end of the pier. But at the time, there was no light pole at the beginning of the pier, just at the end of it, because that's where the fishermen would stand to do their business. So we just stared at him, not being able to recognize him or at least see if he was carrying something. The man continued walking, and when he reached the first light pole, where we were able to start recognizing his features, he stopped. Then, we could finally see him. An old man, missing teeth, with a big gray beard, and with a strange smile on his face. Like he really wanted to laugh, but couldn't. At this moment, everyone was freaking out, because we had no escape route, just the lake and nobody wanted to show up at my grandpa's house all wet with regular clothes after midnight, especially when we left the house secretly, not to mention how cold the water would be at that time. We could see that he had no fishing rod with him, but started to mimic and had some big heavy fish on the line, but in a really exaggerated way, like he was a cartoon character. He was already creeping us out, but this put it over the top. The man suddenly turned to us with a sad face, like he was sad that he didn't catch his imaginary fish, and mimicked casting the baited fishing line into us, waited two seconds, and started reeling his imaginary line in. But instead of making the pulling line movement like he did before, he started to jump closer to us every turn of his heel, like he was being pulled by us. That's when we decided we had enough, and being grounded was probably better than being murdered by this guy by some mimicking maniac, and all four of us jumped into the lake and started swimming to my grandpa's pier. When we got there, probably around 15 seconds later, the man was gone. To this day, I have no idea who it was or what he was planning, but there's something about that mimicking fisherman that I cannot get out of my mind. There's no way I will ever forget him, and it has been 16 years now. It happened last year between Christmas and New Year's Eve. I'm from the French Caribbean, so it's not unusual to scuba dive during Christmas holidays. My family and I booked a few dives. They are all really good scuba divers, better than me. They passed a few scuba diving levels that allow them to participate in way more technical dives that I'm allowed to do. I enjoy scuba diving as well, and I'm able to do almost every casual dive but I don't feel safe diving without an instructor yet, even more if it's a dive with decompression stops required. If anyone isn't familiar with scuba diving, here's a quick explanation. You can dive safely until a certain deep before the pressure becomes dangerous. If you dive below that point, which is roughly 20 meters or 65 feet, you have to do decompression stops during your ascent. It means that you have to stop while going back to the surface a certain time to let your body adapt itself to the pressure. If you ride up too quickly, you may catch decompression sickness, which can lead, in worst case scenario, to death. So, we decided that I could manage a little private lesson with an instructor first, prior to more exiting dives with my family. So, the first day, my family was enjoying a dive on a technical spot that I wasn't feeling up to, while I was alone with my instructor and retrieving my old scuba diving reflexes. Everything went okay. We were on a beautiful coral reef. There was many beginners on the boat, and I was by far the most experienced here. So finally, my instructor decided that he could manage me with another student, which was truly a beginner. And after a small briefing with every safety rules and hand sign, which is the only way to communicate underwater, we began our descent. I quickly retrieved all my old reflexes and was enjoying myself, going back and forth to the instructor and the beginner diver. 
during at least 20 minutes. Everything was perfect besides one thing. It was a windy day and there was a heavy swell. It's less of a problem underwater than it is for a surface swimmer. The only thing was that it requires more physical effort to swim and so my air bottle was emptying a little quicker than usual, which is normal. I signed to my instructor that I was running thin of air, and he nodded. It was far from being critical level. It was at this moment that I saw a young man swimming towards me. It wasn't the instructor, nor the other student. I have never seen him before, but he was in full scuba diving gear, and we were the only dive boat on the spot, so I assumed he was with us and I just didn't pay attention to him on the boat. He was swimming fast towards me and then signed me that he was out of air. When an air failure happens in scuba diving, there is a very strict procedure. You have to help the person no questions asked, because every second is vital. If you faint underwater, you drown. On your gear you have two breathing devices, regulator and the octopus. I am not sure about the English word for it. A main device and a spare device. So I handed the guy my spare breathing device, which means that we both were breathing on my gear, consuming twice as air as I was consuming alone. I waited until the guy seemed to have calmed down and tried to hand sign him to go see my instructor. He shook his head no and signed me to start my ascent. I understand this as the procedure. I was a little low on air and above the decompression stop level so the right thing to do was going up to the surface before having an air failure and I have had to tell my instructor first. The guy was very reluctant and it was strange because it would have taken us like 30 seconds to tell the instructor and he would have started an ascent with us. During this time I was panicking as seeing my own air level going down and I saw that our instructor was staring at us quizzically and swimming towards us. It was at this moment that the guy let go of my spare air device and started swimming away, breathing again in his own breathing device. I was totally lost and started my ascent with my instructor. Once at the surface, because of the tides, I was feeling dizzy and nauseous, so my bizarre encounter wasn't the first thing that I debriefed. It was after I calmed down and the boat driving us towards the beach, without the strange guy, that I asked my instructor about what happened. Oh, I don't know, maybe a guy who lost his group and needed some time to calm down. I replied, Okay, but why did he tell me that he was out of air? My instructor told me that I probably misunderstood his hand signing, that he was probably not telling me he was having an air failure, because he left, breathing in his own device. I'm sure I saw him do the air failure sign, but okay. The next day, I joined my family during my dive, and the instructor was different, it was a girl this time, named Charlie. I have had time to think about that guy, and I was worried about him, so I told everything that happened to Charlie, and asked her if she knew the guy, and if he was okay, because I never saw him return to the surface. She asked me to describe him, which I did, and she said, Oh, that's just Marvin. Don't worry about him. He's preparing himself to become a scuba diving instructor. Every time he has a day off from the restaurant he's working in, he asks us to take him to the coral reef in the mornings and pick him up in the afternoon. I ate at his restaurant that afternoon and saw him. Don't worry. I was feeling relieved and told myself that it was just a comprehension issue with Marvin. The rest of the week went without any incident. I was doing more and more technical dives and everything went very smoothly. Charlie was a wonderful instructor. Never saw Marvin again. That being said, until the last dive. It was on New Year's Eve. We planned the best dive on that day. It was on a shipwreck, and I felt trained enough to try it without any instructor, just my family and I. It was fairly deep for a beginner like myself, 30 meters at its down point, around 98 feet. My first day male instructor was there and told us that he would be exploring the shipwreck too. So we would cross him, and he would help me if he saw that I needed it. It was very comforting to know, and my family felt comforted too, when I told them that. So, we began our descent, and started swimming around the shipwreck. We crossed our old instructor twice, but every time, I signed him that everything was okay. It was at that moment, that I saw Marvin swimming towards me. 
At this moment, I was about 5 to 10 meters above my down point, still staying under my decompression stop level though. I was a little surprised, and even more surprised when he signed me again that he was out of air. I was mistrustful, but if there was any chance that it would be true, I couldn't not help him. So I handed him my spare breather. This time, I had a lot of air left, so it wasn't a problem. He took it and started breathing it in, and took my arm. I reached over to see his air level instruments, but he prevented me from seeing it. Then, he signed me to start an ascent with him. I immediately signed, no. I wasn't at my deepest when he reached, but I have been deeper during this time, and I had a decompression stop to do. I saw that my father saw us, but he quickly looked away, probably not understanding what was going on. I tapped at my diving computer, a device which calculates when and how long to decompress, to signify it to him. He shrugged, smiled at me, and started swimming up, still holding me. I was paralyzed for a few seconds, and the thing that helped me react was that my diving computer was telling me to stop and decompress now. I then understood that I was in danger, that if I let him do what he wanted, I would die from the bends. I then started screaming, only to remember that no noise can be heard underwater. I started wriggling frantically as I saw my father and sisters way below me, my diving computer alerting me more and more intensely. At that moment, my father saw us, and he reacted. He swam very quickly towards us, and I managed to hit the guy as my dad grabbed my ankle and suddenly dragged me deeper. The guy then quickly swam away. My dad dragged me deeper again, and then we waited for a very long decompression stop to ensure that I was okay. Then started heading towards the surface, very slowly and cautiously. On the surface, I started crying frantically and went back to the boat. My father then told me that he thought Marvin was my old instructor, and this was why he wasn't surprised at first. I then told this to my old instructor who took it more seriously this time, and told me to point out Marvin when he returned to the surface. The thing is, he never did. The next day, on New Year, we went one last time to the scuba diving club because my little sisters had a diploma to collect, and we saw Charlie. Still rattled, I told her what happened with Marvin, and then she told me that Marvin was at the restaurant yesterday for New Year's Eve, and he did not want to go scuba diving, which means that this guy was not Marvin, and to this day, I still have no idea who it was, and what he wanted, what he was doing and why he tried to kill me, maybe twice. Over 10 years ago, I used to live in a peninsula in Norway. It was quite idyllic, actually, as my sister, my mom, and I lived within walking distance of a beach. We had a short and incredibly narrow driveway that led to the house, and the only window in the house facing the driveway was my bedroom window. This is an important detail. I was about 9 or 10 at the time when this incident happened. I was in the living room watching a show. I think it was around 6 or 7 p.m. as it got dark pretty fast at the time of the year, January. I had been sitting there for hours when my mother told me to go to my bedroom and watch TV as we were having guests over soon. I grabbed my things and went to my room. I remember the room felt really cold, so I turned on the heater and went back out to the living room to get my candy or something like that. On my way out the door, a sudden feeling of dread washed over me, and I had this feeling that someone was looking at me. I don't know how to explain this feeling, but it was as if I subconsciously could see someone outside my window from the corner of my eye but not realize it until I grabbed the door handle. I turned around quickly and glanced out the window. Nothing. I felt really stupid and brushed it off as me just being paranoid or dramatic. I got my candy and went back into my room. The first thing I noticed was that my bedroom window had been slightly opened and I did not remember opening it myself. I figured maybe my mom did. Suddenly, I heard a sort of scratching sound outside my window and this time I froze. 
I couldn't process what was going on. There was a person outside my window. His face was glued to the glass, and he was holding his hands on each side to get a better look inside my room. As my window was quite far up when standing outside, I could only see his head. For a brief second, I thought maybe he was one of the guests mom was talking about, but I had never seen him in my entire life. He was just standing there, staring at me. I couldn't move, or maybe I could but I didn't want to. I was too scared. He looked like he was in his 40s, and I remember him having really dark circles around his eyes. He just stood there for what felt like an eternity, and then suddenly widened his eyes and continued to stare. This scared the crap out of me, and I managed to call for my mom. The man panicked and disappeared quickly. As I was in the middle of telling my mom that this man was standing outside the window, the doorbell rang. My mom answered the door and would not let me out in the hallway to see who it was. I just remember her looking uneasy when she came back. A few months later, the same man was arrested and charged with murder after his neighbors complained about a horrific smell coming from his apartment. After all these years, my mom finally told me what the man said at the door. He told her that someone had ordered takeout and he wanted to check if it was the right address. This being a small peninsula, she recognized him from a small vegetable shop and realized he was lying. She got scared and quickly told him no one had ordered anything. A year later, we moved to the city, and only now I fully understand why. I truly believe that if my mom had not been there, I would not be alive today. Sometimes I feel guilty for the girl's death and wonder if she would be alive and well today if I had been taken instead. To preface this, I love to drive, like hours long drives to nowhere with no destination in mind. Just me, my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I would often take back roads or lonely highways cutting through the countryside to small towns and eventually cities. And I would usually take these drives at night since there was less traffic to worry about. I have done it since I got my license four or five years ago and I have never once had any sort of issue. That was until a few nights ago. For reference, I am a relatively small 22-year-old female, and as I've stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together to sort personal issues out. I have also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household when I used to live with my parents as a means of coping with their alcoholism. Though now that I have moved out and am in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. However, on the night this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious with a bunch of personal issues that I would rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend, couldn't focus on anything else, and decided I would take a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and to not be gone for too terribly long since it was getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye, and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes, but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life so I decided to drive further north down those familiar, dark, winding, one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour, taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend and was just admiring the vast, empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight in seemingly the middle of nowhere. The few houses miles back from the road lightless, and the dead cornfields withered away and covered in the snow. It was like something out of a horror movie, and I half expected to see a ghost pop up in my rearview mirror, or see someone clamber out from the patches of the trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from my headlights, and even then, I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. 
By now, it was just after 11, and I told myself that once I made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back up towards the city, I would head back to the city and home. That roundabout was still maybe 15-25 minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really all that concerned. I mean, I was by myself. I didn't have any other motorists to worry about. Right? Wrong. As I'm rounding another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazards flashing, maybe a quarter of a mile or something away from me. It was some sort of sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder, while the rest was jutting out onto the road, like they had to pull over in a hurry, but didn't quite manage to do that. The driver's side door was flung wide open, and as I slowed my vehicle down and angled it towards the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the inside of the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car, and I was the only motorist in sight. Cell phone reception is spotty at best in this part of the country, but more often than not, you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see if I had any service. So, a lone female on the road, at night, pulling up near a vacant vehicle that looks like someone had been attacked on the inside, with no cell service. Now, I'm no dummy, I have watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it. But there was still a small part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in that vehicle and needed help. These roads don't get a lot of traffic late at night and temperatures were well below freezing. If someone was hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them but me. Still, I approached on the side of caution. I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly, and as I approached the vehicle, I rolled down my passenger window a bit, shut off the music and called out, Hey, anyone there? Are you okay? I did not hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and look for them. I told myself I would call out one last time, and if I didn't hear anything, I would leave, and the moment there was reception, I would call it in. And if I did hear someone, well, I would figure out my next course of action then. So, again I shout, Hey, what happened? Are you okay? There was silence for a beat, and then I heard rustling in the shadows of the trees, followed by a gruff voice saying, yeah. I was relieved at first and was about to say something in response or possibly even stop my car and get out when I noticed three things nearly simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed there was no damage to the hood or anywhere else on the vehicle, which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In my rear view mirror, I caught a glance of someone coming out from behind the sedan and they were making their way towards my car. Fast. The person did not have any blood on them, or appeared injured in any way, wearing a mask. Not like a face mask for the virus, or a ski mask or anything normal, but one of those masks you would see in the Purge movies, and they were holding something in their hand. I don't know what it was, I could not get a good look, but from its length and shape, my guess was maybe a tire iron, or a crowbar, or something. I don't need to tell you that I slammed on the gas the moment I noticed those things and drove out of there as fast as I could, my heart thundering in my chest and my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste and the music was still shut off, so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me, though I had no clue what they were saying. I just knew I had to get out of there immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove away, mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to follow Chase, or if they had stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road, watching me, and right before I looked away from the mirror, I saw a second man emerge from the trees that had been rustling earlier, also wearing one of those creepy masks, and no trace of blood on him from what I could see. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, 
but I wanted to get as far away from those guys as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards the town, parked in the Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars, from who I assumed were workers closing up shop, and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends, T, who was a police officer, to tell him what happened and ask what I should do. He was concerned for me, and after asking if I was okay, where I was, did they follow me, etc., he told me since it was out of city limits, he could not do much on his end, but he could get in contact with the local police in that jurisdiction to take my statement and check it out. I agreed, thanked him, and while I waited for police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through my hysterical sobs and panic, I managed to tell him what happened. He was, as you can imagine, super worried for my safety and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down there himself to get me. I told him the police were on their way to take my statement, so I couldn't leave and that I was okay, but I stayed on the phone with him until I saw the familiar police cruisers pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement and they assured me they would go back to the spot I told them the sedan had been to take a look and that they would try to catch the guys who were there. Though with no cameras and no description of the men, I wasn't sure they would be able to. I didn't even get the license plate number, though at the time of my panic the thought never came to mind until the police were asking if I got it. All they had to go off of was a dark colored sedan and two guys with masks. After I gave my statement, I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the whole night, listening to every sound the house made in fear that it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever it was they started. Since the incident, I have not heard back from police about whether or not they had any leads, and I am not sure they ever will. I am just thankful I'm still here, and that I did not stop my car or get out. I am not sure what would have become of me if I had. I still have so many questions that likely will never have answers. What were they doing? Why? Was that blood on the inside of the car, or just a ruse to get more attention? If it really was blood, did they hurt someone? What would have happened to me if I had stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any more late night drives anymore, and I hope I never see those two masks again. For some backstory, I was in 7th grade going from my school in the downtown area of my city to my house. The buses usually are composed of a certain constant demographic, the teenagers coming home from school, the working class adults, and sadly, single mothers with their children trying to save a buck by using the bus. In addition to this demographic, there are the two types of disturbances, drug addicts or alcoholics that are loud and disruptive, usually begging for a dollar and the middle-aged male creep or predator preying on middle schoolers or young women, both of which I had had my encounters with. But today's story is not my own experience. I did have a front row seat of this crazy encounter though. Now that we have the exposition, on to the story. I find a seat near the end of the bus by myself. Because of the way the buses work, there is one row on each side of the bus, and each seat has two sitting spaces. I'm sorry if that doesn't make sense, but there's also a twisty area in the middle of the bus. Two seats are directly across from each other in this area. On the opposite side of me is a working class man, some teenagers behind me, and in front of me are the main characters of this story, a dingy, unshaven man and three teenage girls. The man being directly in front of me and the three girls in the twisty seats in front of the man. Being that there's only two per seat, one of these girls decides to sit in one of her friend's laps to stay close to and not have to sit beside a stranger. Upon seeing this, the man begins to sort of creepily laugh to himself before obnoxiously adjusting the way he's sitting in a suggestive manner. As the ride begins and the girl notices him, he starts to pat his thigh as if to suggest she sit down there, then leading to verbalizing these actions, saying things like, Come here come sit here instead, or you belong right here. 
Everyone inside of this disgusting behavior catches on, and they are all watching him. The girl simply scowls at the man and turns away, her friends throwing light insults at him. His attempts in vain, he turns to the working class man who's watching what's going on. He then says something along the lines of, Why is she sitting there? She needs to be on my lap instead. Further commenting on this high schooler's body and doing the buddy-buddy arm nudge with him, as if the two were pals. Just a note, she is visibly a high schooler. Our district requires standard school attire, so she's in khaki shorts and a button-up short sleeve shirt with a backpack. So there is no way this man couldn't have known she was underage, but I digress. Anyways, hearing these outrageous statements from the man, working class man replies with something like, Hey, don't you ever associate me with whatever you think this is. This is a child you're talking about. I come from Detroit. We put people like you in the dirt. The man, not at all deterred, scoffs and does that hand-flinging motion as if to blow him off. The working class man's stop is coming up, and as he stands, he tells the girl that he apologizes for what she's going through and leaves. The girl tells him on his way out, Thank you, but I'll be able to handle it. Just gotta wait. The gross man turns back to her and says, Handle what? Me? And laughs to himself. I was appalled at his gross statements, but even angrier than me were the adults and male thugs who started standing in the area where the situation was, all witnesses to this atrocity. I remember hearing the guys all started getting riled up behind me in defense of the girl. Now, this guy starts to get a bit scared. He has now stopped talking upon seeing how many people are against him. The girl again goes on to assure the crowd that she's got everything under control and things calm down a bit. That is, until he pulls the string to notify the driver that he wants to leave at the next stop. In a split second, everyone's eyes were back on him. The thugs began standing up again, just in case he plans to run from whatever the girl has in store for him. The bus begins to arrive to the stop, and as the man stands up, so does the girl. He attempts to walk past her, but upon approaching her, she pushes him back, not to get him off his feet, but to get him back from the forming group of people. She does this because he stumbles backward. She swings her belt off her waist and yells, You like to prey on little girls? You like flirting with little girls? As a grown man? And starts beating the brakes off this guy with it. And yes, she was using the metal side. My ears filled with clinking of metal on his body and his head, the slapping of the leather on his skin, and the moans and cries of this fully grown man who is now on the ground in tears attempting to escape his well-deserved beating. The bus ends up completely stopping, the driver running back to separate the two. The girl is still beating the man with all her might as the bus driver rushes over to pick her up and pull her away from the man. The man ends up crawling on hands and knees off the bus where he had been laid on the concrete, moaning and crying in pain. Everyone was escorted off the bus and the police were soon called to get the man medical attention. The police ended up detaining the girl and I couldn't find any information about her charges, but I hope wherever she is, she's having a good day. As for the man, all I can say is just don't be a creep and bad things won't come to you. I admire that girl's bravery and the passengers that bonded together for the safety of the girl were the best demonstration of what a community should be that I have ever seen. Way back when I was in my mid-twenties in the late 1980s, I used to be hardcore into hiking and camping, but given that my home state of Rhode Island is like the size of a postage stamp, relatively speaking anyway, I exhausted a lot of more of local campgrounds pretty quickly and began to long for something a little wilder. I had heard a lot of great things about the Appalachian Trail, how hiking it was a badge of honor for a lot of people who shared my passion for the outdoors. My uncle on my dad's side had hiked the whole thing over the course of a summer back in the 50s, and he never shut up about it whenever he would see me and the subject of hiking came up. He made it sound absolutely magical like there was true wilderness out there just waiting to be explored. And so, 
I made up my mind to mimic the journey my uncle took over one summer. I couldn't get the time off work to walk the whole trail, but if I timed it right, I could walk the southern portion of the trail from Harper's Ferry to Asheville, North Carolina in just a couple of weeks, fulfilling a hiking dream I had had for what seemed like an age. Then in the summer of 1989, I traveled down to Harper's Ferry by bus and by train with all my hiking and camping gear on my back. After picking up a few final supplies for my journey south, I hiked up onto the Appalachian Trail and kicked off the journey of a lifetime. Needless to say, the first few days walk were pretty tough, but I got used to the level of strain pretty quickly, and I'm telling you, I have never been as hungry or tired as I was on those first few nights up in Appalachia. I brought a hammock with me, as I had heard some pretty intense stories about the bugs down in West Virginia. Nasty little beasties, with names like the Assassin Bug, which basically has a big spike for a mouth, or cow killer ants, whose sting are so painful they are said to have felled an actual cow once or twice. That had to be pure rumor, but it was intimidating nonetheless. So every night after my day's hike, I'd take it out of my pack, unroll it, and tie it up between two trees before getting some shut-eye. It didn't make for the comfiest night's sleep I'd ever had, but I wasn't complaining, especially if it kept the black widows off me. But since I was out in the woods, most nights without cover, every little hoot or squawk from nocturnal animals would wake me up. It was irritating, sure, but it was part and parcel with being out there bonding with nature. So this one night, I wake up, pretty sure I had heard something rustling in the leaves close by. I shift in my hammock, peering over shoulder, and then feel my blood run cold as I see this big, dark shape looming over me. I froze for a moment, feeling my eyes adjust to the darkness, and I could tell that it was a person, just standing there, statue still, staring at me. In one fluid motion, I rolled out of my hammock and hit the ground running, bolting off into the trees. I did not care who it was standing over me. Whoever does that kind of thing definitely did not have the best of intentions, and I wasn't about to stick around to make small talk either. I ran a safe distance into the woods, caught my breath, circled around, and then started sneaking back towards my camp. My intention was to make sure it was clear before gathering up my stuff and moving on to a safer spot. I took it slowly, scanning the darkness for any sign of the shadowy figure, eventually finding my way back to my camp to discover it was completely deserted, with all my gear apparently untouched. I had this horrible feeling in my gut that whoever had been standing over me had just backed off to watch from a distance and would wait for me to come back to get my stuff before ambushing me. If they weren't there to steal from me, it was obviously something else they wanted and I dreaded to think exactly what it was. But regardless, I managed to grab my stuff and get out of the area without anyone managing to sneak up on me. The next few days, I walked hard and fast, exhausting myself in my attempts to get as far away from the area as possible. After that, I figured I was safe. No one had bothered me during the previous few days hiking, so I figured I would be okay from there on out. But I was wrong. Hideously wrong. Every single night since that incident had me struggling to get to sleep. I kept picturing that person standing over me, just staring down at me in the darkness. I had no idea how long they had been there, or what they had in mind for me, and I was just glad that I had gotten out of the area. But still, I didn't start to feel safe again until I had bought some fishing line from a sporting goods store in one of the small towns I passed through on my way down the trail which I could then use to make trip wires that ran between the trees, close to where I was camping. Then a couple of empty cans of beans strung together, and whoever snagged their foot on the wire would make the cans clank together, alerting me to their presence. I had one big scare when a fox snagged the line, and I rolled out of my hammock with a knife in hand, ready to take on whoever was about to creep up on me, only to see the furry little guy scurrying away in the moonlight. I did end up laughing to myself about that one, and after that, I stopped sleeping with my knife in my hand, because all it would have taken was one little slip and I would be in a whole world of trouble. About a week went by, and I had just gotten over the whole shadowy figure in the night incident. I had to be almost a hundred miles away from where it had taken place 
and I had no trouble at all on any of the other nights, save the incident with the fantastic Mr. Fox that had just about scared the crap out of me. So with the help of my little tripwire alert device, I had just started being able to get to sleep without any trouble again. But that night, I woke up suddenly to find that I couldn't move properly. I couldn't bring up arms from my sides at all, and the material from my hammock seemed to be pushed up right into my face. I was cocooned by it, like the fabric was wrapped around my entire body. This has only just registered in my half-awake brain when I heard the sound of fabric snapping. Then boom, I hit the dirt hard, completely knocking the wind out of me. I had no idea what was going on, struggling to break out of the hammock, only I couldn't. That's when I felt the hammock being dragged across the forest floor. Then it hit me. Whoever was dragging me across the ground had bundled me up in my own hammock with some kind of cord, cut the ropes tying me to the trees, and was proceeding to drag me off to God knows where. I screamed at the very top of my lungs for whoever it was to let me out, but no one responded. All I could hear was the sound of the hammock's fabric rustling against the forest floor. I knew I had to think fast, or whatever was going on wouldn't end well at all. Like I said, I had stopped sleeping with my knife in my hand, or nearby me in the hammock, because that was just an accident waiting to happen, so I had absolutely nothing handy to cut through the material and make my escape. Or so I thought. In a flash, I had an idea. A few years back, my dad had gifted his old wristwatch to me. It was a reliable old thing, but I had just one complaint about it. The little latch thing that kept it tied to my wrist was worn with age and was actually a little sharp from the years of use. I had managed to accidentally poke myself a few times with it in the process of picking it up or putting it on, and one time, it actually drew blood. I knew what I had to do. I unbuckled the watch as quickly as I could, which wasn't easy considering I was getting dragged along the ground in pitch black darkness and managing to pinch the sharp clasp between my thumb and index finger was even harder, but still, I managed it. And when I did, I began to rake it against the fabric of the hammock. It was just as effective as cutting canvas as it was cutting skin, and although it took a few tries, it didn't take long until I could see the subtle glow of silvery moonlight from the other side. I kept cutting, as quickly and quietly as I could manage, until there were so many cuts that I could rip myself out of the canvas cocoon, like some sort of a terrified newborn bursting out of a womb. You'll have to excuse the analogy, but in retrospect, that's exactly what it seemed like happened. I was born again that night. I got a second chance at living, escaping that hammock meant life, because I knew that staying in it would have meant death. For the second time in about ten days, I found myself bounding through the dark woods, only that second time the terror in me dwarfed what I had felt the first time around. I don't even know how I managed to escape. Assuming it was the same figure standing over me the first night, they had somehow managed to track me for more than a hundred miles and sneak past my tripwires. They were a far better woodsman than me, probably physically fitter too. I just know that by the time I reached a house with its lights on, I turned to look behind me as I was banging on the door. There was no one else around. The family who lived there were kind enough to put me up for the night after I called the local sheriff, who came out in the morning to help me retrace my steps through the woods. We found my camp, but not the hammock, and although I told him everything in excruciating detail, I could tell he was skeptical of my story. He even suggested that I had just gotten lost and frightened in the dark and had ended up jumping at shadows, maybe even had a bad dream that seemed a little too vivid because of the lack of proper rest. But I know it was real, just from the way my palms were sweating writing this back. I'm certain that night really did happen the way I remember it. I never did finish that dream hike. The next day, I caught a bus back towards Harper Ferry then took the train all the way back to Providence, and I only ever told a handful of people about what happened on the trails. I figured not many would really believe me. They would just think I was telling a campfire tale or something. I didn't tell my hiking uncle for the longest time. I thought he would just gloat or whatever, tell me that I didn't have it in me to do something that tough. But when I finally did share my story, I got a reaction that I definitely wasn't expecting. He just nodded, 
and told me that there were some nights that he didn't think he would make it out alive either. That there are people that live up in those mountains who have been outlaws for generations, who live outside of society, outside of the natural order of things. He had had some pretty close calls himself at times, bumping into people who weren't nearly as friendly as the majority of West Virginians, and sometimes seeing things he knew he was not supposed to see. But just what those things were, he didn't seem to want to say. I always told myself I would try my little Appalachian adventure another time, maybe when I'm a little older, a little wiser, and when I've got something a little bigger to defend myself with. The trail will still be there, waiting for me. But then again, so might whoever tried to drag me off that night. In high school, I had a stalker. Here's the story. I'll try to keep it concise, but there's a lot of information. I was 16, and we met on Facebook. He went to a school nearby, and we decided to meet up for a movie. We had a great time together and ended up dating. The first time he came to my parents' house, he had an ankle monitor on for house arrest and wouldn't tell anyone why, which was the first red flag that I ignored. And since he was a minor, we couldn't find out. My parents obviously did not allow us to hang out, so we hung out at his house or around town at the YMCA camp. I was rebellious and naive. Things started to get weird when I noticed his family was pretty odd. One day we were making out in his bedroom and I saw his father looking through the blinds. I screamed and called him out and his dad ran off. He told me that his dad was just into redheads. I went to leave and his mom was smoking something in the kitchen, so I decided it was time to break up. And this is when it got bad. He started crying and told me that he's in cancer treatment and that's why he needs me, quote unquote, and that he doesn't have long to live. Unfortunately, I believed him and told him that we could be friends. This is when the stalking started. He switched schools to my high school, but never went to class. He would just stand outside of my classroom looking inside until it was passing period. When I would leave class, he wouldn't address me. He would just follow about 10 to 15 feet behind me to my next period and stand outside the classroom again. I was too intimidated to say something to him, so I just let it happen for weeks. It started to progress to where he would follow me home every day. He would get on the same bus as me despite living across town and walk 10 to 15 feet behind me all the way to my house. He would stand outside, just staring up at the window until around the time my parents got home, and then he would just leave. Finally, I told him to shove off and leave me alone. I told him that we could no longer be friends or acquaintances, and he had to forget about me. However, that escalated things way farther. I started getting like a hundred calls a day, Half of them were him screaming to death threats at me, and in detail torture methods that he wanted to do to me, and the other half were him singing me love songs that he wrote. Every time I blocked his number, he seemed to just magically get a new one and begin leaving more messages. I woke up one day to see that overnight, he had left me one of those dancing, singing snowmans on my porch. He had stabbed it in the head, and the knife was still sticking out. He covered it in this liquid deodorant that I had previously mentioned liking the smell of, and I noticed there was a hole where the little song recording device was. When I pressed the hand, it was not the regular Frosty the Snowman song that played. It was his voice singing eerily. I'm going to have you forever. I'm never going to let you be. I was done at this point and told my parents, who contacted the school. They suspended him, but he still waited at my bus stop every day and walked to my house with me. One day he charged at me like he was going to tackle me. When I tensed up for the impact, he stopped and hugged me. It wasn't a regular hug either, it was like he was trying to crush me. I am very petite and he ended up cracking one of my ribs. I started crying and then he started crying too before running off. He left me a voicemail apologizing in song form. Now this is the night that it happened, and it's a night I will never forget. It's the reason that I got a restraining order. 
I woke up one evening for no reason, just was fully awake. I got up to go to the kitchen to get a glass of water to relax, and in the reflection on the fridge, I saw movement in my backyard. I couldn't see well because it was so dark outside, and the light in the kitchen made it even harder, so I went to the back sliding glass door to get a better look. When I got closer, I was met with the silhouette of a tall man standing just outside the door. He was there, the stalker, under my room at 3 a.m. He was just staring at me. I screamed, which woke up my parents, but he was gone by the time my dad went outside. There's a patio right outside my bedroom window that goes all the way to the ground, so it's possible he could have been on top of the patio looking directly into my bedroom window before. I got a restraining order shortly after that, and the guy eventually dropped out of school. I haven't seen him since in person, but every six months or so, he makes a new Facebook and tries to friend request me. I just block it and report it every time. Scary stuff. Have you heard of that myth that if you wake up in the middle of the night for no reason, there's likely someone watching you? Well, maybe it's true. This happened four years ago. At the time this happened, I was 12 going on 13 in just a month or two. The friend I will mention in this story was 14 at the time. Her name was Sally, who I was staying with that night. At the time, the two-year age gap seemed quite big. At 12 to 13 years old, I was about to start my second year of middle school, whereas Sally was about to begin her sophomore year of high school. I met her in the beginning of my first year at the new school. She was older than the other kids in our grade and was considered one of the popular kids, and I think that's what drew me to her at first. We became fast friends, and before we knew it, we were spending every single weekend together. Seriously, every single weekend. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. It was your typical Friday night. We carpooled to her family's apartment after school. I have always been a picky eater, so when her family had dinner, I didn't eat with them. I just snacked on the Pop-Tart that I had stowed away in my backpack in case they ordered something that I wouldn't eat. Something to note is that her family was pretty religious. I wouldn't go as far as to say they were fanatical, but they didn't allow their kids to watch horror movies or anything that was rated PG-13 or R. It did not stem from the desire to protect them from something inappropriate. Sally's mother had an irrational fear that scary movies had certain messages. We asked to watch The Purge, and our mom obviously said no. After some negotiating, she agreed to let us watch Hunger Games instead. After the movie, Sally and I went to hang out in our room. She put on some music, and being the age that we were, we gave each other makeovers. By the end of it, we were looking much older than just 12 and 14. This part of the night is when things started to seem off to me. Sally wasn't the most positive influence. Despite being my best friend at the time, she was manipulative and got off on putting me down. She had a habit of talking to men online and lying about her age. Sally showed me some texts between her and the man she was talking to. I can't give you an exact recount of them, but they consisted of him trying to convince her to meet up with him and just the usual things you would expect from a creep online. According to him, he was 19, tall, and blonde with soulful blue eyes. Once I saw the texts, I asked if she had a picture of him. Something did not sit right with me after seeing the messages. She showed me what he looked like and he was very clearly not 19. This man was at least 40 and looked like he lived in his mother's basement. That night, we got a call from him. Sally answered without hesitation, and when I heard the voice on the other end of the call, I felt like I was going to be sick. You're so pretty. Why don't you come meet me? Sally said that she couldn't because she was spending the night with a friend. The mention of that sparked his interest, and then he proceeded to try and ask us both to meet him. Sally, lacking any common sense, said yes thus begun her plan for us to sneak out and walk 15 blocks to meet him in a deserted McDonald's parking lot. I did not want to go, 
I was raised on stories of what happens to teen girls who meet random men from the internet in person. But after adamant pleading from Sally that she didn't feel safe going by herself, I agreed. We took our phones with us for the walk. I had a kitchen knife hidden on me in case something were to happen and I needed to defend myself. The route that we had to take to get there didn't have very many street lamps and there weren't any houses. We were surrounded by trees on both sides of us. When we got to the parking lot, the only car parked nearby was a black beat up 2000 Toyota Corolla. The car was still running when we got there and from what we could tell there was more than just one person inside. The man from the picture got out of the front passenger seat and left the door open behind him before approaching us. I turned my flash on so I could see, and he was obviously on something. I can't tell you what it was, but his eyes were so wide, they looked like they were about to pop out of his head. He was jittery and kept twitching. I became very conscious of how big he was, maybe six foot two, around 280 pounds. For reference, my friend and I did not look our ages, even without makeup. I'm about 5'2", and my friend was taller, probably around 5'6", but we were both significantly smaller than this man. He reached out for us and caught my friend by the arm. I went to get my knife as quickly as I could, and that's when I saw his friends getting out of the car. He invited us back to his car and offered us booze and drugs, but after seeing my knife and that I was ready to call the police, he released my friend. I took Sally's arm and ran faster than I ever had in my life. We took the long way home to avoid them finding out where she lived in case they were following us. Once we got there, her family was still sound asleep. We locked all the doors, closed the blinds, and blocked him on everything. There wouldn't be any sleeping that night. We were constantly peeking out the window, and to our dismay, that same Toyota was circling around her apartment building. Not once, not twice, but three times. I never mentioned any of this to my parents out of fear of getting grounded or in some kind of trouble. I'm 16 now, and they still have no idea. I still get nervous when I see a car similar to the one from that night. As for Sally, her parents never found out either. We agreed to never speak about it again. Thankfully, she moved into a new house just a few weeks after that happened. It's safe to say that Sally and I haven't spoken in years. She was upset at me for ruining her night, and our friendship did not last long after that. We had a pretty bad falling out, but looking back on it now, it was definitely for the better. Who knows what would have happened if I wasn't with her that night? And who knows what those men were truly planning? This happened on Halloween of 2019. My friends and I were feeling the spooky vibes of the month and wanted to do something fun and exciting to satisfy our thirst. Being the dumb college kids that we were, we decided on exploring somewhere allegedly haunted in the hopes of seeing some genuine paranormal activity. Since we're from Illinois, the popular destination of Bachelors Grove Cemetery immediately came to mind and it was settled upon. Once the sun had set and the night had fallen, we would make our move, sneaking into the cemetery after it had closed to get the full experience without having to worry about any other visitors. I must admit, I always wanted to do something like this before, but I was genuinely afraid of what might be waiting for us in that cemetery so late at night. Stories always circulated around the various apparitions people have encountered before, the different sounds that chilled them to the bone, and so on. All of this was festering inside of me well before we actually started driving over to the cemetery sometime in the evening. It was a pleasantly long drive, but I wasn't really in the mood to think about anything else except for the potential horrors that roamed the cemetery for all of eternity, or so they say. Couple in the fact that we were going to be trespassing in order to get through in the first place, and I was a nervous wreck. My friends were apparently doing a much better job at keeping their fears in check though. For the sake of the story, I will call them Logan, Eddie, and Paul. The entire car ride there, they were laughing and joking around, 
not worried about what we would be getting into or what we might see. Looking back at the whole situation, I should have known that their optimism was a bad sign. No way would we have been able to explore this place without them being the slightest bit nervous. But what's done is done. A little past seven, once night had finally fallen for real and darkness went on in every direction, for as far as the eye could see, we arrived. Parking in the main parking lot was out of the question because we did some looking into it and found that in previous years, local law enforcement liked to wait there and catch any would-be explorers before they could even get inside. So we had a backup plan. Since the actual cemetery was located in the center of a dense forest on all sides, essentially forming a square where all the roads would go around it, we were to park at some restaurant that was open super late and had a huge parking lot. All the way in the back, furthest away from the restaurant itself, and closest to the road. This was in the exact opposite direction from the front entrance of the cemetery, so we figured this was our best chance of getting in while avoiding any cops in our way. From there, we would cross the street on foot and have a bit of a walk before arriving at a somewhat hidden path leading into the forest. Taking this back path would take a bit more time to get to the actual cemetery itself, since these trees were particularly thick and dense but it was well worth it when considering the alternative. After everything was said and done, we found ourselves beginning our trek onto the path, unsure of how far we had actually have to go before we would find what we were looking for. It was a windy night, and even though it wasn't especially cold or anything, I still remember my teeth chattering and my skin going cold. Aside from the occasional sound of leaves being crunched under our shoes as we walked, there was absolute silence. My once cheerful and energetic friends were now, all of a sudden, quiet and subdued. Logan, in particular, had this odd expression on his face, it being illuminated by my phone's flashlight as we walked. It was some sort of cross between fear and pain, like every step he took was causing him physical harm. Before I could question him about it, we found ourselves at our destination. Here we were, in the heart of Bachelor's Grove, with graves all around us, and a certain chill in the air. Everyone split up to cover more ground, promising to call the others over if they were to encounter something. I didn't want us to go too far away from one another, but I also didn't want to seem like a wuss, so I kept my mouth shut and began exploring. Most of the graves I looked at had withered away from time and the elements, so I couldn't really make out anything that was on the tombstones. The few dates that I could read went back to the late 1800s, and a sinking feeling in my stomach started once I realized these people had been dead and decaying in the ground for over 100 years now. Feeling extremely uncomfortable with this realization, I began to back away from the graves and started to look for my friends to see if they had found anything supernatural yet, when all of a sudden, I heard it. Not just me, either. All of us did. It was low, almost unnoticeable if you weren't paying attention, but with the way our senses were heightened, there was no way we would miss it. It appeared to be some sort of chanting, and it sounded like it was coming a little bit north from our direction, further into the clearing. I couldn't make out any of the words being spoken, or if it was even English, but there was something creepy about the tone like it was religious, and the chanting was some sort of prayer. The voice that was doing the chanting was deep and gravely, belonging to some man that we couldn't see. The four of us shined our lights on each other to see our expressions, and at that moment, we knew what we were going to do. Despite every fiber in my being telling me not to go any further and see what the source of this chanting was, my curiosity got the better of me, and I could not resist. Eddie whispered to us to turn our lights off completely while he dimmed his just enough to where it wouldn't attract too much attention, but we would still be able to see with it. The next few moments we spent creeping towards the noise, the more and more I started to lose it. My breathing was uncontrollable, and it felt like my heart was beating a million miles an hour. I was so afraid of what we would find, and yet, I still had to know. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, we had entered the clearing and were a mere few steps away from the chanting. 
Eddie shined his light in the direction ahead of us, and for just a brief moment, we saw a cloaked figure bent over something in the grass, still chanting in that unrecognizable language. The thing in the grass looked like some sort of circle with a mark in the center. And I swear, I wish I could tell you I'm lying about this, but when I realized what the symbol was, I felt like throwing up. There was no mistake. It was a pentagram, made of some strange material. For the moment that Eddie had illuminated the site in front of us, I had been able to get a glimpse of the pentagram's material being bright red, and I shouldn't have to say any more about that. Once the light from Eddie's phone hit the back of the man's head, he immediately stopped chanting and stood up, still facing the direction of the pentagram. I can only describe the next few minutes as truly, unadulterated terror, because before we knew it, he screamed a blood-curdling scream that rattled us to the core and turned around beginning to sprint towards us. Everything happened so fast, I couldn't even make out the man's facial features except for deep, sunken eyes and an expression that radiated pure hatred. He really did want to bring us harm. Not wasting any time, we all fled the direction we came from and ran faster than I think any of us had ever ran in our entire lives. I couldn't even scream while running away. I was too petrified to make any noise. Maybe it was a miracle, but we somehow managed to retrace our steps all the way through the path we took to enter the cemetery and forest, and eventually came out to the main road, which was devoid of any traffic for the time being. Afraid of what I would see if I looked back, I made a beeline to the car, along with the others, and hopped into the back seat, not wasting any time to lock the door and roll up the window. We peeled out of there in no time flat and did not stop driving 20 over the speed limit until we were at least 10 minutes away. I honestly have no idea how far or for how long that man chased us, but I do know this for sure. We were not supposed to be there that night, and we must have been interrupting something important. I'll never know what it was, and honestly, I hope I never find out. We never did talk about this experience again after that night and we never went on another trip to somewhere abandoned or haunted ever again either. I think that fright we felt is enough to satisfy us for the rest of our lives, and I'm thankful beyond words that we all managed to get out together alive. In 2015, I managed to land my dream job as a manager of this really old, rustic pub. It was the kind with stained glass windows, ornate bar fixtures, the works. But it was bought up by this big brewery company not long after, and they ended up cleaning house. So within six months of getting my dream job, I had lost it again. I was desperate. I had rent and bills to pay, so I was ready to work just about anywhere doing just about anything, for any money at all. So I ended up getting a job in this 24-hour off-license in the middle of town, and it was my job to work the night shift, 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. This place was really busy, too. Had a cash machine inside, sold really expensive bottles of premium booze, and was mostly a cash business. It was the place that pretty much every single person who went out to drink and wanted to carry on drinking when the bars closed would stop off to pick up a few bottles before they got a taxi home. So I am not messing around when I say we sometimes had like $7,000 in cash on site by the end of the busiest part of the night shift. And well, I say we, I mean me, as I worked that shift entirely alone. So it's Sunday morning about 5 a.m., and it's just before Christmas. The off-license had been extremely busy that night, and we had way, way more than just $7,000 on site, like it had been Black Friday, which in the UK means it was the last Friday before Christmas. So all the office parties had been in town, spending it up, and they pretty much all wanted booze to go home with, too. There were queues going out the door at one point, seriously. It was one of the busiest shifts I'd ever worked, including in pubs. So by the time it started to quiet down, I was ready to collapse. I remember just sort of resting my head on the counter at one point, thinking I could have actually fallen asleep right then and there. Then, 
I hear the little beep of the door opening, and although I would rather have flushed my head down the toilet than served another drunk customer at that point, I get ready to serve one more person. I look up, and in front of me is this guy that seems alarmingly sober. Like almost everyone who walked in during those Saturday night shifts was rotten drunk, eyes all glazed over and bloodshot, slurring their words. But this guy is shockingly lucid, which was dead weird. He also keeps his hands in his jacket pockets the whole time he's talking, but it gets even weirder when he greets me by name. I thought he might have known me and I just didn't recognize him, so I remain polite and say something like, Yeah, that's me. How do you know that? Then he once again refers to me by name and follows up by telling me where I live. Again, I'm like, uh, how do you know that? Only this time, I'm thinking that this could be a plain clothes policeman or something, and I've done something wrong, like accidentally sold a bottle of booze to someone under 18, maybe even failed one of those underage tests that the police try on occasion to catch businesses out. Then, he starts asking about my mom, and then refers to her by name, and asks about my sister, again, knowing her name too. He asks me if they're still living at such and such address, then gives their exact street address. I then apologize and tell him that I just didn't recognize him, figuring that he was an old family friend or something that I had forgotten all about, but something about him is creeping me out all the same. He didn't once take his hands out of his jacket pockets, like to the point it was getting sort of odd. People talk with their hands all the time, and this guy's hands were like wedged into those front pockets on his jacket. That's when these other guys walked in, who also seemed weirdly sober. They were quiet and deliberate in their movements, just pacing towards the counter and flanking the guy who seemed to know a little bit too much about me. Then really politely, the guy who seemed to know all about where I lived and where my family lived, asks me if there's a toilet in the back of the shop. I told him there was, and he tells me to walk back into it, lock the door, and not come out for at least half an hour. And just to make it clear that he's not really asking me, he shows me that he's holding something inside of his jacket. Something heavy. Only then do I realize what's happening. They proceed to take all the CCTV USB sticks, wreck the monitors, break into the safe, rinse the tills, empty the shelves of all the premium spirits. I mean they absolutely robbed the place blind. All the while, I just sat in the back on the toilet, wondering how that guy knew where I lived or where my family lived. As they were leaving, I heard footsteps walking up to the toilet door, and I started shaking, hard. Then I hear this voice telling me that I did the right thing for the sake of my family and that all of the stuff they had taken was insured, that no one but the insurance companies would lose a penny and it was them who were the real thieves anyway. I ended up telling the police that I didn't get a good look at the guy's face, that I wanted to help them, but that I just couldn't. I told them it all happened really fast, and that they must have been professionals because I didn't even get a chance to hit the alarm behind the counter. They must have gotten away with like 10 grand, all in all, and it didn't even take an hour for them to do it, more like 15 or 20 minutes and they had managed to make sure that the one person capable of identifying them wouldn't say a thing to anyone about it. Like I can't even tell you how frightening it was that they had managed to work out where my mom and sister lived. People who put that kind of work into criminality, they really are not to be messed with. And besides, it's just stuff. Just material stuff. It's not worth losing your life over, and it's certainly not worth risking your family's safety over. No amount of money compares to the safety of your family. This story takes place in a pretty popular suburban area of Eastern Pennsylvania. I have very little experience with bad people, even though my neighborhood and the ones around it frequently are made fun of for being so dangerous. I never understood why we received such a bad track record until the other night. 
I am a 17-year-old teenager, and I live with my family in a one-story house. I have three windows in my bedroom, one right above my head, which usually shines a glare on my television during the day. I have been so caught up recently with online school, work, and personal time that I need time to relax. Because of this, my sleep schedule has been severely destroyed. I am up very late, 4 to 5 a.m., and only getting an hour or two of sleep for school. But during this time, I like to crack my window open and listen to the cars go by on the busy road behind my backyard. I use it as a way of meditation, listening to the faint sound of a car in the distance, and then the gradual escalation in the volume of the car until it passes by and starts to settle again. It's very soothing. But this night, as I lay down, pondering about my life, I hear something else. As a car just finished going by, I hear some light rustling. I was confused, because it was very late for a squirrel or anything of this sort, and nobody in my family is up to let the dog out. I put it aside and made up an excuse. I start to forget about the noise and listen again, but I hear the rustling again, even louder this time. It was footsteps. I listen as they are slowly making their way through the dark night. I then realized how much louder they were, and suddenly I start to panic. My thoughts started to race, but then I start to hear a car. It gradually increases in volume, and then it passes my house, escaping into the night. I listened closely, but I did not hear anything. I waited for a few minutes and decided to take a look outside. I sat up in bed and got on my knees to peek outside. I didn't see anything. I then started to almost laugh at myself for thinking it was something else. I was dead wrong. As I sit there, I see my gate, which connects the grassy side of the busy street to my backyard, was open. Not wide, but about halfway. It was not windy, even though it tends to be in this area. I got up from bed and as I turned around to head to my door, I hear, Psst. I froze. I was so scared in this moment, my thoughts were racing. I jolted my head back at the window, and with the light of my television aiding my vision, I saw an older man smiling in at me with a horrible look on his face. The man said, Hey kid, I need to call a ride. I got lost. Can you let me in? And just as he finished his sentence, I bolted out of my room yelling, Dad! I threw on my shoes and grabbed the biggest kitchen knife I could find, while my dad ran into the kitchen to find me. I told him what happened, and we both ran outside. We went to the backyard, and we did not see him, but I noticed the back gate was closed a little bit more than before. I told my dad, and we went over to the gate, and at this point, my other brothers joined us as well. We walked through and looked onto the large road and we saw a man sitting under a streetlight about 70 yards down the road. He started waving, which made my dad angry, but we weren't going to chase him in the dark. Who knows if he had a weapon on him or not. That's the end though, at least I hope. I went out today with my dad to buy some curtains, just to help with my newfound anxiety. I hope I never see this man again, and I hope that was his first and last time visiting. All I know is, I will not be opening my window at night for a long, long time. My name is Rory, and I'm a security guard here in Scotland. The company I work for mainly does nightclubs and construction site security. But for some reason, I always end up getting the weirder jobs. But that suits me, because they tend to be in the daytime, and I am just not cut out for night shifts anymore. Anyway, so my boss asks me if I wanted to work a Saturday shift over at the Mercure Hotel in Livingston. Told me it would be a solid 10-hour shift, providing security for a convention they had on. Easy money, basically. I asked him what kind of convention needed security guards, but all he knew is that it was called Scotiacon. There were no clues in the name, so needless to say, I was a bit curious about what the whole thing was. Turns out, 
it was a big meetup for people called furries. What I'm about to tell you is all learned on the fly, so don't hold me to any of this. But furries are basically people who think they are animals, so they dress up in these big suits and wiggle their behinds. Don't get me wrong, they all seemed lovely, but the whole thing was kind of unusual. They were selling each other all kinds of artwork, clothes they had made. Some of it seemed a bit inappropriate, but there were no kids there, so no harm done, right? Like I said, lovely people, but there was one person who I would call an exception. There were a good few hundred people there, a lot of younger people too, hardly the kind of thing I picture when I hear the word convention. They didn't seem too leery or anything, there was just a lot of them, hence why I was there, but I really didn't see anything kicking off. So, when I got the call that the security team was needed in the main convention hall, I was shocked. I'll be honest. So, I am following this other guy that I had not worked with before down a corridor and into the main hall, and immediately you can see where the trouble is. Everyone is looking over into one particular corner where you can hear this argument going on. My colleagues and I make our way through the crowds of oddly dressed but well-meaning folk until we came across the culprits. Most of the noise was coming from one guy with a dog collar on. He had ears on, all sorts of dog-themed stuff on his backpack and clothing. Basically, dogs were the kid's thing. I start asking what the big song and dance is about, and he told me he had been arguing with this stall owner over the price of a piece of artwork, but the guy that owns the stall just wants him out, says he's been threatening him, all this other stuff. All I do is try and separate them. I can't really be throwing people out, but this guy's causing trouble, so I start trying to move him away. At first, the dog boy seems like he's just going to walk away, but suddenly, he doubles back and throws a kick at the guy's stall. Not just that, but he seriously starts barking at this guy, like really loud, rough, 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 rough. It was intense, man. Naturally, I then go to grip him, and the kid actually bites me. I went to throw an arm around his neck to get control over him, but he just caught my arm and sank his teeth into it. Now luckily, I'm wearing my branded security jacket, and the fabric is just tough and plasticky enough to have this guy's jaw grip slip off the meat of my arm. But man, if he had gotten a grip on me, I might have had a chunk bitten off. The guy was near rabid. As the other security guys are dragging him off, I can see him trying to bite him, but I can hear this noise too and it actually took a second for the penny to drop that it was the sound of his teeth clapping together, like this sharp snap 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 sound. Honestly, it was really scary. I get my arm looked at by the medics. Police turn up and take the guy away. Definitely the most eventful thing that happened. The rest of it was kinda boring after the initial furry shock. Nice people though. I wouldn't mind going back. I may not be any kind of expert, but I believe there's more to this world than we mere humans can hope to understand. I have always had a very fine-tuned sense for what I believe to be those unexplainable things. Moments where I feel... something. Something I can't quite explain with any rationality. Later in life, I would be told to have what can most easily be explained as some kind of weak psychic or supernatural energy by a Wiccan witch. Nothing too impressive, but just enough to let me feel those entities even if I cannot see them, like the ghost in my grandparents' guest room, or the malicious entity haunting the stairs in basement garage. The same uncanny sixth sense that my mom observed when my younger brother was born, stronger than her own maternal sense, to the point that I understood when my brother needed something before even he knew and could make a sound even waking minutes before him in the middle of the night, without fail. But I think there may be more to it than that, as this incident leads me to believe. My family had recently moved to British Columbia, Canada, that winter. I was 10 at the time. 
While we were no means in the boonies, we moved to an older trailer near a well-known hiking trail and a small Christmas tree farm. Immediately, there was something off about the area. Something that my parents waved off as the new home anxiety, or just not being used to the place. I did my best to put it out of my mind, but within two weeks of the move, I began to notice strange happenings. Firstly, the unsettling aura I just couldn't shake. Sleepless nights, where I felt like I was being watched by someone at my window. Strange shadows, there one second, gone the next. Voices, soft, whispering my name, and only when I was alone and only in my room, near the window. However, whenever these incidents happened, soon after I would feel something brushing against my shins and ankles, something that lessened the aura, at least for a while. These instances would be near constant until I struck out on my own eight years later. It all came to a head that fall, months after the move. My parents insisted we take a family walk on the mountain trail, and though I didn't want to because I am by no means an outdoors man, something in me screamed not to go, that it was dangerous. But being barely 11, of course my parents completely dismissed my concerns as being lazy, and we were off to the trail's main entrance. As soon as I set foot out of the car, the warning bells in my head were blaring louder. Something in me kept saying that we had to leave, that something bad was going to happen. The little voice in my head kept focusing on my diabetic mom, who at the time had a weight problem. Dad with his disability that made him outright unable to run, that my bad lungs would make it impossible to run myself, that the three of us were sitting ducks. I didn't know why I was so hyper-focused on running, on needing to get away. We were halfway through the walk when suddenly, I froze. The apprehension I had felt about the whole event ramped up to 11. My parents thought that I had stopped because I was tired and took the opportunity to take pictures of the lovely fall leaves and dappled sunlight. It was a gorgeous sight, but I knew something was there, watching us, and it was not something we wanted to meet. I looked around, trying to find whatever was setting me off, all I saw was an occasional fleeting shadow. I could feel the brushing, but the feeling of dread and fear only got stronger, the familiar touch unable to drive it away as it normally would. Whatever it was, it was close. If it came at us, we wouldn't stand a chance. My parents still hadn't noticed something was wrong, and I felt my voice catch in my throat, not out of fear, but as if something wasn't letting me speak. I heard the leaves rustle. It was close. So close. I glanced where the noise was coming from and saw a shadow for a split second before it vanished behind a tree. And as it vanished, something changed. Hot. It felt like a volcano had erupted in my chest. Not like the slow, gentle ooze like one might see in Hawaii, but explosive, angry spewing burning clouds of toxic gas and ash, spraying molten rock and fire. I was still afraid, but I wasn't frozen. I was angry, eyes locked on the area I had seen the shadow. I was no stranger to anger. I am aggressive and always have been, but this rage was entirely new. The feeling against my legs stopped, but the fire was burning hotter, and the thing the dangerous thing hiding just outside my field of view. I felt it lock up in fear, all its own. I felt like my body was controlled by something else. Still me, but different. I convinced my parents to pick up the pace, practically speed walking to the rest of the loop, not daring to let the fire sparked in my chest die out until we were safely back at the car. The strange presence lingered, much further off, but still watching still malicious, but almost curious now. We left the trail and never went back. A few weeks later, my mom found out she would be having my brother. As time passed, the whole incident kept nagging at my mind, and I found myself doing research from time to time to try and piece whatever happened together, and while I may never fully understand, 
I think I finally have part of an answer. I think I was protecting my brother. As I stated earlier, I have always had an unexplainable connection to him, despite being so much older, and a terrifyingly vicious protective streak over him. When this happened, my mom would have been a month or so into her pregnancy. I think that whatever is in me that allows me to feel these presences so clearly, that was so immediately focused on not me getting away, but my mom and dad, with myself as the afterthought, knew he was there long before anyone else did. The Phantom Touches? As ridiculous as I feel saying it, I believe it was a guardian angel of sorts. Or, more accurately, my protective, than long dead, childhood cat, keeping up his station, even in death. The brushing feeling was identical to the feel of a cat weaving around your legs, and only stopped entirely when I moved out, and got my own kitten, who just as suddenly and uncharacteristically adopted the same guarding behavior. What that fire is, I may never know, but I know for a fact it is what kept that thing away. What was that thing? I don't know. I believe it had been hunting me, and continued to hunt me since we moved to that town, and until I moved away. The voices, the feeling of being watched, the fear of fire. While I know the creatures will stalk their desired prey for a long time, that thing always comes back whenever I visit my family. Regardless of what it is, it is fixated on me. It seems I am safe so long as I have this fire, at least from it. But I wonder, why after so many years it still follows me, whenever I enter what must be its territory, remembering that feeling of malice. I pray I never have to find out. Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear, and such. So yeah, my parents were legitimately afraid for me and were against the idea. I had to lie to them that we would stay in a hotel near Koja National Park so they would get off my back. Obviously, that's not what we did. Okay, long story short, we had to travel from Bucharest to this park, which is around 200 kilometers in two hours by train. We got our immense backpacks, everything we needed, and went on our way. Nothing specifically happened in the train except the fact that the train was overly crowded with the exception of our train compartment being completely empty. That is extremely rare for Romanian trains. I got excited thinking that we would have the whole compartment to ourselves. As I said, it is a very rare thing to happen. And of course, after 10 to 20 minutes, it got occupied by a man entering our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful German Shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats and dogs in particular. I usually find my way around all animals, even those that don't like people. Not this dog. No. This dog was otherworldly. He looked so stiff, as if it was a stuffed animal. He would listen to his owner's every single command. I was impressed by it, obviously. I start asking the man about his dog, since it would be a long and awkward trip to be in complete silence. The man was exactly like his dog, except the commands he would give to his dog. No other contribution to the conversation. He told me the dog's name is Yuchi Gashol, which in Romanian means the killer. It's a very weird name to give a dog because, for this particular example, he would use the English word as it is, not translate to the word Romanian and name the dog like that. But I thought, to each their own. I asked him, why such a scary name? And he bluntly replied, This dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing he likes and is good at. Now, I personally consider that the dog will grow up to have similar personality to his owner. And most of the time, I would judge people with dogs and how the animal reacts to the world and to his owner. And let me tell you guys, these two did not give a good vibe in return. I brushed everything over thinking to myself that maybe this guy is training his dog to hunt in the woods. Then I started thinking 
which woods are legal to hunt in our country. While I was thinking of that, the guy, out of nowhere, asks us if we are traveling to the Koja National Park. That was surprisingly accurate considering that the only time we mentioned the place was in the train station long before we found our seats and way longer before we even met this man. Again, I thought it was nothing because, in my country, people who happen to go in the same direction will try to make small talk and guess where you are heading. Of course, you can just lie to keep safe of your destination, or be honest. I took the honesty route, and I am judging myself for that. Never be too honest with strangers, or honest at all, if you listen to this story. We confirmed we are going to that place, asked what else is to see around, since he started talking about the area, and well, considering we knew nothing about the place, we took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, the animals we can encounter, told us about the beautiful monastery right at the bottom of the mountain that we need to climb, advised us to visit the Lotri Shore waterfall and explore the caves behind it and try out the local restaurant. When this guy started talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed as if he was experiencing a pleasant memory, but he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck. Squeezing it tight, the collar made a loud clink sound. What surprised me was that the dog made no move, no whimper, no twitch, nothing. Just like a stuffed animal. Anyway, we reach our destination, say our goodbyes, the man waves at us, and we faced against him to go on our way. I turn around back right away because I wanted to ask where exactly the restaurant was, and the man and the dog were no longer there. Not just that, but also his luggage was gone. That creeped me out a bit, but who cares? We were too thrilled for our first camping experience. We start walking with our backpacks on us and reach a tunnel digging into the mountain. It looked amazing, exactly like those horror movie tunnels which, if traveled during night, would make your hair stand straight. Lucky for me, we traveled during daytime. It wasn't a long tunnel. We could see the end, but by the time we got to the middle of it, we hear a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog crying in desperation for its life. We stop. My boyfriend looks at me with his, oh no, you're not going to take that dog with us, type of face, and tries to convince me to take a different route. We don't. I hear the dog. I go right towards the sound, and in the middle of the road I see a chubby puppy with lots of white and brown circles on his butt crying so hard and laying on the cement looking really hurt, as if hit by a car. I freeze and think to myself that our trip is over. I must save this dog. We call for him. He looks at us, pointy ears up, gets up, and like a doofus, starts running desperately to us. He was alone and afraid. We called him Rudolph, and now he was our camping buddy. Like one kilometer further, we find another puppy, probably his sister, which we dragged from the nearby river, all wet, cold, and hungry. Of course, we take her, too. So here we are, 10 kilogram backpacks each, two puppies at my chest, boyfriend with map, trying to find a spot to camp the first night. We pass by the monastery the man in the train mentioned, but because we had these puppies, we couldn't enter inside the building. The priests wouldn't allow us, so we just walk around the property, through the gardens, until we reached the base of the mountain we had to climb. I'd like to mention that these puppies were two tiny little brats, because the second you put them down and forced them to walk on their own, they would slam their butts to the ground and cry. Such drama. We walk, and walk, and walk, until we decide to stop because it was getting late, and I was beginning to get cold. We found a spot next to a small landmark type of cottage in the middle of the wood, we call it Troy Unitsa. It's like a scouting post, but for the church, where they place religious icons or a Bible, stuff like that, inside to bring good energy to the area. It belongs to the church. It wasn't like a house. It was basically a roof with four small walls and an opening, not a door. You could go in to, like, hide from the rain. There was an icon inside and a Bible with pages ripped from it. Curious as I am, I opened the Bible, was really annoyed to see that people would write down their names in it, like couples do on trees. 
but on one particular page the words, I will find you, stuck out. It was written in red ink. Again, I thought to myself that it was probably someone who wanted to scare travelers with silly messages. I put the book back and gave it no second thought. We put up the tent, make the fire, unpack, make food, and eat. We feed the puppies which now are cuddled up in our tent, and finally darkness starts to rise all around us. My boyfriend always kept the fire up every hour, because when it went off, it felt as if the sounds in the woods were louder and closer to us than in reality. Now it's around 12 a.m. We are all in the tent, cuddling to keep warm. The puppies wake up and start crying. I get up and unzip the tent to put them out to pee. They do, and I get them back in. They cry some more, and the smallest one starts shivering. At the same time, I hear grunting from behind our tent. My boyfriend is up too. He hears it as well. The fire is fading. The moment he unzips the tent and steps out, the sound disappears into the woods. It sounds like a snake slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground, but with unimaginable speed. I ask him, was that a snake? He says, up to this day, that he cannot explain what he saw. He says it was a slithery figure with feet that made a snort-like sound when the light hit it. The puppies calm back down after this creature disappears into the woods. We try to go back to sleep after we reignite the fire. It's 3 a.m. by this time and we wake up to the puppies being fussy again. The fire is nearly dead. My boyfriend gets up to search for firewood and I get out as well. I stare into the darkness and I swear, I hear whispers coming from between the trees. I look up at the sky, consider it's 3 a.m., and hear birds being very loud and fluttering their wings. Now I'm no expert in birds, but don't they usually sleep around this time? Well, these weren't. They were very active, very vocal, and very frustrated. I look at the fire and follow the red sparks popping out of it into the sky and become fascinated with something. The spark doesn't seem to die. It goes on and on, changing color from hellish red to green. This was very out of the ordinary for me because it created an illusion hard to explain. It looked as if the fire sparks were going into the woods, creating a track for me probably to follow. I kept looking after each spark to see when it burns out. None of them did. They would levitate, turn green, and flow into the woods. At that moment I began to get goosebumps on my skin, the birds being agitated, the mysterious light pointing us to go deeper into the woods, and all the trees around us have eyes on them. The trunks had a distinguished shape that looked exactly like eyes. I know this is nothing paranormal since someone explained that those shapes form when a branch is ripped from the root, and that's the shape that is left over. But there were way too many, like a hundred eyes all looking at the exact spot we were camping, having only that religious tiny landmark to mentally protect us. And as I inspect my surroundings, I hear movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, like ten meters away from us. Obviously, I stand my ground, but don't go near it. Suddenly, a dark, bent-over silhouette comes out of it and, half inside the bush and half outside, stares at us. I call my boyfriend and we are both like, what the heck is that? Is it a bear cub? A wolf? A pig? The creature shakes its head the same way a dog does after a bath, and I hear a distinguished clink like a dog collar. At this time, my boyfriend manages to light up the fire really big, which scares this animal to run back into the woods, through the bush from which it initially came out of. That calms us down, but not enough to ever close our eyes again during that night. Going back into the tent, my boyfriend falls asleep. The puppies are sound asleep, but not me. I keep the zipper on the tent opened a little, just enough to have my eye peek through it, right at the early mentioned bush. I think I spent a solid hour staring and falling asleep to that bush. All of a sudden, I hear a noise coming from that direction, and I immediately wake my boyfriend up, who is now peeking through the hole, in complete darkness with me. What we see next still haunts my dreams.
From that exact same bush, we see a human head popping out and looking towards our tent. Note that our peeping hole was small enough to not make it look like you were being watched from the inside of the tent. This head is slowly coming out of the bush, skin so white we thought it was a ghost. After that, a shoulder, another shoulder, a full torso, a leg, bit by bit an entire man emerges from the bush, completely naked, lighted by both the moon and our fire. What he did next was excruciatingly scary for me. He comes so close to our tent and begins to remove branches, rocks, etc. from our fire, basically extinguishing our fire by dismantling it. This all happening like two or three meters from our tent. I look at the man with horror because I recognize him and now the clink I heard earlier from that animal is explained. It is the same man from the train with his dog too. I don't know if he followed us. I don't know if he just went the same route as us and found us and decided to stalk us. But this guy was there since 12 a.m. at least because our fire would be dead every two to three hours and we would be woken up by the sound of branches being cracked, rocks being moved, which we internally explained as animals crossing the land. After he successfully managed to put out our fire, he slowly crept back into the same bush, submerging into it bit by bit until only his head would be out with a disfigured looking mouth, looking like a moaning ghost. You try going back to sleep after that. We didn't know what to do, so we just got back out, reignited the fire, light ourselves some torches, and stay near the campfire until the first rays of sun came up. I admit I did fall asleep while sitting down next to the fire, and so did my boyfriend. But any sound would wake us up. I was too afraid to go near that bush. I did not need any answers, any explanations. I just wanted daylight to get the heck out of there. And we did. We packed our stuff and we got out of there. We planned a four day camping trip and this experience made us give up after the first night. It was a risk we did not intend to take. If that guy followed us or it was just a coincidence, it was enough to ruin it all. As a conclusion to my story and advice to any first time campers out there, never tell your location or even areas remotely close to your destination to strangers. You don't know where their minds take them and what they plan to do. Always stay safe. Always be aware of your surroundings and any changes that come to you under the form of sounds, movements, changes of temperature, and so on. Always protect yourself. Many years ago, when I was young and fit, I was out exercising before dawn. Our local cemetery was high on a hill, and I would walk up the hill, then jog all around the concrete and gravel roads that wound in and around the graves. I had done this many prior mornings, and I was not afraid of being in the graveyard pre-daylight. I had family and friends buried there. It was isolated, and I felt safe. One of the individuals interred there was a little girl named Kay. Kay was only 12 and starting junior high when an impatient idiot behind the wheel of a car killed her. On my frequent runs past Kay's well-kept grave, I often greeted her, wished her well, expressed my sorrow regarding her short, sweet life. On this particular morning of which I speak, I jogged past Kay's grave and called out my greeting. In my head, she spoke urgently to me. It's not safe up here this morning. I jogged on, a bit startled. Of course, I glanced about, but all was normal. A few minutes later, Kay spoke again. There's a man up here. This time I stopped. Suddenly the dark hilltop seemed fraught with danger. My blood ran cold and the hair on the back of my neck stood up, were no longer cliches. Still, I saw nothing. No man. No movement. But by now, every nerve in my body was screaming for me to get out of there. I turned and ran, 
It was no longer a casual morning jog. It was a sprint for my life. I ran past Kay's grave and back down the steep hill, caring not that my quadriceps complained. As I fled, I listened for any pursuers, and I heard none. But that did not lessen the overwhelming sense of peril that kept me running hard, even after I exited the steep part of my route. The rest of that day, and even the remainder of the week, I listened for news of an escaped convict, a murderous madman, or anything that would explain Kay's urgent warning. But there was none. I had no doubt then, nor do I many years later, that I was in peril that morning. From whom, I do not know. But fifteen years have passed, and I can still recall with crystal clarity those two sentences from a poor child put much too early in her grave. It's not safe up here this morning. There's a man up here. Thank you, sweet Kay, for warning me. So let me start this by saying, we made some poor choices in this story, so please don't judge me and my family. Around every start to the summer, my family and I go on a three-week vacation around the USA. It's always a blast, and I have very fond memories of the trips, but I will always be more alert next time we do it. We were more than halfway done with our vacation, so we had to head home. That meant that we had to go through the whole state of Texas. My dad wanted to drive through the night instead of stopping, so I got some rest. I woke up around the middle of the night and noticed the car had stopped moving. I sleepily rose from where I was sitting and looked out the dash window. I saw my dad standing next to a random guy under the hood of said guy's car. Now I thought no big deal until something caught my eye. There was a ditch beside the road and in the ditch, barely, just barely, I could see the top of a couple more guys' heads and they were holding something. My blood ran cold. I had to warn my dad, because I don't think that he had seen them. He had his back to them. I thought quickly and kicked my door open and yelled, Hey, Dad! It fell out of its holster again, and I don't want to touch it. This was a lie, of course, that I just made up to make them think we were holding. Both the man and my dad looked confused. I waited for my dad to come to where I was. I then explained the situation, and for the first time in my life, he looked scared. He finally turned and said to the man that he was going to move his car closer. The man said that was fine, and he jumped back in the car. My dad floored it down the road that was not blocked by this person's car. We did notice a car's headlight in our back window, but after a while it disappeared. We drove the rest of the night, and in the morning, we weren't tired at all. We made it home safe, and I did a little research for that area. It turned out that a few months before, a couple were kidnapped and are still missing. I have no idea if what happened to those poor people could have happened to my dad and our family if I did not see those men crouched in the ditch. I deliver pizzas, and I had been having a really busy night, non-stop back and forth, without any time to even pause and take a leak. I had been so busy that I wasn't really thinking about bathroom breaks, but we were also going through a bit of a heat wave in our area, so I have been drinking copious amounts of water. All of a sudden, as I was driving to this particular delivery, the urge to go hit me, like things went from zero to sixty in an instant. Thankfully, I was close to the customer, so I could get this one over with quickly. Or so I thought. I pulled up to the house, and it was an area I had delivered in before, so I could immediately see that something wasn't right. All the lights were off in the house, not even the glow of a television or anything. It was extra apparent because the streetlight closest to the door happened to be out of order, and on top of it all, the block was dead quiet. This is a big university area, and obviously there aren't many student renters in July, but there had to be at least one person, because someone ordered this pizza. 
Maybe they just liked sitting in the dark, or they were in the backyard. Whatever. I just didn't want to get out of my car and knock on a quiet house in the middle of the night without first checking that I had the correct address and the customer was inside. It was scorching that night, even after sundown. My car's AC is a joke, and the piping hot pizzas don't help things much. So I have to try and open the car door as infrequently as possible to keep any cool air in. I called the number the customer provided, and the voice on the other end said, kind of brusquely and out of breath, Yeah? I just tried to keep it clear and concise. Hey, it's your pizza out front, but there doesn't appear to be anybody home. And the customer replied, still gasping for air. Yeah, I'm not at home. I had to pee so badly by that point that I was much less patient than I would otherwise be with a customer right out of the gate. Well, then we're going to have to terminate the order because I have arrived in the stated delivery window and you were supposed to pay in cash. So, I don't know what to tell you. Plan ahead next time. I instantly regretted letting my bladder do the talking for me, as the voice on the other end came through more clearly as a young, bubbly, and very distraught girl who couldn't have been more than 20 or 25. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I was running down the street so I could barely hear you, she cried. I just switched you out of my AirPods. Is that better? I'm sorry, I completely lost track of time at work. But I knew you were coming. That's why I'm literally running home right now. Please don't leave. I'm starving and I don't have a car. Seriously, please don't leave. Five minutes tops, okay? I know what it's like to be hungry and running late and have no car and not live near any restaurants. Plus, when I heard her voice, I began to remember more specifically having delivered to this place a couple times before and she had always been perfectly nice. Now I felt bad for snapping at her. I tried to walk it back while simultaneously looking out my window for potential spots to pee. No, no, my bad. I'm letting the heat get to me and it's not your fault. No need to rush. I'll see you when you get here. I hung up and, while surveilling the area, was starting to think I was really out of luck. All the other houses had people in them and were close together, so there were no clumps of trees or out-of-the-way patches of land or anything. Of course I had just tossed my empty water bottle at the last delivery, because I'm an idiot. Finally, I decided it was escalating to the point of an emergency, and the safest bet was to use a bush in front of the woman's house. She wasn't home. The streetlight was out, so no one would see me. The people who were home were inside. My car was parked across the street, and we're a small shop and we don't wear uniforms, so if someone did spot me, they would have no way to connect me to my employer. Animals pee outside all the time. Humans are animals. This is fine. I scurried over to the tallest bush in her front yard. She didn't really have much of a yard, more just a walkway lined with bushes and flowers that ran adjacent to her front door. The biggest cluster of bushes, the only one where I could be sure there would be no visible splatter on the side of the house, was about four feet from her door. I looked both ways, unzipped, and let it fly. After the initial millisecond of relief, I noticed the sound was way off, more like pissing on something solid than something leafy. I started panicking, thinking I had aimed wrong, but once I start, I can't stop midstream so I kept squinting into the darkness to see if maybe I was hitting a key rock or something and could just move a few inches over. Instead, all of a sudden, I heard a way more concerning noise. A deep voice exclaiming, What the heck? And before I could turn around, assuming I had been caught by a neighbor, a man came leaping out of the bushes. He blew by me, brushing my golden shower off him as he did. He spit pretty emphatically on the ground, so I think I might have beamed him right in the face. I didn't see where he went after a few paces, but, though this next part is kind of a blur, I do think I remember hearing a car screech out from a bit further away after a minute. I had gotten some night vision by that point, so I was able to make out his height, build, and outfit, but only the most general details of each. I was in such shock that I didn't even put my thing away. I just stood there trying to figure out what had happened. 
The reality was so terrifying that my mind refused to accept it, and impulsively searched for a reasonable explanation that could make everything okay. I thought, could these bushes lead to some backyard area and just looked like they were against the house? Could they have been obscuring an open window? My inner voice was desperately screaming, Bro, that man was wearing a hoodie in 90 degree weather. That was a bad man. You're in a bad situation. But the very idea that I was within inches of a guy who would be hiding in bushes at all, let alone in front of a young woman's house at night, just wasn't something I was ready to grapple with yet. I was coping by not coping. My fight or flight response totally failed me at that point because my idiot self did the absolute last thing I should have done and approached the bushes to try and validate this. There must have been a good reason for a man in a hoodie to be behind these bushes in the middle of the night. So I walked over to the side, turned on my phone flashlight, and tried to peer around the line of shrubbery. Pro tip, as scary as things may look in the dark, seeing them with a single beam of your flashlight can sometimes make it even worse. That's when I saw the bag. There was a tattered drawstring bag sitting behind the bushes, slightly splashed with pee. But I was in such moronic daze from shock that I groped around for it thinking, see, this is it. This will explain why he was back here. It explained it. Once I maneuvered it over and pulled it open, I saw a sharp knife, a roll of duct tape, and a bottle of pills. The delusions officially broke at that point, and all the adrenaline, endorphins, and self-preservation instincts that had been suppressed kicked in ten times over. I became whatever the opposite of dazed is, more laser-focused than I had ever been in my life, with one singular goal. Get back to my car. I dropped the bag, booked it across the street, got in my car, and slammed the pedal to the floor before the door was even all the way closed. I went as far as I could as fast as I could until I hit a red signal. Then I pulled off to the side and realized I shouldn't be driving any more than necessary in the condition I was in. I pulled into the parking lot of a 24-hour drugstore and took a breath. I was finally calm and coherent enough to zip up and formulate a plan of action. My first lucid thought was, who do I call first? the police, or the girl whose house that was. I thought about it for what couldn't have been more than 10 seconds, but it felt like an hour, and decided, okay, I'm in my locked car with my engine running. If trouble starts, I can drive away. I know something's up. She might not. She needs to know not to keep walking in that direction. But as I was dialing her number, it occurred to me, what if there was no girl? I thought I remembered delivering to that house before, but what if I was wrong? What if the girl on the phone was just a decoy to get me there to rob me? Or worse? Every pizza guy on the planet has seen the evil genius documentary by now, so I thought, she called me all out of breath. She wasn't home. The whole thing was off. I can't risk it. I'll start with the cops. I called 911. The operator was very helpful in keeping me calm because I was a complete wreck by this point. He kept assuring me that someone would be there soon. I kept telling them that they had to get there before the girl did, but I was trying to express three thoughts at once and really damaging my own credibility. It came out more as, you've got to save this girl because he wasn't after me. I was just delivering a pizza, unless they were after me, in which case there might not be a girl, but I talked to one on the phone. So then you should find that girl because they used her to lure me there. But if she's real, she doesn't know about the guy, who was also real. And there could be even more guys if there's actually a girl. And you know what? Even if there isn't a girl, there might actually be more guys. I only checked one part of the bushes, so I don't actually know. But we'll know which guy is the one I saw because I pissed all over him. You know? I didn't mean to. This was back when I thought the girl was real, but not home. But she might be real. So you really need to find her if she is because the guy was real. Finally, they basically just asked me to stop talking and stay on the line. But that was when I saw an incoming call from the customer. I couldn't answer it without disrupting my 911 call, so I just ignored it. But then she sent me this text like, Hey, I'm here. I don't see you. 
I told 911 she was there, and they said officers were only minutes away, but who knows how long that meant, especially after I had given such a scattered account of the events in my panic. I just felt overwhelmed with guilt, because my rational mind said the odds of her being a decoy girl for some large scam targeting pizza guys were low, and the odds of her being the intended victim of a predator were high. So I put my 911 call on mute and turned back, heart absolutely pounding out of my chest, compulsively muttering, crap, 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 the entire way. Then, I took 911 off mute and told them I had returned to look for the girl. They weren't happy about that, but I saw her meandering past the parked cars in the street, looking to see if one was mine, and I waved her down, flashing my brights. She bounced on over to the window of my car, happy-go-lucky. I figured that was a good sign that she wasn't in on whatever this was, but I was just so scared to be back in the general area and to not know what had just happened or what was going to happen. I kept whispering, Get in. Get in. And she was like, Get it? Get it? Get it? Huh? Oh, you want me to get the pizza from the back? I didn't want to make the same mistake with her that I had made with 911, so instead of trying to tell the whole story, I stuck to the bare basic facts. There was a man in your bushes. I'm on the phone with the police. I don't know where he is right now. Please get in the car so we can lock the doors. I was barely able to get even those sentences out, and I was shaking like I had had 10 cups of black coffee. I held up my phone with 911 on the call screen to verify it for her. I thought that was why she got in the car with no further explanation. But it turns out, that wasn't entirely it. You still there? Is she with you? Are you safe? Is anyone else there? 911 kept checking in, not knowing who the third party I was talking to was. I reassured them, and we drove, more cautiously this time, to a location 911 instructed us to wait at to speak with the police after they cleared the area. I didn't actually have to do much after that. The police came pretty soon after. A police car met us. I gave a statement telling them everything I observed, and she went to go speak to more officers in more detail than they needed me for. It turns out, the reason she got right into a strange pizza guy's car without probing any deeper into my story is because she knew who the man was right away from my description. She had an abusive ex-boyfriend who was apparently psychotic enough that he immediately came to mind from hearing, there is a guy in your bushes. She later called us to thank me and insist on leaving a huge tip. I wasn't there when the call came in, so the kid who answered didn't know to refuse to accept the money, but the manager already promised the next time that we see her, we can load her up with enough one free pie cards to last a lifetime. Easily the scariest thing that has ever happened to me on the job or off. I don't get the chance to tell the story much because I try to avoid sharing it with anyone who could possibly know the girl or know of the event, but I'm still not the same since. Even though I know he didn't even have anything to do with me directly, this truly shook me to my core. This happened just September of last year. My friend, let's call her A, told me that she had a friend, B, that needed a dog sitter because friend B and her husband were going on a vacation to California. Friend A knew that I dog sat on an app called Rover, which is by the way an app where you house sit random strangers' dogs, walk them, you name it. I thought it was the perfect opportunity since I was in need of some extra cash. $200 to dog sit for five days. Why not, right? Friend B showed me around her house a week before I dog sat for her, while also letting me meet her huge husky named Bear. I'm not going to lie, it was a big husky. A little overweight too, but still adorable. Friend B told me I was welcome to help myself to whatever food I wanted. Perfect. The front door also included a lock, where you punch in a number code to get in, so pretty secure. So a week rolls around, and I show up later on a Friday night, not too long after friend B and her husband left the house to go to California. 
Things were pretty chill for the first two days. I was at work most of the afternoon, went to feed the dog on my break, and then went back to work. Came back later at night and would take Bear for rides in my car. I stayed up late watching movies, then let Bear sleep by me when it was time to go to bed. After work on Monday night, I hear a knock at the door. I look through the peephole, and it was a guy that looked like he was wearing a black police uniform. I thought it was a bit odd, but I opened the door to see what was up. Hello, I'm looking for Jorge, he said. Oh no, there's no Jorge here. I'm dog-sitting for a friend. I've been here since Friday. Looking back, that was pretty stupid to tell a random person at the door I didn't know that I was alone. Okay, how long are you here? He asked. Uh, till Wednesday, I responded. Then he said, Oh, that's cool. Okay, sorry to bother you. And he left. I was slightly weirded out, and I locked the door. I texted friend B about what had just happened. She told me, Oh, don't worry about it, and shrugged it off. I thought that was weird, too. Things were normal again up until I went to bed Wednesday at midnight. As I was laying in bed, the thought kept coming to my mind that I should make sure the front door was locked. So I got up and checked. Luckily it was, but I still had a weird vibe. I fell asleep and then woke up at 3.05 a.m. to the dog barking like crazy. It scared the heck out of me. I thought someone had broken in. I got up and went to the living room where I saw Bear was growling and barking at the front door. I looked through the peephole and saw the same guy, with another guy this time standing there, in the dark, both in security guard uniforms. At this point, I was creeped out. Why would the same guy come back when he knew I was alone, with my car in the driveway? I didn't even bother opening the door. Two guys I didn't know? dressed like security guards at 3 a.m. I made sure all the doors were locked. Then, I saw that they had walked off. I opened the door and didn't see any type of security car anywhere. I still have to thank Bear. I think his barking could have scared them off. I went back inside, returned to bed, and fell asleep. I didn't bother telling friend B because she was in California anyway. What was she going to do? I'm glad to say I only stayed one more night after that. To this day, I still don't know who those guys were or what they really wanted, and I haven't been back to dog sit since that incident. It was 2011, and I was fresh out of the Navy. I had decided to move back home to the family farm with my folks in Michigan until I could get established on my own. However, this was right after the market crash of 2008, and it took longer than anticipated to get back on my feet, so I ended up living with them for a while longer than originally planned, and my mother had grown accustomed to having me around to help with mowing the lawn, raking the leaves, and shoveling snow, so she specifically asked me to stay and help, and so I agreed. Unfortunately, the farmhouse my parents owned and had been in the family for generations burned down, and so they moved into town and were renting. They found a nice house for a reasonable amount and signed a lease. I initially moved with them, but now there was no more farm to take care of, so I started looking for a new place to live. My mother again insisted on me staying with them, and after discussing it with my significant other, it was decided that I would stay with the folks in order to save up money for the future. After living in the same house for a few years, we found out that the owner had mortgaged the house to heaven and back, and it was being foreclosed on. Me and the folks found yet another house, and lived there until the owner decided he wanted to retire from being a landlord, and so sold it off, meaning no renewed lease, and therefore, they had to find a new place to live, again. We ended up stuck in a little house in a bad neighborhood, which had no front porch light. I was again considering leaving for a more stable living condition, but at this point, my long-term girlfriend had become my fiancé, and I really needed to save up money for our future wedding, and so I stayed. Several things happened around that little house on the bad street that eventually scared my parents to buying a new house. 
Some of these events were just the result of living in a bad neighborhood. For example, there was a house down the street that the cops raided a few times in the year that we lived on that street because they were running a brothel. A church on the street got broken into and robbed more than once. A house burned down by an arsonist. A woman was dragged out of her home by the sheriff after the homeowner reported her for lack of rental payments. A guy across the street was being arrested almost weekly for domestic violence. Another up the street got raided a couple times for selling drugs. All sorts of other crazy and drama on that street. But none of those things are really what convinced my parents to buy a new place and move. The following are those events. Shortly after moving into the new place, my parents went out to spend some time with friends one night, and I was at home talking with my fiancé over Skype, as she was in Ireland at the time. It was a warm summer's evening in early September, and the little house had no air conditioning, so I had the front door open to let air in through the screen door, and my bedroom door open so I wasn't roasting alive. From where I was sitting at my PC in my bedroom, I had a straight shot view out of my bedroom door to the front door. As my fiancé and I talked, I heard what sounded like the latch to the front screen door. I looked toward the door, but saw nothing. Assuming it was the wind rattling the screen door, I continued my conversation. Then, I heard it again, and I watched the door for a moment to see if I could see the branches of the trees or the leaves blowing and swaying in the wind. There was no wind, so when I heard the latch jiggling a third time, I got up and went to investigate. And as I walked outside, there was a man walking off the side of the porch and away from the house. I called after him, asking if there was something he needed, but he ignored me completely. As this was happening, my parents were arriving home and saw the man crossing our driveway at an angle that made it obvious he had been on our porch, with me standing on the porch calling after him. He walked into the neighbor's house and disappeared from sight. My dad turned to me and asked, What's happening? What did the guy want? I proceeded to tell him about how I kept hearing the latch on the screen door, and when I attempted to investigate, I found this guy on our porch and bailing as quickly as possible, and when I asked what he needed, he ignored me and ran off. My dad then walked over to the neighbors to ask about the odd behavior. He wouldn't come to the door at first, but when he finally did, he claimed he was just looking to bum some cigarettes. My dad handed him a few, then asked why he hadn't just knocked, and if he needed cigarettes, why did he run when asked what he wanted? I should note here that my dad had accidentally left an almost full pack on his porch chair, and it hadn't been bothered. So naturally, we didn't believe him, and instead of answering my dad's questions, he just ran off into the house somewhere. My dad then found himself talking to an older couple, and found out through the old couple that they owned the house next door, and that the weird guy was their son, who had just gotten out of prison for theft-related crimes. He got caught about six weeks later breaking into another neighbor's house. The homeowner called the cops, and he was found to have violated his parole and was sent back to jail. But that's not the end of the story. Shortly after, the man next door tried to sneak into the house while I was still there. We started having an issue where someone had tried to get into the back door. We would come home from grocery shopping or something, and the back gate would be open, and the screen door on the back door would be swinging in the breeze. This went on for a while, until one day, we came home, found the back gate open again, and when we went to close the back screen door, there were tool marks on the door jam, like someone had been trying to jimmy the door open. We found a small pry bar in the tall grass next to the back porch, and we realized that the only reason to leave it there was if the culprit had dropped it while running away as quickly as possible. Say, for example, if he needed to beat a hasty retreat over the back fence as the residents pulled up. At this point, my dad had had enough of the guy who had been next door, whoever was trying to get in through the back door, and so he decided some cameras would be useful and started to price things. He ended up getting some trail cams that could be plugged into recharge, were motion activated, as trail cams usually are and could be easily mounted. He put one up facing towards the back door where the camera could see through the window in the back door, and he mounted the other where it could see out the front door. These cameras were about to prove they were worth it. We had been in the place a few months now, and it was early March, and we had had snow overnight. 
I awoke to find four inches in the driveway, so I shoveled the snow out of the driveway real quick before heading off to work. My dad woke up about an hour later and also left for work, leaving my mother home alone. According to her, sometime during mid-morning, she was surprised by a knock at the door, and when she answered, there was a man there, stocky, around 5'7", with a goatee, offering snow removal services. My mother looked at the driveway and found it devoid of snow. When she looked back at the guy, he looked like he was trying to peer around her, into the house. She shut him down, telling him that she clearly didn't need snow removal, and closed the door in his face. As she did, she heard him kick the screen door as if he was attempting to put his foot in the door, as he insisted that he could do snow removal for just a nominal fee. She ignored him, and he eventually wandered off. She told me and my dad about it later, but there just wasn't much to the story. Some idiot offered snow removal to people who didn't need it. Not exactly the Amityville horror, so we kinda just brushed it off. A few weeks later in early April, my parents went on a cruise for my mother's birthday, leaving me alone in the house. I had been in the house alone for a few days, when some guy showed up at around 8.30pm, pitch black night outside saying that he was from the gas company that provided our gas company with natural gas, and he needed to come in and see our gas bills to make sure we were not being overcharged. I was immediately wary of the man, as he matched the description my mother had given me about the snow removal guy a month earlier, and it was 8.30 p.m. The gas company closed at 5. It was possible people would be doing overtime, but for three and a half hours after closing, Going door to door in the cold Michigan spring? It seemed unlikely. He was wearing an ID on a lanyard around his neck, but he kept his hands over the actual ID, and he flashed it at me so fast that I couldn't really see it. To be honest, what I did see looked like that back of a Topps baseball card with the player's stats. Then, he actually tried to push past me into the house, but I put my hand on his shoulder and pushed him back, while telling him no at the same time. He insisted that he was just making sure that we weren't being cheated, and then pointed to the only other house on the street with no front porch light, and said he had just come from over there, and that he had managed to cut over 10% of their gas bills. I cut him off and told him that not only was it late, but it did not go over my head, that his best and only example of his work was the only other poorly lit house with no front porch light that I found it very suspicious that he actually expected me to show him private financial information on the gas bill. Nor did I believe the gas company would have people out so late. I told him he needed to leave, and he responded by trying to push past me again, again telling me it was fine and he was just there to help. I pushed him back again, more aggressively this time, and almost push him backward off the porch, firmly telling him no, I wasn't going to show him anything and that he needed to leave. Now. I told him that it was not okay that he repeatedly tried to enter the home without permission, nor was it fine that he repeatedly demanded to see private financial information. Then I looked him in the eyes and as confidently as possible, told him that this intrusion felt more to me like he was casing the house for a burglary and I would be calling the cops immediately after closing the door. And then I warned him that I was former military and that I was armed and that if I saw him around my house again, that I would act accordingly. Now I am not a psycho. I had no real want to hurt anybody, but I needed him to know that I had the means, capability, and willingness to defend myself and the home, if necessary. He slowly walked off the porch as I closed the door, and he started down the street. I watched him through the windows walk right past all the well-lit houses of my neighbors. As he walked away, it occurred to me that he should have some sort of company vehicle. If he really was from the gas company as he claimed, there should be some sort of service truck or company car with a logo or rental tags. So I went out onto the front porch and looked up and down the street to find one. There was nothing. However, as I looked back toward him, he was signaling at someone who came from behind some bushes on a side street near the house, literally less than 10 yards away. The guy was taller and skinnier than his friend like sickly and frail skinny, but somehow, he still had an aura of danger about him. The first guy made me feel slightly uneasy, but this guy made me feel chilled to the core, and he wore an oversized hooded sweater 
that in the darkness completely hid his facial features, giving him a look like the Grim Reaper. He kept pointing at the house, and his body language kept getting more and more forceful. I could tell he wanted to come back to the house for whatever reason, but the first guy didn't, and I couldn't help but wonder what their plan was that the accomplice wanted so much to complete. What would have happened if I had actually let this guy into the house? At this point, I followed through with my promise and pulled out my phone and called the police non-emergency line and reported him. I was on the phone with the officer taking my statement when the fake gas guy and his friend turned and started pointing at the house. That's when they realized I was still watching them from the porch and the first guy began to run down the street. However, his accomplice just stood and looked in my direction as I spoke to the officer. I don't know how I know this as I couldn't see his face with that giant hood up in the dark of the night, but I could tell he was staring at me, and as I watched him, I realized I couldn't look away from him. I felt like I had just entered a battle of wills, and if I looked away, it would end badly for me, so I just stood there and watched him, with chills dancing up and down my spine. After what felt like a small eternity, but what had to have been only several seconds of this staring contest, he looked away slowly and nonchalantly made his way back down the street to catch up with the fake gas guy. I realized I had been holding my breath and let out a long sigh. The officer was asking me if I was still on the line and it occurred to me that I had just dropped off mid-conversation with the person on the other end. My knees felt weak and I needed to sit down so I went inside and locked the door. The police promised to send a patrolman around and take a look for anything suspicious and told me to call back if they came back. I hung up the phone. I was alone in a bad neighborhood with a couple of random guys casing the house, one of which was clearly not right in the head. I went to bed with my weapon on my desk, ready to go just in case. I was woken up from a fitful sleep by my phone a couple hours later. The patrolman had caught the guys pulling the same shtick at another house with no porch light down the street. The creepy one was hiding around the corner of the house when the patrol car pulled up. I had to go in the next day to confirm they were the same people. While I never got a clear look at the accomplice's face, I was able to identify the person who knocked on my door. I read up on them in the paper a little while later. Apparently, they were looking for victims to rob, or so they claimed. The accomplice, apparently, had several large knives on him when he was arrested, hidden underneath his giant hoodie, leading police to believe he, at least, had other plans than just burglary. When confronted with these questions, they took plea deals in exchange for confessions. The one with the knives got his parole revoked and found himself back in jail with an extra couple years tacked onto his original sentence. The door knocker got 30 days in the county jail, 100 days community service, $1,000 fine, and one year probation. When my parents got back from their cruise, I told them what happened, and my mother rushed over to the trail cams. She found early March and the pictures of the snow removal guy, and then went to the next day in question and found pictures of the gas company guy. They were the same guy. Near as we can figure because my dad and I worked long hours and were typically gone most of the day, the only person they had ever seen leaving and entering the house was my mother, who was a tiny old lady, so they assumed she lived alone. Then when he showed up late at night a couple weeks later, and instead of a lonely old lady, there was a 6'3 military vet telling him, no, you're not coming in, and it bungled up whatever they were planning. I'll tell you what though, there was something about the accomplice that scared me. Maybe it was because he was hiding in the bushes the whole time me and his friend were having our exchange, or the fact that he kept his face hidden by an oversized hood. But before he ever even noticed me standing there, I could feel the danger emanating off him like warning bells going off in my head, and it felt like he just loathed my entire being and wanted me to suffer for simply existing. The way he stared at me from under the dark shadows of his hood was almost inhuman. I took some time off work, used up some of my savings, and went to Europe to see my fiancé. I just needed to get away from that house for a while. While I was in Europe, my parents quickly bought up a house on the very edge of town, away from bad neighborhoods, and moved into it. When I got back from vacation, I asked them why they decided to buy all of a sudden, and they just told me, 
that they never wanted to rent again after that house. To start this story, I should mention my occupation. I am a 30-year-old female journeyman electrician. I often work alone and in people's homes, so needless to say, I often find myself in rather interesting situations. I am 5'2", 125 pounds. I am very aware of my limitations when it comes to physically dangerous situations. I served in the military, so I have a rudimentary knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand combat, and I'm adept, trained, and licensed to carry certain tools of self-defense. I also have experience as a paramedic in a major city. Needless to say, I feel as prepared as someone my size and gender could possibly be for most situations. However, this situation triggered a visceral response, so I thought I would share my experience with who I refer to as the man with the mannequin legs. In the interest of privacy and simplicity, I will refer to him simply as John Doe. It's a Friday, approximately a year ago. The time was 19.30, or 7.30 p.m. for you not using a 24 time clock. I received a dispatch to an apartment complex several towns over. The dispatch was for a loss of power to a condo unit in one of the older lower income buildings. There are certain homes and buildings I go into which automatically trigger a certain amount of caution. Upon seeing the building, I had a gut feeling already that I would proceed with an air of caution. I immediately texted both my office manager, my boyfriend, and my mother, my GPS location, with a message saying, This is where I am. His name is John Doe. This is his address and unit number. If you don't hear from me every 20 minutes until I tell you I have left, please call me first. If I don't answer, please call the police. When I rang the bell, a gruff voice of a man who smokes far too many cigarettes forcefully inquires as to who is there. I answer, stating that I'm the electrician that was dispatched. He hits the buzzer and lets me in. I walk up the stairs and the first thing to hit me is the smell of the building. A building full of unwashed bodies, unemptied wet ashtrays, and stale alcohol. He opened his door and the smell intensified. He wore grubby, unkempt, ill-fitting clothing, stained with fluids bodily or food in origin. His face, thin and gaunt unshaven with dark, heavy bags under his eyes. Entering the door, I notice a small table that was stacked with empty beer cans toting the king of beers. A plastic whiskey bottle went thunk off the toe of my steel toe boots and skidded across the floor. I look up at him. Though on the skinny side, he was tall. I ask him for details regarding the loss of power, and he explains that some things work, while others don't. I won't bore you with the details, but in the end, I had to see the panel. He leads me to his bedroom as I pick my way across a sea of discarded items. We pass the kitchen, the sink stacked high with plates, unwashed with rotting food precariously balanced atop one another, like a perverse game of Jenga, stepping over clothing, garbage, and discarded alcohol containers, burn marks in the carpet from someone nodding off and dropping a lit cigarette. I enter his bedroom, a mattress with a tattered blanket, and no sheets or pillows sits in the center. The furniture is all second-hand and distressed, broken in places, water-stained as if it was saved from some unknown curb, which was not sold during the estate sale. The top half of a naked, dirty mannequin, appearing as if it were stolen from an abandoned storefront of a long-dead store, lays in the bed. I trip over something as I'm making my way around the bed. Looking down, I see two things that make me take pause. The more alarming of the two happen to be a set of legs from the mannequin, carelessly hacked from the top half with what looks to be a very dull hacksaw, lines drawn at the natural human joints though it was a hard molded plastic. I also see a dimly flashing red light coming from the ankle of my creepy host. It's a Department of Corrections GPS ankle monitor. I have to turn my back on him to make the repairs, which makes my hair stand on end. He watches me, smoking a cigarette, and sneaking to the living room often to take a swig from a brown paper bag. 
I make a few temporary repairs and tell him I'll have to come back to finish the rest of it. I take payment and leave. He watches me walk to my truck, following me to the apartment landing and to the main front door. I am almost running now, and I jump into my work truck and lock the doors. I finally breathe. I finally feel safe. Until I see him in my mirror, staring back at me from the rear section of my truck. Not threatening, just staring. I leave without finishing my paperwork and go a few blocks down. I stop and start shaking as the adrenaline slowly leaves my system. I reassure my family that I am safe and tell my boss that I cannot go back to that address. He offers to send me back with another person and my heart drops. I look for a reason not to. I quickly google John Doe and find out exactly why he was wearing an ankle monitor. He had just got out of prison. John Doe served two years in state prison after stalking a woman. When she threatened to report him, he broke into her home, demanded her to disrobe. When she refused, he told her he would kill her and threatened to dismember her. My heart leapt into my chest as I realized what this man may have truly been capable of. With the evidence of the mannequin staring me in the face, it appears his fantasy is alive and well. Needless to say, my company never sent any technician back to the man with the mannequin legs, and I ended up with nothing more than a story. A story that shows no matter how prepared you may be for a situation, you never know exactly who you are dealing with. I was in high school when this all happened. This was back in 2016, and I had recently started walking home from school. I didn't live too far. It was only around a 20 to 30 minute walk, depending on how much I wanted to go home that day. The school day had just ended, and this was my fifth or sixth time walking home. I decided that I would go the long route instead of the shorter one that I normally take. Little did I know what I was walking into. After getting out of the parking lot, there was a long road that led to a neighborhood just behind the school. On one side of the road, there was the baseball field, and on the other was a small factory-looking place. Usually, I would follow this road down into the neighborhood and cut through there until I reached the main road, where I'd be roughly 15 minutes away from home. So I climbed up the side of the hill between the back road and the factory place and began my walk through. There were multiple buildings on each side of the path I was walking on, I had headphones on because it's what I usually did when I walked home. Only this time, since the only cars that would pose a threat, if any, would come from where I can see them. So instead of having one side in, I had both sides in, blaring loud enough to drown out any noise surrounding me. It was a joyful walk for the most part. I kept swapping between staring at the sky and the trees behind some of the smaller sized buildings. It was the middle of spring, and I live in Michigan, so I appreciate the small breeze and greenery when it finally rolls around. I had walked past one of the buildings, but it seemed off compared to the rest of them. This one had no windows, and the outside of it was worn down, like someone had been chipping away at it for a while with a chisel. I brushed it off like it was nothing, and continued on walking. However, during the time that it took for the song I was currently listening to to swap to the next, I heard an extremely loud scream. I took my headphones off and let them rest around my neck. I stood confused for a few seconds, wondering if I was imagining things or if it was part of the song. After those few seconds, another scream filled my ears, only much louder than the one before. Now, if you ever hear something like this when you're walking somewhere, I advise you to stop what you're doing, find out where you're at, and call 911 to report it. Being the curious person I was, and given I didn't have much to do that day, I decided to check it out and see if everything was okay. The screams sounded almost staged, but I couldn't be sure without checking it out for myself. I walked up to the building so I could look through the holes in the door. It looked old and had a fair bit of rust around it. So it was an average peephole, but more of a rusted away, you need to replace this door kind of hole. I looked inside, and what I saw made my stomach turn, faster than I ever thought it could. Inside was a man. He was wearing all black, and a mask that you probably could buy at a party store, if I had to guess. 
There was also a woman who was on the floor. She had bruises and blood stains on her shirt. The man was holding a hammer that had blood covering the tip of it. I cannot go into detail of what I saw next, but it was the most disturbing thing I have ever seen. I had the sudden urge to throw up. I backed away from the door and threw up, only nothing came out because I hadn't eaten much that day. A few seconds after that, I heard the sound of the man's shoes practically stomping on the floor inside the building, and they were getting closer. I gathered my composure quickly and started to pull out my phone when the door swung open and the man stepped out. I pretended that I had been recording the entire thing to hopefully scare the guy into letting me live if I told him I wouldn't tell anyone if he would let me go. He proceeded to slam the door shut after a few minutes of us standing there, staring at each other without muttering a single word. My heart was beating so fast that I was beginning to be distracted by it, as well as the fear that this could be my last moment. After he slammed the door and went back inside, I took off running and immediately called 911. They stayed on the line with me until I got far enough away to feel safe telling them my location. A couple cop cars showed up roughly six to seven minutes later, and I pointed them to the building. There were four of them. When they came back, nobody else was with them. The man had taken off during the short amount of time he had, and must have taken the woman with him. They found some hair and blood on the floor, but other than that, it was as if the two were never there to begin with. The police never found the guy, and I never saw any reports or articles about a missing woman, or a woman that was killed. After that day, I never walked home again. I always either rode the bus or had one of my parents pick me up. About half a year after that, I eventually transferred to an alternative high school that was much farther away from those buildings than my old school. I was 16 at the time, and I am currently 20, going on 21 in August, and this incident has been with me ever since. I have always been skeptical about situations around me, but after that, I was never even close to the same again. This happened to me and my sister in April of 2020. My sister at the time was 13 and I was 14. My sister also has the tendency to overreact in a situation and makes it worse than it already could be. This information will make sense later in the story. It was about 6 p.m. at night and our mom had gone to see her friends and wouldn't be back until very late. Our older sister was at our dad's so the only people that were home were me, my sister, and our little brother who was 10 at the time. My sister and I decided to take our dog on a walk around the primary school down the road from our house. Let me tell you what the school looks like for a better picture. We live in Australia, so the school was a very typical public Australian school. It has two main ovals and many separate buildings for classrooms. It's not just one big building, it's many buildings kind of all over the place. We walked through the school to get to the oval so that we could let our dog run around. We were there for about 15 minutes when my sister gasped and grabbed my shoulder. Dude, I think I just saw someone, she said. I saw her eyes dart around the area, desperately searching for the figure she saw. It was probably just a cleaner. If they ask what we're doing, we'll just tell them the truth. We were letting our dog run around, I said calmly. Like I said, my sister has a tendency to overreact, so I didn't take what she said with too much seriousness. But this was a big mistake. We continued to chill, looking at our phones, occasionally looking up to watch where our dog was. It was nearly 6.30 when I decided we should head home. I looked up to find our dog, to see him staring at the building behind me. I stood up and looked around and saw that there was nothing unusual. I made an annoyed face and turned back around. We better get going before it gets dark, I said, grabbing our dog's lead and calling him over. I attached him to his lead and began leading him towards the exit when my sister grabbed me again. I sighed. What? I said in annoyance. I turned around and saw her face of terror, and she said, Don't look now, but there's a man over there, hiding behind the building. My stomach dropped. I didn't know if she was joking around with me. 
I didn't want to look, in fear, if he was there, notice, and start coming towards us. Let's just go, I said slowly, and began to walk past the building, and hopefully, out of sight of the man, but as soon as we were, we sprinted all the way back home, and practically broke the door handle trying to get in. We collapsed on the floor in exhaustion. Was there actually a guy there? I asked between breaths. Yes, he was hiding behind the building like I said, my sister responded. I then had a weird instinct in my gut that told me to lock up the house, so that's what I did. I quickly darted around the house and locked every door and possible entry, as well as pulled down all the curtains over the windows so that no one could see in. I sat on the couch and turned to my sister and said, Do you think maybe he was a teach? I got cut off by a knock on our front door. Our eyes widened and our mouths hung open. It couldn't have been our mom since she wasn't supposed to be back until at least 11 o'clock. And even if she was early, she had a key. Or if she didn't, for some reason, she would have called out. She wouldn't have knocked. And it wasn't our older sister because we didn't hear a car pull up outside, which we definitely would have. And she also would have called out. Another knock came from the door. This time, the person on the other side spoke. Hello. I have mail for you. My mouth dropped wider. Their voice didn't belong to anyone we knew, and it was rasp and husky, like they had lost their voice. It was then that our brother came out of his room and said loudly, Who's at the door? Both me and my sister cringed on how loud it was, knowing whoever was at the door definitely heard him. The person at the door spoke again. Yeah, open the door. I have something for you. Our brother looked at us in confusion, and we both shook our head and told him to get down. He crawled on the ground and tried to ask what was going on. I put my finger over my mouth and motioned for us to go to the kitchen. We all crawled our way to the kitchen and huddled in the corner. What do we do? My sister shakily asked. My brother at this point was crying from confusion and fright, and me being the oldest, felt I was in charge and had to decide what to do. I didn't think I could call the police because we weren't sure what this person's intentions were. All of a sudden, we heard the back door handle jiggle. I whipped my head towards it and put my hand over my mouth in shock. Our town was usually very safe, so for this to be happening was absolutely terrifying. I looked to grab my phone to call the police, but I couldn't find it. I then realized I left it on the couch. The bad thing about this was to get to the living room, you have to pass the back door, and the back door has a glass window at the top, allowing anyone to see in. I turned my head towards my sister and quietly asked, Do you have your phone? My stomach dropped when she replied, No, it's on the charger by the TV. I breathed in deeply and crawled slowly towards the back door. The handle was still jiggling, almost like they were trying to unlock it. Luckily, the back door has a double lock, so I wasn't worried about that. I peered my head cautiously around the corner to look at the back door, and that's when I saw him. His hair was matted and shoulder length. His eyes were dark and bloodshot, and his skin was pale and yellow. He saw me and began to bang against the door, desperately trying to get in. I quickly got up and ran to the couch and grabbed my phone and dialed triple zero. I told the operator that someone was attempting to break in, and it was then that the man started yelling gibberish. The operator heard this and asked for our address so that he could send someone out. It was then that I heard a big crack. It was the door. He was ramming himself into it, and the door was caving in. Quicker than I had ever moved before, I ran back to the kitchen and grabbed my sister and brother and ran with them to the bathroom and locked the door and told them to get down. I scolded myself for not grabbing some sort of weapon before I locked us in, with no exit if this man manages to get in. Then, we heard the scariest sound. The door breaking in completely. He was in the house. He was still yelling and now running around the house, opening every door, searching for us. Luckily, about two minutes after this, we heard police sirens, and the man's yelling ceased. 
we hear him quickly run out of the house, and then we hear the police shouting at him to get on the ground, and another police officer enters the house and calls out for us. I slowly open the door and peer out to a female police officer looking around. I walk towards her shakily and start breaking down in front of her. I usually don't like the police, but on this occasion, I could never be more grateful for them. I hate to think, what if we didn't go to the bathroom, or if I looked towards him when we were at the school. It was summer of 2007, and my best friend and his girlfriend suggested that I get a date and we all go to some local hot pots, which are natural hot springs located deep in a nearby canyon, not too far from where we lived in Utah. Supposedly, these hot pots were awesome, super quick and easy to get to, just a short hike from where you park your car off the main road running through the canyon. It must have been around 7 p.m. that day when we parked the truck in Spanish Fork Canyon and set off on the trail that led to the natural hot springs. I don't know where my friend got his bad information, but it was definitely not a super quick and easy hike to the hot pots. More like a difficult hike that took over an hour on a very narrow path where we had to walk single file the whole time and occasionally over some treacherous spots where one bad step would send you cascading down the mountain. It seemed like it would never end and we would never get to those hot springs, but after wearing ourselves out and not being adequately prepared, we finally made it. The sun was setting as we finally reached the clearing where the natural pools were dug out from the ground. It was later than we expected, but we figured it would be fun to soak in the hot water underneath the stars. We were so deep in the canyon at this point that the stars in the sky were brighter than any other time I have ever seen them in my life. No light pollution at all. We had probably been there for about 30 minutes and had the entire area to ourselves, just having a great time telling jokes and making each other laugh. The only light was from the stars and the only sounds were from us. The quiet was almost eerie. Suddenly, we started to hear twigs snapping in the direction we came from. There was only one way in and out from the hot pots, that super narrow trail that we hiked in on, which ended at the pools. Soon we could make out the outline of a figure in the dark, someone with a flashlight coming down the trailhead to the pools that we were swimming in. I was in a great mood up to this point, and since this person's arrival had taken us all by surprise, I yelled out to them once I was confident that they would be able to hear me, to try and break the ice from any awkwardness, and also partly as a defense mechanism from the nervousness I was feeling all of a sudden. Hey, you here to join the party? Silence. The person keeps walking towards us and doesn't say a word. Immediately, alarm bells are going off in my head. My gut is telling me that something is not right here. I try to ignore how I'm feeling and make a joke to our group about that person being a weirdo for not answering, but now everyone is on edge. As the person begins to get closer, we can start to make out a little more than what we had been able to see before. It's definitely a man, above average size, dressed head to toe in black. This guy was wearing a hoodie and long pants in the middle of the summer in Utah. Who does that? We notice he's also wearing a black backpack before he gets to the clearing and turns off his flashlight. He continues walking towards us. Now there are half a dozen hot pots scattered around this clearing. There is no one else around except us. He has his pick of any one of them to swim in. But no, he walks directly towards ours and sits down about six feet from where we were soaking. My friend has a lantern so he hops up to the side of the pool and grabs it and turns it on. Wait, what was this stranger just doing before we turned the lantern on? Was he ruffling through his bag, looking for something? One of us says something to him. Once again, no response. My friend temporarily turns off the lantern. I assume it's because the battery is low and he doesn't want to wear it out. But once the light is out, The stranger in black unzips his backpack again 
and starts frantically looking through it again. My friend immediately turns the lantern back on. The stranger quickly stops and zips the backpack back up, acting like nothing is happening. My friend notices that the stranger appears to be Hispanic, and so he greets him in Spanish. This clearly takes the stranger off guard, and he mumbles a response. My friend asks how he's doing. What is he up to tonight? Did he come for a swim? At least, that's what I assume from his tone. I don't speak Spanish, so I don't know exactly what the stranger's responses were, but they were very brief and not friendly. After asking a few more questions to the guy, my friend turns to me and our dates in the pool and says very quietly, but dead serious, we need to go right now. Immediately, we start getting out of the pool and drying off with our towels. The stranger asks my friend a question in Spanish, something like, Oh, where are you guys going so quickly? And I surmise my friend is playing it off very calmly and like it's no big deal. Again, he turns to us as we're getting our things together and putting on our shoes, maybe not going as fast as we could. We do not have time. Grab your stuff. We're going. Now. We don't ask questions. We grab our things and start practically running towards the trailhead as a group. As we look back, we see the stranger in black getting his things together, getting up and starting to follow us. At this point, there is no illusion of what is happening. This guy has bad intentions and is chasing after us on this narrow trail back to our vehicle. We know we've got an hour or more ahead of us until we're back to the safety of our vehicle and we don't have anything to defend ourselves with at all. We are still wet. We got a head start on him, which was a big help. I took the lantern and took the lead of the group. We got into a single file line and locked hands with each other, knowing that we needed to keep moving as fast as we could, but not too fast, or we could literally fall to our deaths. The girls were behind me, with my friend at the back, who was giving us updates as to where the stranger in black was and telling us to move faster. He picked up the biggest, sharpest rock he could find and was prepared to attack this guy if he had to. I'm sure you can imagine the emotions that were running through all of us at that time. The girls are sobbing, trying to keep pace with me up front. I am yelling back to them, watch out for this, watch out for that, as we are making our way in the darkness as fast as we can. I am telling myself to stay calm so I don't scare the girls any more than they already are, while also feeling an overwhelming sense of dread that I don't want to die so young. I am only 19. After what feels like an eternity, we finally see the main canyon road and our truck. We all run towards it as my friend unlocks it, and we all get inside. We are all in shock at this point, and just start shaking uncontrollably. I tell my friend to start the truck and start driving so that we can get out of there and never come back. I ask my friend, the one who was speaking Spanish to the stranger, Why did you tell us to get out of there so quickly? My friend answered that he purposely had been turning the lantern on and off because he noticed when he did, the stranger was searching in his bag for something, and when it came back on, the stranger closed it up fast and acted like he hadn't just been looking for something. That was when he tried speaking in Spanish to get a feel for what was going on with the guy. My friend said that he was asking the stranger some questions in Spanish, like, Where are your friends? And the stranger answered, no friends, and other short answers to basic questions that gave my friend the absolute creeps. Once, the stranger asked my friend something about the girls who were with us. That was when he told us that we needed to get out of there. Apparently, he was able to see the stranger following us almost the entire way out of the trail, but dropped off towards the end when he couldn't keep pace with us. What was that stranger doing in the middle of the dark canyon by himself? dressed all in black. What did he have in his bag that he was trying to get to that he didn't want us to see? And what would have happened to us if he would have caught up to our group on the trail that night? <laughs>